Good morning, everyone. I'm told that the fact that you're sit so many of you are sitting is the sign that it's time to begin. Um, and so I will kick things off. Welcome to the A. Alfred Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning at the University of Michigan. I'm Jonathan Massey, Dean here uh, since last year, and I am pleased to welcome you to Building Better Futures, today's symposium on equitable development. I'm just gonna say a couple of words before handing things off to Mark Norman, our uh, associate professor of uh, urban planning who organized this event and will introduce it properly. So real estate development is one of the primary frameworks through which the ideas of architects, planners, and urban designers enter the world. And most of you know that already because you're engaged in the field in one way or another. But so real estate is where we negotiate between public and private interests as well as among competing values for our cities and our society. Real estate is where we routinely reproduce inequality by building wealth gaps and other disparities in education, health, and life outcomes. And for that reason, real estate is also one of the essential sites for renegotiating the social contract and promoting equity through a diversity of mechanisms. It's where we have a chance to build better futures. Real estate is also a University of Michigan strong suit. Uh, faculty across campus are actively active in generating the knowledge, critical reflection, and expertise needed to do real estate development. And here uh, at Taubman College, we've had a series of faculty, a number of faculty who have been building that conversation. Folks like Doug Kelbaugh and Peter Allen um, and Kit McCullough and also uh, Lan Dang and Mark Norman and uh, uh, a, a number of folks in uh, the Ross School of Business, the College of Literature, Science and the Arts, and other units across campus who have come together to uh, bring this topic into focus. Students do a lot of work in real estate. They take courses in our graduate certificate in real estate, hosted by Taubman College, but shared by the law school and the Ford School of Public Policy and other units. In the Ross School, they organize their own real estate club, which is a co-sponsor of some of today's events and which organizes annually the recon convening uh, that brings national leaders to talk about real estate here on campus. And we. Uh, our, our alumni roster is dense with real estate leadership. Folks at companies small and large, including CBRE, Cushman Wakefield, Related, and of course Taubman, whose founder, Al Taubman, significantly enhanced the capacities of this college 20 years ago when he endowed it with a $30 million naming gift. And again, five years ago when he made the lead $12.5 million gift supporting construction of this new wing in which we gather today. Michigan approaches real estate in many different ways uh, from the, the business school, uh, law, policy, architecture, and urban planning to disciplines like kinesiology who focus on the impact of sports and sports facilities in shaping urban futures. Um, and, and so I am currently, uh, and my faculty colleagues, we're currently exploring with the leadership of other units across campus how we can bring our faculty, student, and alumni capacities together in a university-wide initiative that will gather the forces of people interested in and shaping real estate so that all of the disparate activities and uh, skills that we have come together in a university-wide real estate initiative. As we craft that interdisciplinary vision, we must put our commitments to equity and to the public interest at the center of our otherwise market-minded work and figure out where the expertise of, of capital and of market makers intersects with those of social justice advocates, sustainability uh, advocates, and communities. And that's what we're here to learn about today. I'm very pleased that Taubman College is the home of today's cross-campus convening, and I look forward to learning from the diversity of expertise and perspective gathered in this event. Welcome. Thank you, Jonathan, and welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, so uh, innovations and equitable development, 
uh, I would love to just call this a development conference, um, but um, development alone doesn't create better outcomes, uh, broadly across neighborhoods or across income groups. Uh, development is not neutral. It, um, through our elected officials, uh, we decide where our cities grow and how. We decide the form and the requirements that growth will be subject to. We decide who will be privileged in funding and subsidy decisions. We also decide the meaning of words. We choose to call affordable housing subsidized. We call sports stadiums economic development, for example. Um, we cap housing vouchers and earned income tax credits, but not mortgage interest deductions or capital gains. Um, cities have the ability to create value out of thin air through the way neighborhoods are zoned and where infrastructure is placed. Development can be induced or thwarted through legislation and rulemaking, and every city has heated disputes about development, growth, and budget allocations. Um, this might be why we increasingly use trickle-down economics to spur economic growth. It might be why, with each passing year, less and less of our budgets are allocated legislatively and more and more done through tax incentives um, that incentivize wealthy individuals and corporations um, to invest in housing and economic development. This appears to take the burden off of state and local legislatures, but it actually just shifts the equation from allocated funds to foregone revenue. Um, these systems we created are complicated and require expertise in law, policy, and finance. We have panelists actively engaged in tax credits, opportunity zones, both as investors and shapers of policies to make sure communities actually benefit from these programs. Um, I think it's worth thinking about this as we talk about the hurdles our panelists face in getting deals done. Uh, when they discuss trying to change policies that perpetuate inequality, when they discuss NIMBY opposition or regulations that exclude people from opportunities to thrive. Uh, we think about this maybe when Amazon comes knocking and asking for subsidies, or when the next time a billionaire wants to create a sports stadium. Um, so what of equity? Um, when is development equitable and when is it not? Um, we in urban planning are increasingly servicing the moments where development, wealth generation, and opportunity were not equitable, um, and the resulting legacy of unequal outcomes we're now faced with, and that we'll talk about today. Um, from redlining to federally mandated discrimination in housing and lending, uh, from racial covenants and urban renewal to placement of infrastructure and environmental hazards, um, we've realized that it's not enough just to provide access or opportunity. Uh, we have to redress and correct a legacy of disinvestment and discrimination that shows up in health, wealth, and social outcomes. We have to unpack what it means when we hear that developing affordable multifamily or mixed-use housing or more dense neighborhood disrupts or changes character of neighborhoods, especially neighborhoods with a history of exclusionary rules. The reason why this day is going to be riveting for me uh, and the topic is crucial is that what we are attempting to do is become something this country has never been equitable. Um, so uh, we want to infuse that equity in our built environments through our policies, laws, access to opportunities, and also in our hearts. Um, the presenters at this conference come from a range of disciplines and perspectives um, because as Mel Michelle Black, uh, architect in Portland, says, there's no magic bullet. It's a recipe. And uh, multiple techniques uh, have to be crafted for each unique situation. Here today we have developers because you can't effectively complete complex urban development deals without expertise in layered finance and access to capital, an understanding of community context or the mechanisms for securing community buy-in. We have policymakers who understand the levers they have for deploying resources that might do more than enrich developers, but also enrich and ameliorate communities. We have people from community-based organizations and foundations that are creating pathways for community members to go beyond advocacy advocacy to become catalysts for neighborhood regeneration. We have community development financial institutions creating financing mechanisms that get transformative deals done that conventional lenders and investors won't. This is where the third element comes in, innovation. Um, what are the innovations in equitable development? Um, you'll hear from Maurice Cox, who was pivotal in the formation of SEED, which goes beyond LEED to think about social, economic, environmental, and design elements. Um, 
you'll hear from the city of Detroit that's innovating in a variety of ways, cognizant that investment came later than other cities, which provides an opportunity to learn from both the successes and stumbles on the way to broadly equitable outcomes. Mayors are innovating, such as in Minneapolis, where the city created a division of race and equity to develop analytical tools to um, identify racial impacts on equity in all of the policies and decisions across departments. So what does that division have to do with equity? What does it have to do with development? Everything. Um, it led to the change in Minneapolis, where now most single-family neighborhoods allow multifamily units as of right uh, in acknowledgement of the exclusionary nature of these places. Innovation is coming from California, where the state legislature is creating laws to hold cities account for limiting and shifting development and exacerbating housing and job balances. It is also coming from New York City in the form of RFPs for development on excess housing authority land, RFPs specifically to accelerate modular housing construction, and RFPs to think about antiquated but strategically placed libraries making them into maker spaces with community facilities and deeply affordable housing. Innovation is coming from architecture and planning firms, uh, modeling how design and policy can combine to model housing typologies for who we are now and how we want to live, rather than the 50s notion of how we live, which is embedded in many of our codes and regulations. Um, innovation in equitable development also means opportunity is widely distributed and does not just accrue to those who got in early, have hereditary wealth, or access to decision makers and resources. In Detroit, initiatives like the Strategic Neighborhood Fund or the Affordable Housing Leverage Fund are becoming models for other cities. Reports such as, Defo uh, Det reports such as Detroit Future Cities Growing Detroit's African American Middle Class shows us how strategically focused, targeted, and comprehensive economic strategies can grow, retain, and attract people and businesses while improving the lives of long-term residents. Academics also have a large role to play in this. Um, they're re well represented today. Not only are we teaching the next generation of developers, planners, and architects, and policymakers, uh, we're providing a context for why holistic development is important. Universities are creating degrees, courses, and areas of study um, that are more complex than conventional development. They're layering finance, sustainability, equity, community development, and neighborhood regeneration. Partners in this conference, including Poverty Solutions here at University of Michigan, the Ross Real Estate Club, and the Urban Land Institute, um, are um, here with our colleagues from Public Health, um, the School of Policy, and the School of Art and Design. So in the panels and discussions today, the Q&As and the breaks, um, I think the day will be informative and productive, and will hopefully generate new relationships and new ways of thinking across sectors um, our first panel brings together developers working at large scale in New York, Toronto, and Detroit. Um, large scale development in urban environments increasingly requires public private partnerships and nonprofit and for profit partners with a deep knowledge of the techniques of community engagement and public financing programs. Our speakers today are Jared Della Valle, um, CEO and founder of Alloy Development in New York, who's also a licensed ar architect. Lori Gervin, Chief Operating Officer of Artscape Toronto, a social impact development firm in Toronto, and Jonathan Muller, Director of Real Estate Development at Bedrock in Detroit, a Canadian and a real estate professional that has developed hotel, commercial, and housing projects totaling over $3 billion over the course of his career. So I'd like to invite our first panel up um, so that they could uh, kick off our conference. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting us today uh, to speak. I'm really excited to, uh, to learn. Um, these are always great opportunities to listen to other people and see how we all challenge the typical models that we face or the hurdles that we face because of bureaucracy or politics. Um, my company, Alloy Development, is a uh, sort of the intersection of a lot of the things that has been discussed. Uh, we are a development company. I actually had to say I quit architecture a number of years ago, but actually everybody who works for us is an architect, um, except for one who ironically went to school here. Um, 
The project I'm going to speak about today is a project called 80 Flatbush, which is uh, the result of an assemblage that we put together over the last few years in downtown Brooklyn. Uh, it's a large mixed-use project, essentially across the street from Atlantic Terminal, the second largest transportation hub in the United States. As a piece of interesting context for our project, we started assembling a block and, uh, in about two and a half years ago, and it was triangular shaped and a little bit complicated, and we were the only quarters for it. It was a ground lease situation. It was fairly complicated. And our architecture skill set usually leads us to more complicated types of acquisitions because we need not ask, what can we do here? We spend the time to kind of solve the problem. Um, and so it's our way of beating the market. In other words, the more messed up a property is, the larger or the like, more likely the success is of our company. So on our block, there was a series of existing historic buildings that dated back from 1860 to 1890 that were built as a school, which is currently being operated as the Khalil Gibran Academy, which is a fairly incredible institution. It's the only dual language Arabic speaking high school in um, New York City. The unfortunate part about it is that it was created you know, uh, around 2002 or so as a response to September 11th by the Bloomberg administration, but its facilities were incredibly challenged. It has no auditorium, it has no gymnasium, it has no cafeteria, it has a series of classrooms, it is not ADA accessible, it is a challenge. And as we started to think about our company and the alternative value set that we bring, right, as a group of architects, our goal is to distort the use of the word value in the profession and take our development peer set and say, no, actually, it's not just about money, it's about what else we can achieve. And so we approached the city of New York and said, look, we'd really like to buy your air rights, and in exchange for that, we can perhaps fix the school and work with you on sort of settling the school. And they said, you know, that's really interesting, but we need a new school. So we said, okay. So we were introduced to an organization called the Education Construction Fund, which is actually a New York State agency that takes existing New York City assets and leverages them and functions solely in places that can handle high density and can uh, expose that there's an identified seat need. And so they said, look, this all sounds interesting and we need a new school, but unfortunately we're gonna have to run a public RFP process in order to see who can compete for the idea of building a new school and can we exchange density for new school. We will essentially uh, consider an upzoning of the site, take your basic density and upzone that site um, if you'll build us a new school. And we said, okay, and they said, great. So we responded, we owned the rest of the block. We seemed like good suitors. We could effectively build new schools adjacent to the historic structures, keep the school in operation. But in addition to that, they expressed a desire for a second school. And we said, okay, great. So we're gonna plan on building two schools and we will trade density for education, essentially. As part of that process, and as we started to get into it, and our company really started focusing on these public-private partnerships, we recognized we're in the middle of downtown Brooklyn across the street from this transportation hub and we're in a incredibly constrained market, right? The vacancy rate in New York City is like one and a half or two percent on residential and there is a housing crisis, right? We've added some 170,000 residents to Brooklyn over the last seven years um, and the proportion of rent that people are paying up against their income is stratospheric, especially for people in the lower income bands. And so, in addition to building schools, we proposed the idea that we would also tackle issues of affordability. In addition to that, we recognized that downtown Brooklyn happened to be the most constrained office market in New York City. It has an effective office vacancy rate of around 3%. There hasn't been a lot of development for commercial, speculative commercial office space in the city. And that we would pursue, in addition to affordable housing and schools, um, commercial office development. So the project is in this unique location in downtown Brooklyn. It's at the intersection essentially of Atlantic and Flatbush um, in what has always been characterized as a high density district. As you can see, there's 26 different modes of transportation in this particular location. And it's bounded by all of these major streets, right? So as I mentioned, historically, this has always been envisioned as a place for density, but what's happened around it historically has not been representative of that. In the 1920s, when the Williamsburg Savings Bank was built, it was built there for a reason, right? It was 
It was meant to be a location which could satisfy density given the transportation opportunities. But Fort Greene and Borham Hill and the surrounding neighborhoods, which are brownstone and historic in nature, you know, this idea of developing density in this particular location is a, a meaningful challenge, right, and a reality for them in terms of what the changes over the last decade have brought to them. And seeing a different future and the potential of a different future, which included density, was an important part of coming through our work. So this is the site as it's seen today. You can see, I don't have a laser pointer, but, or maybe I do. No, I don't think so. Is this a laser pointer? No. It's going backwards. All right, I'm gonna ignore that. Uh, on the right-hand side is Atlantic Terminal, the Williamsburg Savings Bank, which you can see was 514 feet tall, um, and at the time, certainly the tallest thing built. And over the last decade, we've seen some 14,000 new residents just in downtown Brooklyn alone in a rezoning that happened in 2004. And you're starting to see, obviously, the results of some of these pressures. But the early development that happened in downtown Brooklyn largely happened with large-scale national-based developers who are just looking at the fundamentals of the site, saying low vacancy rate, access to transportation, good investment. But at, at that time, downtown Brooklyn wasn't really a place, and it didn't really have the infrastructure to support this population change. And in the foreground, you're seeing what I was referring to before, which is this low-density neighborhood that exists around it. So our proposed project, going through ULERP, was to change the basic density from a 6.5 to an 18 FAR. Uh, making it the highest density project uh, in Brooklyn's history. We are proposing some 750,000 square feet of uh, new apartments, 200 or so thousand square feet of commercial development, 150,000 square feet of school, in addition to culture and retail and other aspects of the project. We tried handling the public review process in an incredibly different way, right? My peer set is often accused of being opaque and um, unwilling to make change. And so insofar as we don't have a client and we're the architect and the developer, we tried treating the community as our clients. This is actually a little outdated. I ended up having 147 public meetings through the process of our public approval. I lost many nights with my family. Um, but we made the time to meet with either private individuals who missed the public meeting, who could come to our office to express their concerns or to learn about the project through city council to organizations, local coalitions, et cetera, to try to articulate the needs and to take our original proposal and make change based on our initial assumptions. And what we learned through that process was sort of incredibly valuable, right? There are things that even though I live you know, less than a mile away and my kids go to the same schools, there are things about that place that only the community could know, right? About how they experience our city. And so some of the things obviously you know, from a fundamental perspective that we started to tune into were how people perceive each block front of our street, right? Flatbush is almost like Houston relative to State Street, which is a small, you know, a townhouse block. And so we had to locate our program on that block contextually and really think about um, where we were putting entrances and what the relationship to our surrounding neighborhoods. So across from the Apple Store and Atlantic Terminal, of course, is our retail and commercial entry. Across from the Cultural District and the BAM Cultural District, we would repurpose that existing school building into a new cultural institution. And of course, across from residential, we would locate our lower school um, and the entry for the lower school uh, and in addition to our residential entries. One of the things that became a real lightning rod for the community and, and that we recognized early on and promised very early on was to maintain these historic structures and that that was how people remembered this place and could orient themselves and that building big buildings need not require or obligate us to necessarily have tabula rasa and start over, right? So we made a commitment very early on to address preservation. We also decided that, God, if we were gonna build civic buildings, we had to build civic buildings that had an identity and we would separate the high school from the lower school, each having their own presence and each being a sort of proud civic building and that we'd bring them into the 21st century. And in fact, we're proposing the first passive house schools ever built in New York City. And from that process, we learned and made a lot of changes, right? Everything from the preservation to the school entrances, people compelled us to eliminate all parking being so connected to public transportation. Loading docks along State Street became a real um, bit of intense negotiation from a design perspective how to address things like street walls in relationship to the townhouses, bulkheads and mechanical equipment, materiality and setbacks, right? And how we would engage and actually negotiate density through design 
not through economics, right? Not through politics or use politics in a different way to negotiate design. I said many times through the process, were we not architects? And I had as a developer to convince or to like translate what we were hearing from the community into design. It never could have happened because it was happening live. It would have been too complicated and too removed. So all 14 of our architectural staff were literally working live through these challenges as it was happening. So from a design perspective, um, and I'll go through this very quickly to get to the equity part, uh, the phase one tower, which is triangular in shape, sort of takes advantage of the triangular geometry like the flat iron building and celebrates that triangular shape at the point um, and connects to the Williamsburg Savings Bank. This idea of setbacks and connection through materiality to WSB, and again, these are sort of the simple versions of what they meant. And our taller tower and its relationship to the, w, uh, the Williamsburg Savings Bank and how the kind of idiosyncratic top to the Williamsburg Savings Bank, which is literally just the dome from their bank in Williamsburg, plucked on top of a skyscraper. Uh, somebody, one of our neighbors called it neophallic. Um, the idea that we could come up with a new way to articulate um, and connect to that place. But what happens is this incredibly complicated master plan where we're actually proposing a series of five buildings, sort of old and new, that literally stack on top of each other, where we address preservation around the block and how people see it and let these new realities and the duality of new context and density up against adjacent low density uh, properties. As you can see, um, oh, look at that, I'll use the hand. Uh, starting from here with uh, retail and amenity program, residential entrance, a loading dock in the existing building, converting this to a cultural institution, new large commercial office floor plates, residential tower above, the Khalil Gibran High School with its civic identity along Flatbush, retail and commercial, followed by a State Street side where we have the existing historic buildings, a lower school, a small entry courtyard, the residential portion of our uh, triangular shaped tower as it heads around the block. And then this is how it feels in context, a very different um, sensibility to some of my peer sets. And this is looking down State Street uh, across from the townhouses and our transparent floor. And in general, I think the process was meant to celebrate this concept of inclusivity rather than exclusivity. And we recognized early on that if we're going to invest more or less a billion dollars throughout the project, we had better connect with the community in a different way. And so we created something called an equity office. And we actually retained three people um, to hold us to task um, for all things social equity based. So we have someone who grew up in the NYCHA projects who started his own MWLBE uh, business to help support us and find local businesses. Uh, <laughs> okay, and um, we hired someone um, to, who um, was the beneficiary of a lottery system, and we hired another sort of manager who came from the affordable housing space. So as our part of our project, we create some 3,000 jobs. We will invest some $475 million in MWLBE businesses. We will create opportunities for local retail businesses in over 200,000 square feet of office space. We will create over 200 permanently affordable housing, housing units at 60% AMI, which translates to a three-bedroom apartment being around $1,200 a month. Um, and we will make sure that people have access to those apartments and that the design can be set up in such a way that people need not know who has money and who doesn't, but that we can democratize the idea of how it feels to come home that we would donate a cultural space of 15,000 square feet with an opening date that would have cross connections with the school and, and the uh, amenities programs throughout the building, and that we would create additional link linkages to the artistic community and celebrate local culture. And that, of course, we would create two schools of 150,000 square feet. It's actually now 900 seats that we've solved uh, with after-hours programs that connect to the local, local uh, community for education, um, educational programs, et cetera. Right? All told, we donate some $230 million of public benefit, and that costs the city zero dollars. Right? We're leveraging density in order to achieve some of the most important things, like the, the schools end up with more land so that they can have gymnasium and auditorium, and all of these things, and we push them through the process by leveraging density and the use of design to create uh, new, new opportunities for the city. So with that, I will pass it on to the next. Thank you. Is there a way to make the clicker work? I, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to. <laughs> oh, 
There I am. There we go. Okay, great. All right. That's forward. Okay, great. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you. Um, uh, I'm with a Toronto-based organization called Artscape, um, and I'll just share that that is a, uh, a picture by a local artist called We're All in This Together. Uh, Artscape has been around for 30 years, uh, and uh, our mission is to make space for creativity and transform communities. Um, we're both a developer and a partner to developers. Um, let me just let you... Okay, should I click? All right, great. Um, it's very important to note that all of our work uh, takes place on the sacred land of First Nations people. Uh, Toronto is the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and most recently the Mississaugas of the New Credit. And uh, Turtle Island, as Toronto is known, is still a home and a meeting place for many indigenous peoples. And in Canada, um, and I hope hopefully here soon too, uh, you can't think about equitable development without actually thinking about reconciliation. Um, so uh, within Toronto, Artscape has uh, 12 projects in operation. Uh, and we have two opening uh, this year. Uh, I have move-ins happening right now as we speak. Um, and uh, uh, some affordable home ownership units coming on next year. Um, our theory of change, if you will, is creative placemaking. Um, we really believe that by clustering artists and cultural organizations together in community, you have exponential impacts. You have uh, impacts on artists and their families. Uh, you help build more inclusive neighborhoods. And we actually believe and are very proud of the fact that we are why Toronto is uh, one of the most, it is the most multicultural city in the world um, and continues to welcome people from all over the, the world. Um, we're somewhat unique uh, in that we work across the ecosystem of spaces. Um, we have everything from work studios to uh, offices for arts and cultural organizations to theaters, galleries. We work, uh, we have affordable rental. We have social housing, which is a, a, essentially very subsidized housing. Uh, and we have affordable home ownership. Um, that makes it interesting, to be honest. Uh, what it means is that no one building is like the next. It really is. Each, each time is a ground up process um, that's community based and leads to a mix of uses that is sort of of and for the neighborhood it's in. I will share that at times that makes operations kind of tough. I like to joke that I don't have a bunch of orchards, I have a bunch of rainforests. Uh, just to set the context for Toronto affordability, uh, this is not a statistic to be proud of, uh, beating New York, but actually, sorry, our vacancy rate is actually worse than New York's. Um, we're actually right about 1% uh, in terms of rental vacancy in Toronto right now. Um, a renter needs to earn uh, $24 an hour um, to uh, afford a rent right now in Toronto, and the minimum wage uh, is 14 uh, it was supposed to be 15, but our new premier canceled that program. Um, so right now, nearly 50% of the rental stock, particularly in the downtown core, is essentially unaffordable. Um, and that's been compounded by the fact that since 1990, only 9% of new housing stocks have actually been rental. Um, so we have a, basically a, a rental market that's served by um, condo, the condo market. Mark asked me to focus on a couple of specific uh, projects we're working on. So I'm going to start with uh, the Regent Park revitalization. Um, that probably is a familiar uh, scene to every urban planner. That is a garden city. Um, Regent Park uh, is um, uh, actually right now the largest public housing revitalization in North America. Um, and Toronto is second only to New York in terms of the size of its public housing agency. Um, so uh, in good uh, fashion, a uh, great uh, Garden City plan that by the 1960s uh, was um, turned in on itself and uh, had lots of disinvestment, a very strong community, but again, um, a range of social challenges to the point where the tenants themselves in 1995 uh, went to city council and said, um, no. Uh, there's, you know, there's got to be a better way. Um, so essentially that started the process of the revitalization. 
uh, which the city council approved in 2003. Um, and I always, you know, really remind people that it's an incredible act of courage to put up your hand and say, will you knock my home down? I think it's, if we're going to talk about equitable development, we really just need to think about, um, you know, some of these large-scale developments, uh, because they are uh, fulsome communities. Um, uh, this uh, Toronto Community Housing awarded an RFP to a developer called Daniels in 2006. Daniels was actually the second developer to get the RFP. Um, the first developer promised the moon, and then when they realized what they'd have to deliver, they actually backed out. Um, and so, uh, essentially, the development deal was structured that uh, the sale of all the market condos, uh, the proceeds would be split 50-50 between Daniels and the um, local public housing corporation. Subsequently, that structure has changed. Um, at Toronto Community Housing, uh, where they basically allocated sites of land. And we can talk about what that's meant for um, the development. Um, so uh, Regent Park, uh, about 2,000 replacement public housing units, um, uh, 450 new affordable units, um, and 5,400 uh, market units. That, again, essentially is uh, entirely cross-subsidizing all of the development. It's about 69 acres. It was supposed to be a 25-year project, but right now it's on track to be about 35 years. And about 1,000 of the replacement units have been built. Um, so one of the key parts of the Regent Park story uh, is that um, as really uh, something that came from tenants themselves, um, the City Council in 2007 agreed to f uh, support and fund a social development plan. Um, and it was uh, about over, well over a year of consultations with local residents. Um, and uh, part of the vision of that were ensuring that there was elements of the non-housing part. Um, so sort of the, the tissue, the urban tissue that makes communities work. Um, so uh, there's an aquatic center uh, in Regent Park that was a part of the community vision that actually has separate hours and um, inclusive dressing rooms for the Muslim community so that women can sw swim safely. Um, out of that was also born a vision for an arts and culture center um, that Regent Park um, as an area with uh, about on any given day, well over 50 languages being spoken, that there'd be a place to celebrate local culture and art. Um, and so it was negotiated for the second phase, uh, really a pre pretty predominant corner uh, off of uh, the main street running through region, Dundas West, uh, that this would be dedicated to an arts and culture hub. Um, and there was a range of feasibility studies done initially. Um, my organization was brought in to do a second feasibility study because the first one, uh, in, in good fashion had kind of, uh, you know, run some numbers, but actually at the end of the day there wasn't actually a vision. We were actually brought in to sort of work with the community on a vision and out of that was born kind of a, a tagline called Rooted in Regent Park and Open to the World. Um, we then did a series of expressions of interests and outreach that resulted in uh, Daniel Spectrum being home to seven uh, cultural organizations ranging from a group called Pathways, which helps uh, young kids in high school uh, graduate, to um, the, the um, Canada's oldest free film festival, Regent Park Film Festival. Um, so uh, I'm happy to answer any questions on the, the deal structure. Uh, uh, what made Regent Park work was a magical moment in our economy called 2008. Um, and so we actually had a project that was shovel ready and this project was in part made possible by $24 million of stimulus money. Um, that will never happen again, I can assure you. Um, Ultimately, at the end of the day, um, what Daniel Spectrum is to the community is a place to uh, make your voice heard, a place for difficult conversations, a place for young artists of color to get their start. Um, and I have lots of metrics. I've done a social return on investment, but I always tell people my number one measure of impact when I walk into Daniel Spectrum is that there are people who are there for no reason, just that it feels safe and good and welcoming. And that's something we, we're still struggling to uh, achieve in many of our projects. I'll quickly go to uh, our current uh, focus, which is outside the core, as we call it, which is, uh, again, your inner suburbs. Uh, Toronto actually has the uh, most tall buildings per capita of any city in North America, and many of these were sort of towers. We have what's called vertical poverty in Toronto, and we've begun to work um, in many of the neighborhood uh, improvement areas, which the city created using a range of uh, economic, social development, uh, decision-making, and some indicators. Our first project... Um, um, and, we're, you know, in doing that, we're sort of bringing the tools of what we call social purpose real estate, um, which is really, again, using real estate for the social good. Um, that's a mistake. Uh, 
I don't know how those got in there. Okay, so, so this is um, Artscape West in Common. Um, it is a fascinating project in that um, uh, it started with the community again. Uh, there was a, a range of meetings uh, well over 10 years ago about needing a place for arts and culture. Um, there was a, it was the heart, this was the site of Kodak in, Tr in Toronto, which of course uh, is no longer there. Uh, there was a Kodak building that became a, a bit of a rallying point for an arts and culture center that, that didn't happen. Uh, and ultimately, uh, the community and the local counselor, who is, uh, who is a bit, you know, your classic champion pit bull for the constituents, um, uh, brought Artscape in again to sort of do some community work. And what that resulted in is that when a a parking lot got surplused uh, because of the new transit going through the, uh, the uh, airport uh, train express along with the, the um, suburban train that, that runs here. Um, the city put it up and it, um, it was baked into it that there would be an arts and cultural center um, on the site. The developer who came in uh, is doing some, so is doing uh, units of 320 units, don't quote me on that, of purpose-built rental. Um, that's in, in of itself a game changer in Toronto where again only 9% of housing starts uh, were, um, oh my time is up, okay. Um, so uh, I do just, I'll just quickly say um, one of the fascinating things about this project in addition to leveraging the surplus parking lot is it's leveraging a 90,000 square foot supermarket that was never built. Um, the tower that that's in um, was the last permit pulled in this neighborhood in over 40 years. So um, uh, we're able to sort of um, piece together a range of really crazy financing sources to bring uh, 26 live work units of artists affordable housing as well as a community cultural hub. So I'll stop there. Um, I have a lot of uh, points I can make on uh, what it means to sustain uh, um, equity. Um, we're talking about equitable development, but um, I'm now at the end of 20, 50-year leases and facing pressures like uh, commercial property taxes, um, facing pressures like a lack of investment uh, to sustain our cultural infrastructure, and um, also challenges related to resilience, um, uh, to the amount of, that's being built in the city without plans for where water and things are going to go. So we can talk about it on the panel. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jonathan Mueller. Uh, I am the Canadian working in America. Lori is American working in Canada. So uh, good job, Mark, on bringing all of us together here today. Uh, I work for Bedrock Detroit, um, which is a part of the family of companies in downtown Detroit. Uh, our mo mothership is Quicken Loans. Um, there's a hundred, just over a hundred companies in our group of, uh, in our family of companies. Uh, Bedrock is an organization of about 500 people, um, and we are essentially a fully uh, integrated real estate company, save and except for construction. But everything from property management to building engineering, architecture, marketing, uh, tenant relations, legal, all of that stuff is all handled in-house by our firm. Uh, we own over just, just over 100 buildings in downtown Detroit, about 16 million square feet of real estate. Uh, as well as some holdings in Cleveland, Ohio, where our chairman owns a basketball team and a casino and, and a few other assets down there as well. So a growing presence in Cleveland um, uh, and a very large presence in downtown Detroit. We are uh, a mission-based real estate company. So uh, another way to put that, I would say, is we are for more than profit. Profit does not drive all of our decisions, or profit, profit does not drive many of our decisions, I would say. Um, and, and our real you know, hope is that we create unique experiences through real estate, lasting memories for people. And um, Detroit is the hometown of our, our founder and chairman, Dan Gilbert. And I think he believes you know, he's created the biggest retail mortgage company in the country. But I think the revitalization of Detroit is um, hopefully his legacy 
going on in the future. So um, to that end, I'm here today to talk about uh, a new project, and so we're, we are um, not as far along as my fellow panelists. This is a, a, a deal that is in the works right now. Um, we started talking to the city of Detroit late last summer, early fall, as sort of a second pass at this project. Um, and so we have not closed on the land. This is sort of, you're getting live feedback on, uh, on a pretty large real estate deal in Detroit. So the site is um, known as the Frederick Douglass site. It is a um, former government housing site built, started in the early 1930s, um, and it was ultimately uh, demolished in 2014, but very similar to Regent Park in Toronto, it was a Garden City style development. Uh, at, at its peak, I believe it was home to over 10,000 residents, uh, has a very storied past. Many famous residents, including Diana Ross and other people, part of the Motown um, history, and, and just, you know, something that is very much part of the memory of a lot of people of Detroit. It's right on a, on a um, high, high traffic intersection here at the 375, sort of on the gateway into downtown. So a lot of people who grew up in this area certainly remember going into Detroit and passing by the Frederick Douglass Housing Project. Um, which is now a 22-acre vacant site uh, in the middle of a, you know, in the middle of a, a big city, which you're not going to find in Toronto or New York, and I think that is a very unique thing to Detroit, but it's not without its challenges. So when we <clears throat> started the reimagination of this project, um, it actually goes back probably two years ago where we worked with the city of Detroit on a, on a choice housing uh, application and ultimately the city of Detroit was not chosen. Um, and I don't know if it was a year or eight or ten months later, we went back to the city of Detroit and, and re-entered dis uh, discussions about how we could find a way to develop this land. And, you know, we, we have a, another project that I'm going to sort of dovetail into this discussion, but um, we, we knew that there was a lot of sensitivity around this site, and so I think we worked with the city of Detroit to really define what the principles, what the driving factors would be um, for the redevelopment of this site. So celebrating the site's history and legacies. Um, like I mentioned earlier, connecting to the site with a social open space network. And so if you we look back here on, to the right of the screen, you can see the top of the Little Caesars Arena and the, the football field, Ford Arena, all of the downtown, and on the left of the screen, Eastern Market. Um, so it, it is really a great location. There are great bones to work with here, and but you can see there's sort of a, a dead zone, for lack of a better term, between the Eastern Market and the, where the Little Caesars Arena is, Woodward Avenue, which is our main, our main street. Uh, in Detroit, so adding that connectivity was really um, important to us. And there's a, if you look just to the right of our site, to the to the uh, to the right of the blue, you can see an area where looked mostly dirt right now. And that's a, a project I'm going to touch about, touch on in a minute. Um, but prior to that project happening, you can see that there was just vacant acres and acres and acres of vacant land in a really great location. So connectivity to the surrounding neighborhood, social network, all of great importance. Brush Park is the neighborhood that this development falls within, um, and it is a historic district in the city of Detroit. If you drive through these streets still to this day, you know, uh, mansions, four, 5,000, 6,000 foot mansions that were built in the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, just beautiful architecture. Um, and really a lot of sensitivity to design in this neighborhood, which has worked in our favor on a current development we're doing there now, and we're going to talk about for this one as well, and then creating a, a diversity of housing options. Again, this is really you know, a key point for today's discussion, but making sure we are delivering product here that, sort of, that hits all price points, all income brackets, um, we believe is, is in everyone's best interest. So the site I mentioned that I'm going to just touch on here is, is called City Modern, just to the right of the Douglas site. 
And so this is, this is a top view of that site looking from the north towards downtown. Uh, it's an 8.4 acre site that's 400 units. It's a combination of for sale, for rent, affordable, um, as well as retail development all in this site, just over 400 units. There's a, in the top right corner of the, the development is a 54 unit building that is a, a low income housing tax credit building at 60 down to 30% AMI, uh, which means a one bedroom unit in that building at 30% AMI will rent for $399 a month as of the latest uh, rates. And a two bedroom at 60% AMI will rent for in the low $900 per month. Uh, and this is new construction, you know, um, great finishes, amenity space, close to public transit. So a lot of great things happening with that. And then throughout the rest of the site, we have, like I said, for sale product, which comes in the form of these carriage homes and townhome units here. Um, and then market rate rentals, and we have about 30,000 square feet of retail in that development. And I think it's important that we talk about this because there's, a, I would say, a lot of lessons learned that came out of this project for us, which is under construction right now. Uh, people will be moving into that LIHTC building um, later this month, or in March, I should say. Um, so, you know, the, the good things that happen there, there's a variety of product types that, that seem to, the market has recognized. Um, there was over five different architects involved, five different firms involved in the design of that project, um, which has really created you know, a unique space and a unique experience. And on the for sale side, we brought in a, a housing builder from the suburbs who did, for his first project in Detroit. And I think any developer will tell you that you know, they think they've done their research and they have the right product, but until people actually show up and sign on the dotted line, you never really know, and so he's been, they have sold over 85 of the 104 units, and they have beat expectations. Um, and, and from us as a master developer point of view, that's been great because we have had challenges, so that, that's sort of the good side of that. The bad side is that we have had challenges uh, that I think all markets are seeing right now. Construction costs across the country and even in Canada have gone up significantly in the last number of years. Um, and. and and the building, some of these buildings um, are inefficient from a development point of view. So they are, um, they're 30 to 40 units, which is a challenge to manage in the long term. And they are expensive to construct in today's market. So those are s sort of some of the key things we're taking away from this project as we look towards this new project. So the Douglas site will deliver... Right now, the master plan, again, this is a work in progress, is about 900 units. I would say that's based on sort of latest and greatest information. That's probably on the downside. On the lower end, you know, it could be upwards of 11 or 1,200 units ultimately. 70% uh, for rent, 30% for sale. We have a commitment of... Um, we, we have an, a commitment with the city of Detroit that 20% of our residential rental portfolio will be affordable at at least 80% AMI. Um, this site, we are targeting 25% affordable um, or at least 156 units. But again, I think we're going to outpace that. We have uh, retail use here, uh, possibly hospitality, um, parking. It is Detroit. Parking is still a challenge right now. Um, and then quite a bit of residential, like I mentioned. So just a quick overview of the site as it's planned right now. Again, this is a work in progress, um, but working from sort of top to bottom, the green and red. Uh, green is a parking deck with, with a townhouse type product, walk-up product in front of that. The red is residential on top of that. The yellow and purple uh, is essentially a carriage home or townhouse type product or duplex type product. Um, and then the, the yellow and orange sort of are on the right side is where we're looking at doing a, possibly a hospitality component, uh, which will be con complementary to the project being contemplated in this area not owned by us. Similar to the City Modern project I mentioned is the connectivity. Um, we have quite a bit of, we have three acres of open space on this site right now. Um, and we also have sort of a central muse area we're calling that was started in the City Modern project. We're continuing it here. And actually, the city of Detroit is incorporating into this 
into their new zoning for the entire Brush Park neighborhood. Um, so we think, you know, that's a great win from the previous project. We plan to continue that here, and the city is, um, I'm going to say, bought into the concept as well. So again, the product type, apartments, walk-up units, um, duplets, townhomes, and then we're introducing some new product here where we believe we missed part of the market in the city, uh, city modern project. So the, the for sale price points ultimately ended up starting in the mid to three, uh, mid 300 to high hundred, 300 thousands. Um, and that was really driven by the product size, these 17, 1800 square foot units. And so we're introducing some new product here to try and have a sharper price point. We know the market is out there in Detroit. People will pay for good design, but people you know, are not inclined to pay for more space than they really need. So we're gonna have product here that starts below 1,000 square feet, and I believe will start in the, you know, in the low to mid 200,000s. Um, ideally, we'd like to see a 199 price point. So very quickly, deal structure. So we, um, <clears throat> sort of following on, on Mark's introduction, um, you know, I would say that this deal is, is not a grand slam from a development point of view. There are a lot of challenges with it. It is a high risk deal. Um, we paid $22 million for the land, um, <clears throat> a million dollars an acre. By comparison, we paid about $150,000 an acre for the city modern development. Um, so we plan on pursuing incentives. I mean, this deal will not work without incentives. Um, <clears throat> so everything from City of Detroit home funds and CDBG funds to brownfield tax credits. And then certainly when it comes to housing, um, we'll be looking at doing low-income housing tax credit deals or any other way we can to help structure this deal to make it work for all parties involved. Um, and to that end, we've, we, we are working with a number of uh, key partners to sort of make all of this happen. So number one on that list is a group out of New York City called Jonathan Rose Companies, uh, a national affordable housing developer, su su superb reputation in our opinion, um, after we spent a considerable amount of time and energy researching possible partners in this space and believe we landed on the right person. And so we're gonna be working with Jonathan Rose uh, on creating great affordable housing here. Um, and then we're working with the same uh, local housing uh, for sale developer builder on the for sale product who has also brought in a uh, Detroit minority owned firm, uh, Woodborne Group, to develop the for sale housing. Am I out of time? Yeah? Okay. Just the overview on the partnerships, so. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I'm going to invite the panelists up so we can have a little bit of a discussion. And I'm also going to invite Lan Dang, who's a professor here in urban planning and uh, runs our real estate certificate program as well. Um, and while they're getting set up, maybe we could actually take a question or two from the audience. Um, because I hate when you do all of this uh, talking and then we're like, no time for questions. So if we have a couple of questions, we could take maybe one or two now. Jonathan. Oh. practice often feel at a loss in trying to negotiate the kind of outcomes that you describe. The reason why we feel at a loss is we don't know how far to go. If we push too hard on seeking community benefits, we scare off development and choke off the, the pipeline of development. If we don't go far enough, uh, we don't get enough uh, of the benefits. What advice can you give urban and regional planners in practice in negotiating with developers on these, for these kind of community benefits you describe? I'll start. Um, has this on? I think your mic is on. Oh, mic, that's right. Um, I have to be honest, in my experience, very rarely do folks go too Far. I actually think uh, we often sell ourselves short in terms of what we're negotiating. Um, 
and you know, there's often a feeling of what I call the high school cafeteria. You know, oh, they'll sit next to me at the high school cafeteria. So there, there's a lot of anxiousness about uh, working with developers. Our starting point is that we actually bring a heck of a lot of value. Um, and so really, I think that uh, somewhere between expectations that a single site is going to solve everything or, or bring everything everyone wants is really sort of sitting down, doing some of the homework on, on you know, what makes sense, what's going to actually pencil out in the long term, but also being really clear on the value proposition. Because in and of itself, community benefits, you know, communities are not homogenous um, uh, places. So, from, you know, so for Artscape, we're actually very clear um, uh, around some of the values we bring. And quite frankly, some of those values can be marketability of units, and do we act proactively leverage that to sort of up the number of affordable housing units or sort of ensure there's a level of other types of infrastructure in a neighborhood? Absolutely. Um, so that's my point of view. Yeah, my sense is um, we had the actual op opposite problem where we were, you know, criticized of trying to squeeze too much into the bag of public benefit and people were freaked out about density to a point where despite 400 years of history as a city of change and success and density that people were panicked by the scale, right, by the change. And I, I would be optimistic about it, which is our sensibility was, you know, we had this the great example I use is when we first showed our project for the first time, the Brooklyn paper had this photograph of our rendering. It said unprecedented. And of course, <laughs> it was like, my, you know, people were panicked about, like, that's too big. And I was really proud of that. And I was like, that's right, because we should be setting a precedent for our development peer set about what their obligations and responsibilities are. And so my mother was really proud, but the neighborhood was really mad. <laughs> um, and so, you know, it, it's all about context. I think, um, you know, obviously for public agencies doing public work and proposing a, a, a future, you have to be optimistic about what the potential is and developers are smart, and there are lots of resources, and they get creative as needed, as, as you've shown, through the sheer amount of different forms of subsidy that you're trying to yield to these things. And you will find the right personality. So I wouldn't be shy. Yeah. But I, th I think it probably also depends on the market, right? I think you know, Detroit, New York, and you know, Atlanta are very different, right? So I think that's probably. I don't know, I mean, Jonathan, you also worked in Toronto before, right? And then now you're working in Detroit, so probably have different take on those. Yeah, I think, you know, we're, we as a development company are very spoiled with what we have to work with here in Detroit. Um, you know, even in the two and a half years that I've been in Detroit, the change uh, with the city team has been, you know, it, it just gets better and better every day. Um, but I think, you know, to your question, Part of that falls as much on the developer, perhaps, in that situation um, as it does on, on, on the urban planner side. I mean, we have a very open and transparent relationship with the, the planning folks at the city of Detroit. And, you know, we are happy to show them why and how something doesn't work. And, you know, we can, we can only do so many deals at a loss before we need to start figuring out a better way of doing those things. And so walking through numbers, talking about constraints of zoning or you know, planning requirements is a big part of, of what we do. And the city, um, from the staff to the you know, senior administration level, I think has done a good job of pairing um, planning and design people with business people to help push their projects forward and, and push the process forward because you know, the, we can move projects at a very quick speed in Detroit that you know you certainly don't see in Toronto. And then if you get into examples of New York or Los Angeles, where it's you know a dozen years to get a project approved, I mean we're we're very spoiled. But a, a big part of that, I think, is the relationship and the transparency on both sides. And we are all working towards the same goal in Detroit. I, I think you're raising a really incredible point, which is aside from the urban planning aspect, like the economics have to have to work, right? And we make no bones about the fact that our projects have to be economically viable. I can't do it. You can only give away so much, right? And our lens is how much can we give away, not how much can we make. But sharing and providing the economic like backup behind what you're saying and being able to really push the model from um, you know, the early planning part, which is how much can you afford and still make the project financeable 
um, and what vehicles do you need and do you have actual access to those economic vehicles in order to make them work is a pretty critical part to finding success. Um, but you have to be able to be transparent. You have to be able to share that. Maybe just follow up on that. So I think, you know, Jonathan and Nori, you all mentioned about your financing, financing strategy. But I think in your case, I think you, you mentioned about density, and you mentioned that the city does not provide any capital funding for the school. So what, what has been your financing strategy? Pure cash and financial strength. I mean, we literally acquired the site. Um, we have no equity partners. We have financed the entire purchase. Um, all of the ground leases, we essentially used our landlords as, at, we did three ground leases, it's a master condominium, we have some fee simple purchases, we went through the rezoning application and we are financing a different future. And so we, are, we have chosen not to take on partners until such time as my development work is done. So someone's choosing to invest in what I am putting forth as the opportunity, rather than having to negotiate in t inside my partnership about how much to give away or whether to spend money on you know, a program that diverts kids out of the court system. Like, we do a lot of community benefit type work and I don't want to negotiate that. And so it's just been pure economic strength. Mm -hmm. And Jared, real quick, you, um... uh, did I hear correctly that you're not taking subsidy for the affordable housing? Cor I'm correct, yeah, I mean, the, we have a, our, our structure for the deal is, is fairly uh, complicated. We're working with an affordable housing uh, partner and we are funding that um, without subsidy. Ultimately, we will achieve on the affordability part, of course, the tax benefit for those. And what we created with the school was essentially, a, we, we pay pilot. Um, and the way we finance the schools is essentially New York State floats bonds um, for purposes of school. And then we ground lease their air rights and develop them. So our revenue payments, which are a combination of uh, tax equivalency payments, and ground lease payments together pay off those bonds. So we create a cash machine, essentially with the real estate. I will own the ground lease for the next 99 years. Not, I will not be here, but, uh, and those revenues at the end of 30 years, the school will have been paid off and um, we'll be paying sort of market rate taxes at that point, so. Um, Brian? Uh, it's the box. I, I got a voice, so can everyone hear me? I think we're recording, so we'd like to. Uh, I can throw this, but I'm. Um, I'm going to bring it back to some of the opening comments about the university's role and interest in real estate development. I, I didn't hear it come up on any of your mm -hmm. projects, but Ann Arbor locally has many of the same factors. Um, incredibly low vacancy rates. I don't have the exact numbers, but they're in the two to three percent. That, for the downtown area and, and citywide. Uh, AMI that's lower than the national average here, um, things of that nature. We're um, a go-to city in most rankings, um, except we have the eighth highest economic segregation in the country, at least based on available data. The university has a $5 billion investment trust, and they're looking to um, do development around university interest, of course. So the ability to inflate property values and everything. I mean, it's a microcosm of many of the issues you addressed. But what is the role of the university and its impact on economic development, equity, and affordability, and sustainability? I mean, there, you must have seen it somewhat in your practices. Um, would you have any advice to the University of Michigan here and how they go forward from their real estate development interest in doing something locally? Yeah. It's the trusted power of convening people that the university has a privileged position, right? And their ability to convene and to enable a discourse that f follows the whole spectrum to make them a trusted partner, which may have a vested interest, right? Because it's a good member of the community, but it's not perceived in the same way that my interest is perceived as a private developer, right? I'm the, I'm the rich white guy and no matter what I do, it's always gonna be perceived poorly. So even if I orchestrate or organize something, it's never going to be right. And so institutionally, it's exceptionally valuable in order to create forums like this to have a comfortable discussion where people can find voice. Um, you know, our community is underprivileged in so many ways, and most of which is that they can't necessarily communicate what they feel or the challenges, and they're up against people who have 
lobbyists and lawyers and everything else, and so they're at a disadvantage from the get-go. So forum for public process and creating opportunities and providing resources as an institution seems to be the right place. So, so I'm a little more, pri I mean, that's great. Uh, you have land um, and could be doing very interesting community-facing work on your land. You have a balance sheet uh, that could be doing things like, I don't know, guaranteeing uh, affordable housing in ways that brings down the financing cost. Um, so yes, there's a planning piece, but then there's literally sort of a, an, an asset and equity piece. Um, one of our projects at, at Artscape, another partnership with Daniels, uh, is, kind, is a membership model uh, for access to mentorship and uh, equipment and workspace. It's kind of, I call it a, sort of a YMCA for the arts. And it's interesting because uh, a lot of young people, particularly in the creative sector, um, they come out of university, which is what I call candy land. Um, you know, they've had access to everything uh, right there, uh, equipment and everything else. And then at the exact moment they're about to start their careers, boom, full cutoff. So also, how can you be leveraging your assets to really support uh, people's full pathways professionally um, in terms of actual, you know, again, physical space or, or types of partnerships uh, for alumni uh, in whatever city they land. Uh, so, you know, I would really challenge the university to think about its, its, its literal assets and some of the ways cities are doing in terms of, you know, uh, partnering to acquire sites for the long term, um, in terms of uh, um, transferring sites to uh, community groups and nonprofits who are going to create sort of that long-term affordable housing and cultural infrastructure. Um, every, I think every university could do much, much better. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> um, this mostly goes to Lori Ann, but I'm um, just looking at the Regent Park side. It seems like your ability to kind of pursue a community benefit agenda doesn't really rely on densification in the way that the um, other two projects talked about, or I guess three projects, because also the City Modern Site. Um, so I guess, could you talk about, I guess, the necessity of densification in kind of pursuing community benefit? Sure, it, it is actually uh, a fairly, uh, it, there is a redensification okay. for sure there. Um, uh, it's, it feels less probably because it's, it's so staged over the long term. Right. Um, it's been, uh, uh, it's, it's actually quite, challenging and emotional, uh, um, even though you know, what we came in and saw as really sort of compact, horrible, tight, skinny, little you know, three-story X's in the Garden City model, um, you're taking people and putting them in, in, uh, in towers and in, in sort of um, high rises. Uh, people are going from uh, unit types where it might be like literally the classic closed kitchen in three bedrooms. Uh, lots of design lessons that different cultures don't actually want, you know, the kitchen bar and the open kitchen uh, next to the bedroom and those kinds of things. So um, it is using, absolutely using densification. It's definitely using a kind of cross-subsidizing from the market. Okay. Um, uh, but I would say that as a, as a master plan process in terms of the, the, um, the mix of housing typologies and the, and the mix of height and um, uh, um, density, it's actually quite thoughtful. Um, okay. We're seeing some other parts of Toronto where that's not the case. One of the challenges we have in Toronto is um, a sort of very rigid set of land use where um, uh, there's employment lands and there's a lot of uh, passion, uh, particularly from political leadership around protecting in employment lands. And what that's resulting is in this weird seesaw where um, literally on one side of the street you have what I call the orgy of towers and then on another side of the street you have sort of these sometimes heritage and other things that are sort of maintaining low rise. So we're, we're, we're still not there yet in terms of actually thinking about how to use our land use to kind of bring a mix not only of heights and density but just sort of use typologies that, that, that fit. Okay. So um, I think all of our speakers uh, maybe uh, inadvertently pointed to a fear of density while at the same time density seems to be the thing that gets us schools, extra affordable housing, um, community benefits, community amenities. Um, how do we uh, allay people's fears of density when that seems to be the way we actually are going to get some of the broader benefits we want? 
And I, I, I think about um, some of the slides you showed, Jonathan, which you, know, you have City Modern is, is, I think, dense for its height, but not so dense given its proximity to Midtown and Downtown Detroit. Um, and you were saying that you know, the buildings are inefficient from a construction standpoint and maybe from a profit standpoint. Um, and so I'm just wondering how we um, move through the, the sort of fear of density. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you know, Toronto and, and New York are certainly on the extreme ends of this scale where everything that you know, is built in, in new construction is concrete and very high and very tall and, and, and very dense. And I mean, I think one of the biggest critiques we have internally of the Frederick Douglass site is that perhaps it's not dense enough at 900 units and that it should be mm. more dense just from the fact that the location is so proximal to downtown and Eastern Market and public transit and we have this great opportunity here. Is, is 900 units enough? And, and so that's really the conversation. We're, we're sort of on the other end of the spectrum where when I came from Toronto, everything was like, you know, it, it's gotta be, it's got to be taller to make it work and the economics and we're more looking at it just from you know the opportunity we have of, of this land the location hopefully it doesn't get touched again for 150 or 200 years unlike the project that was there that you know lasted less than 100 years um, and so I think there's that education that that needs to happen there and then I think the benefits that come along with density I really feel is you know it's something we struggle with in Detroit for sure um, but showing people, you know, what you get with density, the fact that you're getting a brand new school for 700 students, I mean, the, the community benefit of that is tremendous. Um, so we're just going to take one more question. I apologize, but I think a lot of our speakers will touch on some of these issues as well. <laughs> All right. That worked. Okay, sorry. I'm going to break the rules and do two questions, but I think they'll be quick answers. Um, quick questions, too. Yeah, quick questions. Uh, last week in Detroit, the city council announced we passed the fair chance ordinance so that landlords will no, will no longer be allowed to uh, ask applicants, rental applicants, if they have a criminal record on the application. I was wondering if Bedrock had taken a position on that. That's one question. Two, um, for Jared, uh, I wasn't, I'm sorry if I missed this in your presentation, but did that project fall under the city's mandatory inclusionary housing policy, one, and two, did this, do you, would you say the city pushed hard enough with that policy on developers? So the first question, um, it's really a question about criteria, screening criteria for, for residents and um, we were already sort of out ahead of that uh, as far as our resident criteria and so it's, it's, we haven't had to make any changes as a result of that. And, you know, our goal, and this is direction right from the chairman, is that, you know, we want inclusive housing. We want everybody to live in our buildings. And, you know, right now, much of our portfolio is A-plus locations, and it's, you know, relatively expensive compared to the rest of the market. But, you know, I think we're in the first or second inning, and we, we made a commitment ahead of the city uh, implementing an ordinance for 20% affordable. We did that you know, independent and ahead of that. So having affordable housing in our portfolio and has a, having inclusive housing um, is a big part of what we're trying to do. So uh, I'll just share. I mean, the city of Toronto for affordable housing, you can't actually screen out somebody on the basis of criminal record. Uh, and that's important for everything from uh, homelessness, which is criminalized, to uh, again, sort of uh, racial profiling and, and things that can result on somebody's record. Um, and so, and we very actively work to screen in, not both in housing, uh, but we've also been working to challenge ourselves even around uh, employment. So, yeah, our our project was actually the first project to modify MIH. Uh, we went through ULERP, and we had an obligation to pursue MIH. Mandatory inclusionary, Mandatory uniform inclusionary. land use. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> The question was asked. From NYC. So I, yeah, so uh, we were the first pro project to pursue a, uh, a deviation from that, and the uh, public schools are the first thing that we build. Um, so in exchange for that public benefit of affordability, we're obviously providing schools, and we actually exceed the MIH, Mandatory Inclusionary Housing Requirement, on our Phase two portion. So 28% of our Phase two building is actually MIH which in some regards makes no sense because in context, each affordable unit costs about $600,000 to make. So, so really, if Jonathan, you guys are, were ahead of the fair chance, or, 
chance ordinance and Jared if you guys are exceeding the MIH policy the, the answer to um, someone's question back here is yes cities could push harder yes because yes. you're already ahead of these things you're already beating these things so I think that's a good segue to our policy panel where they'll <laughs> debate whether that is pushing too hard or too little. And I want to thank our panel, uh, our kickoff panel. Thank you. I'd like to invite up uh, Elizabeth Gerber, Associate Dean for Research and Policy Engagement uh, at the Ford School of Public Policy, uh, followed by Jess Zimbabwe. And I'm also going to invite Kimberly Driggins um, from Detroit Planning and Development up as well. But we'll start with Liz. Okay, sounds good. Morning, everybody. It's so bright and sunny in here. Who would know that it's February in Michigan, in Ann Arbor, right? I feel like we're in, yeah, it's a beautiful space. Um, thank you all uh, for coming. As Mark said, I'm Liz Gerber. Uh, I'm a faculty member and associate dean at the Ford School of Public Policy here at the University of Michigan. Just so that I know who's in the room, how many of you are U of M student, staff, faculty? And how many are not? OK, thank you. Um, Okay, so policy, let's see, how do I do this? Thank you, okay. So I'm here um, today to talk a bit about a study uh, called the Detroit Metropolitan Area Communities Study um, on which I'm a co-PI with my colleague Jeff Mornoff, who's here, uh, he, I've got the pointer on him. <laughs> I've got the pointer. Um, so Jeff and I are co-PIs uh, on uh, DMAX, the Detroit Metropolitan Area Communities Study, and along with a team of uh, staff uh, housed over at the Ford School, um, we've been asking questions like this. How are Detroiters experiencing the changes taking place in their neighborhoods, the city, and the metro region? So um, like all of you, Jeff and I and our colleagues are very interested in questions of equitable development. We see tremendous changes taking place in Detroit. Lots of people are looking at, examining, commenting on, trying to get a sense of how um, the changes, what the implications, the consequences are of the investments and changes that are taking place on the ground in Detroit over the last number of years. Um, to us, one of the important questions to ask is this one. So um, how are people experiencing these changes? Are they experiencing them in a way that for regular Detroiters, their lives are being improved? Um, do they perceive that um, the, the investments and redevelopment and development that's taking place in Detroit is benefiting them? Or is it, are most of the benefits going to somebody else? Um, and so we do the radical crazy thing, we ask them, lots of them. Um, so we're, DMAX is a survey project, a public opinion survey. Um, its roots come out of, are any of you familiar with the Detroit area study? I know some of you are because I've seen some folks here have worked on it. The Detroit area study was a study run by the University of Michigan for over 50 years, um, coming out of the Institute for Social Research, which is where uh, Jeff spends most of his time. Um, and that was a study that, asked, that did samples of public opinion samples of Detroiters every year and asked them all sorts of questions about the city. One of the challenges, though, was the design of that previous incarnation, the Detroit area study, did not have a longitudinal aspect. So every year they asked different people, sampled different ways from different parts of the city, and they asked them all different sorts of questions. And secondly, there was, it wasn't outward facing. It was really a, very much an academic study. And so the data didn't really get used very much by people who were making decisions who were trying to improve quality of life in communities in Detroit. So um, the Detroit area study, the original version, faded out, um, was discontinued around 2005, and over the last uh, three or four years, Jeff and I have um, sort of revitalized the notion of the Detroit area study, but we've done a couple things differently. Um, we've, um, it's a panel, which means that we go back to the same people 
over time. So in other words, we go out and recruit a representative address-based sample of Detroiters. We um, use a number of, we, uh, most of the data is online and using phone surveys, but we use hired community residents to help people who don't have easy access or comfort or literacy with um, online applications to help them complete their surveys to make sure that we're not excluding folks. Um, but um, it's representative and it's also big and it's also following the same people over time with every year then refreshing that panel to make sure that we account for people who are moving out of the city and also people who are moving in. So from a survey research perspective, it's sort of a, um, it's a useful way of collecting data that is both consistent over time but keeping up with changes that are taking place in the city. Um, and again, uh, it's large. We've got about 1,200 people. So I know many of you um, that are working in the city of Detroit talk to a lot of people. Um, and we see this very much as complementary to a lot of the other work that goes on, asking that question I had on the previous side, which is how are Detroiters actually experiencing the changes? We see this tool, a uh, large representative sample of Detroiters, as really complementing the more in-depth focus groups or one-on-one -on -one discussions or work with community-based organizations to get a sense of how their members are experiencing what's going on in Detroit. We see this as kind of the big picture. We're able to talk to lots and lots of people and get a sense of how are all of the different groups of Detroiters experiencing the changes that are taking place in the city. All right, so as I said, um, we employ um, sort of standard academic um, research techniques to make sure that we're reaching people across the city from lots of different perspectives and walks of life and experiences. Um, and we do that by um, contacting them, drawing an address-based sample so it's representative of all the households in the city. And then we email people, we mail them, um, invite them to go online, take the survey. Then we go door to door. Here's a photo of one of our awesome canvassers. Um, and then we, to the extent that we can get uh, telephone information, we also call them and text them. So it's pretty intensive recruiting and mobilization. We want to make sure that we give people every opportunity possible to express their views, their opinions on our surveys so that when we go out and say 57% of Detroiters think X, that's a reliable number. It really is 57% of Detroiters. It's not just 57% of folks who show up at a town hall and raise their hand or speak the loudest, but it really is representative of what's going on in the city. All right, and then we see as audience for audiences for these data, people who are making decisions. Um, people like government decision makers, people like investors, public, private, and nonprofit. The foundation communities we're working with in a lot of ways to use the data. Um, Community-based organizations who want um, information about what's going on in the community. Um, the media, other researchers, and ultimately residents. We want lots of different people to have access to these data so that they have a sense of how is development being felt, experienced by people across the city, and do we need to change course on any of the policies that are in place so that people are not being excluded from the benefits that may accrue from development. Uh, we've had a lot of help. Um, right now we've got a generous grant from the Knight Foundation that's supporting three surveys per year for three years. Previously, we got money from uh, the Kresge Foundation. Um, we have gotten funding and other support from a number of University of Michigan folks. And then we also have three partners, um, the um, New Economy Initiative, the Detroit Health Department, and oh, I split this one, MISHTA and Michigan State, who are partnering with us on specific surveys where we're going into more depth on the questions that are of primary interest to them. So community health with the Detroit Health Department, um, uh, economic opportunity and inclusive entrepreneurship with NEI, and um, uh, housing blight uh, affordability with MISHTA and Michigan State. Um, 
and then just uh, for the survey research geeks in the room, um, oh, it were, oops, sorry. Oh man, there we go. Um, we're pretty proud that um, through these methods of getting people to take our surveys, we really are generating a very representative sample. Um, this t shows a number of um, demographic characteristics of the city of Detroit population. The bars are the values from the 2017 American Community Survey, the ACS, that the Census Bureau does. And then the dots are our sample um, relative to that dimension. So we do slightly over-represent women in our sample, and we do slightly over-represent over people with um, the highest levels of education, and we do slightly under-represent people with the lowest education, but we think we do quite well on everything else. Um, and so that gives us quite a bit of confidence that our sample isn't excluding major groups within the population. And then of course using techniques that we develop uh, uh, scientifically, we can weight the data to bring those gaps a little bit closer, but the starting point is pretty good. So unlike a lot of what we call convenience-based samples where you just ask people, anybody who shows up, take the survey, there the gaps tend to be much, much, much bigger. So we feel like the data that we're collecting really is reliable as a snapshot of the overall city and how they're experiencing growth. Okay, so um, I wanna just give you a little flavor of some of the data that we're collecting um, on some of the key uh, questions related to um, inclusive development. Um, for those academics in the room, these are just straight descriptive statistics. I'm not doing any fancy econometrics or controlling for this or uh, modeling that. It's just a straight up data, uh, which we think is very interesting. Um, those of you who are interested in more in-depth analysis, like how do these responses vary by subgroup, come and talk to Jeff and me afterwards. We're looking very much for partners both within the university and outside the university to help guide some of the analysis that we wanna do. We're collecting all this data, but we need ideas from all of you about what are the interesting research questions that we need to be asking. So I'm just gonna give you some of the raw data and then I'm happy to either discuss in Q&A or um, talk with all of you after the panel about what other analysis we might like to see coming out of it. All right, so um, we did a, a wave of our survey in summer of 2016. Um, again, a representative sample of Detroiters, and we asked them um, whether they're per what they thought the quality of life in the Detroit metro area, what direction it was going. Is it improving, staying the same, or declining? And um, on this question, about half of our respondents said they thought that as of summer 2016, the quality of life in Metro Detroit was improving. We also asked them about their neighborhood and how they thought the quality of life was moving, improving, staying the same, or declining. And so this first column is from that same survey, what those same respondents said about their neighborhoods. And here you see it's more evenly split. The, about, um, about half of folks said the region was improving, but only about a third, a little less than a third, said that their immediate neighborhood was improving. And I should also say, we were pretty agnostic about how people were defining their neighborhoods. And we even asked some questions about, what do you think when you're, t when you're thinking about your neighborhood? Is it just the couple of houses on your block? Is it your whole block? Is it a number of blocks, square mile, council district, et cetera? So we've got additional data backing up. How, how are people thinking about neighborhood? But what we did see is that it was more evenly split. People, some folks thought their neighborhood quality of life was improving, some thought it was staying the same, and some thought it was declining. We asked the same people two years later in 2018 the same question, and what you see is um, pretty significant improvements in both improving and staying the same, and a big decline in people perceiving that the quality of life in their neighborhood was declining. So that's one piece of information. All righty, thank you. 
Um, we broke it down, that question, by um, subgroup, population subgroups. I'm not going to go through all of them other than to say the dark blue lines are the ones who are saying improving and the light blue lines are declining so you can get a sense of the proportions. Um, those with um, highest incomes whites and to some extent males saw the biggest improvements in neighborhood quality of life um, and then the converse females um, uh, those with I guess lower income I guess those aren't those big differences aren't huge but definitely females saw less imp actually more declines in their neighborhood quality of life we can think about a lot of reasons why that might be um, here's just another, and then in addition to which direction do you think they're going, overall how satisfied are you with the quality of life? Um, and we see that um, the greatest number of responses said we're somewhat satisfied with about, I'm going to say 44%, either somewhat or mostly, no, uh, 53% 53, 53 saying somewhat, mostly, or completely satisfied, but then you know, significant numbers of folks saying that they're quite dissatisfied with their neighborhood quality of life. This is a really cool set of questions. Um, we asked people, how, who do you think the benef who's, is benefiting most? We call these our who benefits questions. Who do you think is benefiting most from the investments that are taking place? And in this case, we said in downtown and midtown. Um, when we asked about longtime residents versus new residents, um, very few, only 8% said longtime residents, um, and um, about 40% uh, said people who had recently moved to Detroit. Well, that's useful and interesting to think about. Um, overwhelming majority, 74%, almost three quarters, said wealthy people, as opposed to only 1% who said they thought poor people were benefiting from those particular investments. Um, and then um, uh, here, the majority think whites as opposed to African Americans, but uh, a quarter felt that both gr racial groups um, were benefiting about the same. Um, so we've got a, another wave of the survey in the field right now. Um, and in that one, we were re-asking this question, but we changed it up a little bit. We split the sample randomly. Half are getting this same prompt about investments being made in downtown and midtown. The other half of the respondents are being asked about investments being made in the neighborhoods in Detroit. And so we're gonna be able to compare those. We will have data on both what's going on who do you think is benefiting downtown, and then also other folks, um, who do you think is benefiting from the investments in the neighborhood? So we're kind of building the knowledge base that way. Um, we've asked about priorities. Um, so here we asked, what are the top three priorities for improving your neighborhood? Um, and 72% um, included as a, in their top three priorities. We had a, a longer list, um, but these are the ones that got the most. Um, improving public education, improving public safety, and promoting economic development were uh, some of the top responses. We asked about different aspects of um, different assets uh, and how they contribute to quality of life. I'm not gonna go through all of those. We can talk about them more in the Q&A. We also asked about how do you see changes in your neighborhood in terms of the number of people moving in? And so the green is the percent who said they think this is increasing. The red is um, the percent that they think the number of people moving in their neighborhood is decreasing. And the gray is they're not perceiving any changes. So we asked about number of people moving in, number of new businesses, property values or rent costs, neighborhood attractiveness, and safety. And so we see um, quite a large percentage of people see the number of people moving in as increasing, as well as new businesses, um, and then, um, but some declines in neighborhood attractiveness. Um, summary, many Detroiters see improvements, higher proportions see improvements in their neighborhood in 2018 relative to 2016. There are some subgroup differences, which we showed, and um, questions about who's benefiting uh, from the investments being made. Um, please uh, follow up. I'd love to get your feedback and ideas for what do we do with this great data. Thanks. Thank you.
morning, everybody. I am feeling my gender identity this morning because I was given this microphone box and I have neither pockets nor a belt. So I'm gonna set it here on the podium and hope that I don't knock it in some wild gesticulation. Um, good morning, my name is Jess Zimbabwe and I work with the National League of Cities out of Washington, DC. And I'm gonna to talk to you today, excellent, thank you, about a program that we've been running for three years called the Equitable Economic Development Fellowship. We run it in partnership with PolicyLink out of Oakland, thank you. Um, and also the first two years of the program, we operated it with the Urban Land Institute. So I know there's some folks here from ULI, Michigan. Thanks for your partnership. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the fellowship program, a couple of the most common recommendations that we make to cities we work with in the program, and then, but I think third and most important is the uh, recommendations that we make to all the cities we work with and that we would make to any other city, regardless of its particular conditions or what it's trying to do in economic development. So I think that's relevant to communities across the country. So first, the Equitable Economic Development Fellowship is a partnership, again, of these two nonprofits. NLC is the largest and oldest association of local governments in the United States. So we act as a resource and advocate on behalf of 19,000 cities, towns, and villages across the United States. PolicyLink is an institute based out of Oakland, California, that's committed to racial and economic justice. And all of the work is made possible with the support of the Cerdna Foundation out of New York. Um, so NLC every year does an annual text analysis of hundreds, several hundred mayors' state of the city addresses. And we put that through a sophisticated sort of software analysis program and to figure out what issues are emerging, what new issues are trending, are mayors talking about issues in a different way than they have over recent years. Uh, it may not surprise you that you see other issues ebb and flow across among this list, but for the last several years that we've run this survey, economic development is the most talked about issue by mayors in their state of the city addresses. And that is both by the number of words that the, and times that they mention those words or words related to economic development, but also by the number of minutes of their state of the city address that is devoted to the topic of economic development. But what we do know is that while mayors clearly see economic development as job number one, the traditional tools that cities have been using in economic development are not working for everybody, right? They're particularly shortchanging communities of color, low-income neighborhoods, immigrant communities, people with disabilities, people with the record of the criminal justice system, and all kinds of people who have a harder time accessing whatever growth is happening in their economy. The next three charts that I'm gonna show are just from one city that we worked in, Sacramento. All of these, though, charts are that we created very easily out of our partner PolicyLink's Equity Atlas, which is a publicly available tool that um, has literally dozens of metrics about places on a state and a city basis, and all broken down by race, gender, class, language, ethnicity, all kinds of ways that you can measure different metrics in your community to see how your community is doing or compared to others. So here we show not only is there a wage gap, but it's a worsening wage gap by race, there's a home ownership by, gap by race, and these are from one community, Sacramento again, but similar stories in almost any community you pull up. Um, and then there's an unemployment gap, also very clearly defined and in trend, you know, continuing on trend by race. So how are we gonna undo that? So in the first two years of the fellowship, we worked with cohorts of cities. These are the 12 cities we worked with, large cities of different market types from all across the country. We're now working with our current uh, third cohort of cities, which is the cities of Birmingham, Alabama, New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, St. Louis, Missouri, and Stockton, California. There they are looking happy and smiley, not thinking about all the bleak flat, flat factors I was just showing you about in their cities. We sometimes also laugh in the program. Um, so we asked the fellows who are economic development practitioners in those cities to come up with a definition of what they're looking for in equitable economic development. And this is our sort of group wordsmith definition. Equitable economic development would be that which unlocks the full potential of the local economy by dismantling barriers and expanding opportunities for low-income people and communities of color. Through accountable public action and investment, it grows quality jobs and increases entrepreneurship, ownership, and wealth. And the result is a stronger and more competitive city. So in the first two years of the fellowship, we asked cities to bring us a particular project because the conversation about equity was in a different place three years ago when we started this program in cities than it is now. So for the first two courts of cities, we asked them to bring a particular project. Here's an example again from Sacramento. What should the city implement or invest in to stimulate private investment along these particular distressed corridors? That, they, that was what they were interested in. Now, by contrast, this current cohort, the third cohort of the fellowship, this is the one from New Orleans, We've asked the cities to not focus on a particular place or problem or project or program, but to instead take a more comprehensive look at the city's economic development strategy and how we can make that more equitable. 
And that's a big deal that in two years of the program, and it's not just because of us, it's because of lots of things in the country, but cities are in a different place where they are more ready to have very publicly a large conversation about the whole strategy and how to make that more equitable, not just trying to prove that one project can be over here and be your bespoke little equity thing going on in the corner, but that we need to redo the whole thing. So uh, a lot of our work looks like we assemble sort of multidisciplinary teams of experts from around the country and bring them in to give outside advice and ask kind of tough questions of the host city. So these are the top sort of categories of recommendations. Many of these might apply to the community where you live or work. So think about them. There are a few different ones. A lot of them that we talk about are workforce investments and what cities can do there. Here's an example in Charlotte. They're, looking with, they're working with their United Way partners on this project, which is a construction jobs training program, because they have a big gap and all of the development that's happening in town is not able to meet whatever their requirements or goals and targets are for minority hiring. So they're working to build that pipeline and target you know, any kind of subsidy for public land or public dollars to people who are getting graduates out of this training program with the United Way partners. The second category is about access to capital. This is especially important for businesses that are already in place, for entrepreneurs and small businesses who need to make the next leap. In particular, minority communities, this access to capital is a big, um, can be a big stumbling block for them. So the city of Minneapolis created a program that's a secured loan fund to those small entrepreneurial businesses to help them access things when they could not get a traditional loan with the underwriting criteria that banks and other more, um, more traditional financing opportunities offer them. The third category of things we talk about with cities is about supports for entrepreneurship. And one example, we worked in the city of Boston to talk about employee ownership support. So how businesses can grow from one person having one idea and maybe operating a catering business out of their kitchen to having a few people. So then you're essentially employee owned and you have maybe three people that are calling that business. Uh, and as you're growing, you're bringing more people into it. So the city ended up um, with our coaching holding a training, a co-op week and a lot of events where the mayor visited different cooperatively owned businesses to promote that as a model in Boston. And the city also did training for financial planning professionals to help people set those kind of business structures up because it's not that common, but they'd like to build more of it because there's great outcomes in terms of the kind of people who get jobs and very stable workplace uh, jobs in cooperatively owned businesses. And then D, maybe the largest category that we talk about are sort of place-based investments and real estate moves to support uh, you know, other folks getting into the economy. So one pro project that we worked with the city of Milwaukee on is an ACRE program, which is a long-standing re training program, real estate training program for minority folks in Milwaukee. But most of the program and most of the graduates of the program end up doing housing development because that's a pipeline that's needed, right? A lot of community development corporations in Milwaukee need those kind of folks who know the neighborhoods and communities of Milwaukee very well and then go and get a year's worth of training in how to do real estate. And they learn how the LIHTC model works, the low income housing tax credit, and they learn how to work those projects and write a pro forma. And then they graduate and they go out and work in the CDCs. But the city of Milwaukee said, look, we have this other problem besides that we need more housing in many of these neighborhoods. We also have a ton of vacant and dilapidated commercial structures on all of our commercial corridors in low income and minority neighborhoods. So they worked with Acre to develop a parallel track so the people who go through their Acre training program can choose to either do the housing track or a commercial track where they can learn to turn those properties around and to help um, rebuild the commercial corridors through the neighborhoods throughout Milwaukee. Another example of that sort of um, place space moved is the city of Houston developed a new property tax abasement, but particularly targeted it towards creation of jobs. And in particular, you got more of a top property tax abasement depending on how good the wages of those jobs were. So the cities are getting more and more sophisticated at not just giving any kind of a tax abatement, but, giving, but tying that to particular performance targets and having a clawback, me clawback mechanism so that the property owner won't get the full tax abatement if they don't actually produce those jobs or if the jobs are not at the wages that were promised. And then um, we also worked with the city of Memphis who instituted the Bluff City Challenge. By the way, this is totally stolen from Detroit and the Motor City Match Challenge. Those of you who are working in Detroit should be very proud that cities across the country are paying you a huge flattering favor by um, using programs like the Motor City Match Program that have come out of good thinking and good work in Detroit. And, and Memphis did the same thing. But the thing that I think is actually the most interesting is not the particularities of any of those programs in those cities where we worked, but the things that we find ourselves keep recommending over and over again. And they're the kind of things that we talk about when you hear in the national media about 
Amazon's HQ2 and the debacle of them having to pull out of New York because they hadn't, frankly, been having the right conversation with the community. So, that, so while they were giving tax incentives, there wasn't a frank conversation with the community, and the community wasn't on board in a transparent fashion with what the deal was, right? So a lot of our recommendations to cities are, in fact, not about the particularities of any project or program or policy, but about a different way of doing the table setting with their community. And so the first is to work with the community to define what equitable economic development means in its local context. So it may be that your community doesn't need to focus on workforce because you have a pretty solid workforce uh, sort of ecosystem. A lot of good community colleges, nonprofits, and they're all sort of coordinated and partnering together. But what you need to focus on is that access to capital so that when somebody forms a small business, then they can have the ability to take their business to the next level. Or it may be that your community needs to focus on how to get entrepreneurs more support, and then the focus area is more about incubators and those kind of supports for entrepreneurs. But that's a critical conversation to have in place, and it's not just all jobs or all growth is all good, right? And then I think it's really important to identify data and metrics that are going to drive your decision making, and when possible, to tie the policy or to tie the incentives to those data and metrics. So that if somebody is getting a tax incentive, that there are particular performance measures in place, and that that, you know, that, that tax incentive decreases over years or goes away if you're not turning around and performing in the way that bring you out the jobs that were promised. And then also that you can drive, use this data to drive the conversation with the community about how you're doing with whatever the policy or the program was. And the third is, and I think this is really critical, is to acknowledge the enduring effects of segregation and discriminatory policies. You know, cities didn't get this way by accident. Those trends didn't start at the first data point of the year on any of those charts that I showed you from the Policy Link Equity Atlas. This comes out of decades, even centuries, of the way that our built environment and our city policies were formed. And I think it's important for city actors especially to acknowledge the city's government's role in that. And right, that's the backpack that you're wearing into every meeting with the community. Like, you may not be here trying to do the same thing, but the last person who came into this community had and was, was using your tools might have been. So it's an important you know, beginning point to, say, to start out uh, that you need to sort of reestablish that trust and we're here trying to have a different conversation. We want to hear what you think about equitable economic development might be. And, and we acknowledge a lot of that has happened before. And the fourth is transparency, and I think this is really where um, a lot of communities, not just New York, but a lot of communities that pursued the Amazon HQ2 really faltered, right? By doing um, the kind of old world economic development models of like literally, in many cases, I think the smoke-filled room where a lot of dudes, mostly dudes, um, were back negotiating with like what, the, what kind of incentives they're going to throw into the package, and there wasn't really any conversation about any of the th three things that came before this or anything else about what the community might have wanted or what they might have needed or what they would set as performance targets. Maybe you're going to have to give a big t um, tax incentive to attract certain things that you want to happen in your community, but let's be clear and upfront about what you expect to get in return for that and what happens if it doesn't come to pass. Um, a culture of connection and collaboration, it won't surprise you to learn that when we go in and visit lots of local governments in lots of places, like we are coming from Washington and we are introducing sometimes agencies to each other, they've never met before, like try to not make that happen. <laughs> um, the sixth is the idea of resource mapping and the background picture here is a web shot from the San Francisco, city of San Francisco small business portal, um, which is a beautiful website and you should look at. And what it, it's sort of cut off with the three photos show you three different things. So like there's one for food entrepreneurs. That's the steaming bowl of whatever it is. Um, and uh, so the challenge is that many cities don't think from a user perspective, right? And city governments are organized like that previous org chart. So they're organized in this kind of silos of the departments. And so they think about planning, they think about economic development, they think about workforce support, and they don't think about the user that's trying to access a little bit from each of those things. So this website does a really good job of coordinating in one place and imagining from a user's perspective, like I run a food truck, so I have questions about incentives for food entrepreneurs. I will click on this bowl of steaming dumplings and that will connect me to then, you know, opportunities or, or resources for me from seven or eight different city departments. So I don't have to figure out which city department I'm trying to find something from or I need a permit from or I could get an incentive from because it's organized and mapped for my resources in this kind of way. And then the last, and there's three parts of this, which are partnerships are really critical. The first is the regional economic development strategy, and this is where a lot of center cities really are in a hard spot. 
many large U.S. cities turn over large amounts of money every year to a regional economic development agency, a regional chamber, a regional partnership. I don't need to name names. Um, but one city, large city we were working with, you know, had given over for many years 90% of the city's economic development budget was a contract to an eight-county regional agency that then was, you know, doing some business attraction, doing work, but mostly like going to get delegations from China and bringing them to look at particular sites or bringing about investments there. So if the central city in this eight-county region is trying to solve an unemployment challenge in one side of its city, a handful of neighborhoods that have a really high unemployment rate, that regional eight-county agency is never going to bring a prospective employer or investor to that neighborhood, right? So that is not the best investment of 90% of your city's economic development dollars. You've got to figure out when your city's goals sometimes differ from a regional economic development plan. And maybe there's still a part that you're a part of these regional goals to participate in that kind of business attraction, but you also have to dedicate a portion of your budget to taking care of the parts of your city's economic de development and vision and strategy that work for your citizens. The um, second partnerships are critical harmony is the Workforce Investment Board. The trick here is in most U.S. communities, a Workforce Investment Board is a creature of a county government, right, because it's one of these sort of suite of human services that we tend to operate in the U.S. at the county level, and cities do economic development. Now, maybe that makes sense on paper because cities are wheeler and dealers and they have mayors who are supposed to be these dynamic people out and going and making economic development deals, and counties are dealing with human services. But when you have your city's economic development agency out recruiting employers for jobs that literally no one is training anyone for in your community, that's a problem, and that's a mismatch of resources. And um, several cities that I've worked with, I've gone in, and the first time that the Workforce Investment Board chair is meeting the city's economic development director is at a meeting that I've called. Like, that's bonkers. Don't do that. Um, even when you work for different agencies, you should have a more coordinated strategy. And then the third, which is probably the most obvious to many of you because you've worked in a lot of communities, is it's really important not just to have a sound civic infrastructure, but for the city to regularly meet with them. Because they understand what's going on and what the needs are of different neighborhoods and communities, right? So a city can't build a sort of from the top down economic development strategy without understanding what those needs and those voices are. And so it's really important to have that kind of partnership in place. And with that, I will look forward to further conversation and all of your questions. Thanks. Great, thank you, Jen, Jess, and Lynn, Liz. Um, and those Jeff's are great. gonna come up too. Okay, great. Really appreciate um, those presentations. Um, I, it's really interesting, just a little bit um, about me that's actually not in the bio, because I'm speaking a little bit later, is that I actually have, um, I'm trained as public policy specialist. I went to public policy school, at the University of Chicago and really actually started out um, in this um, inquiry around policy and applied research and I worked for the National Opinion Research Center so I'm very familiar with um, public opinion research um, and through the course of my career I actually moved, I gravitated more toward the actual um, building and, and projects and I don't think my evolution is really uncommon. I think that uh, a challenge for policy folks is about how do you make it tangible and relevant and how do you get from, from your perspective, Elizabeth mm -hmm. and, and Jeff, you know, you're doing all this great research, but there is this disconnect about mm -hmm. sort of who actually really needs it or could use it and how do you package your, your, your information. I, it was great to see the, um, city's health department up there as one of your partners yeah. for your survey but i can i think almost everyone could use every every government agency um could use um some of the information so um i say i say this more as a statement and it's really a challenge mm -hmm. i mean with you jess i mean i think that i mean you work at a national scale mm -hmm. and so you're seeing a lot of the best practices a lot of the things not to do 
but I, I still think there's a challenge um, around um, with decision makers. Mayors are an interesting breed of, of, of person. Uh, they are very transactional and um, policy is not something that often really resonates. So um, the question is for both of you, but maybe I'll start with just around, you know, how do you really break down policy? Like okay. policy to me is something that's, it's like everyone's like, oh yeah, yeah, we need to do it. Mm -hmm. But at a citywide level, it's actually very challenging because we're really driven by the crisis of the day and we're also driven by the stuff that needs to get done mm -hmm. and like the projects um, in terms of real estate and planning. So the question really is how do you how do you elevate policy? Because I always say policy is the glue mm -hmm. that makes all of that stuff mm -hmm. stick and, and sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's been challenging mm -hmm. to actually, you know, get that, to, to, to elevate policy, um, I think, to its rightful place mm -hmm. in a local government context. Mm -hmm. And I'd be interested in your thoughts and opinions on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's really hard to do. It's a, a great problem you've identified, both in sort of the real estate and development world, like the projects we saw on the previous panel, and then also on policies, um, like you guys are doing in Detroit or any of the cities we're working with on economic development. I think when we're sort of coaching city officials, one thing I like to remind people is I think sometimes mayors, I mean, all mayors get elected because they have some skill set in the sort of community organizing and campaigning that happens that got them to that place. But a lot of them then get into the role of mayor and see their job then as more of a, a more refined city manager. I'm getting policy ideas from these various people in my cabinets. I'm having to negotiate with uh, legislators on the city council. And I like to remind them that like they got here by uh, having a sort of comfort with the rhetoric and talking to people in the campaign that's very different than what a lot of mayors do on their day-to-day -day basis in their office at the desk of the mayor. And that they can when there's an important policy decision that's not obviously popular and they, there's gonna have to be like a sort of sales pitch or an explanation or a reinvigoration of that conversation, that the mayor can sort of fall back on his or her previous sort of campaigning skills in a way that they don't always do. And, and I think that's a useful reminder that they can sort of listen to the policy wonks who are working from them, but that they have a particular skill set to turning that back around and talking in real people language, not in all of the acronyms that practitioners tend to rely on more in the policy world. Yeah, I'll go next. Um, so I would, I absolutely agree with that and, and sort of building on it. Um, in this work and in other work that I do, I know that Jeff does, you know, we really try to think about policy very broadly. So um, uh, more from almost sort of like a governance perspective, there are a lot of non-governmental actors involved in policy. Um, and the data that we're producing we really see as not strictly for the consumption by city government. We absolutely are working, I see our wonderful colleague Luke Schaefer uh, in the back from Poverty Solutions. We work very closely with Poverty Solutions to try to make connections within city government, but uh, we think that to make policy change, um, you've got so many other actors that need to be at the table as well. So your table setting question or comment I thought was a terrific one. So one of the challenges that at DMAX we face is how do we collect data that's relevant to lots of different stakeholders, lots of different people involved in the policy process um, and balancing some of these interests, right? So, um, you know, it may be that the data that the city wants to hear about might be different from the data that a community-based organization wants to hear about. Our view is we don't take sides. Um, we want to be providing a resource for lots of folks who are in, who are actively engaged in the policy process around development in Detroit and to be responsive to the different needs and interests that they have in data. Um, there's also a proactive element, which is making sure that we don't just put it out there, but that we actually let people know what we're doing and the data that we're collecting so that, um, so that it's accessible to them. Because a lot of what we need to do is think about, okay, we have this data, but not everybody is going to want to run a regression to figure it out, right? So how do we present it and work with stakeholders to think about 
about what's the form in which this data is most useful to you? And the answer to that is different from the different people that we're working with and trying to be responsive to and trying to provide resources to. Did you want to add yeah, to that? Uh, so yeah, I wanted to, I was going to echo some of what Liz just said, but uh, just for those academics in the room, I was going to say that your, our approach to crafting th these questionnaires really is, requires a different way of thinking than, than it would if we were just doing this for research purposes. And I think that's one of the, the things that's been maybe, maybe challenging, but also exciting about the work that, we're, that, we're, that we've embarked on is for every question that we write on one of these questionnaires, we think, who is the intended audience and how is it going to be used? And for that to really work effectively, you have to be in pretty close partnership with at least one p p uh, partner that's going to use that. And so we've been pretty deliberate about trying to do that. Um, for those non-academics in the audience, I think the value proposition that we're trying to make here is that there, there's a lot of data that are available to community organizations, to governments. Um, on one of your slides, you had like a backdrop that showed like a dashboard of all these different mm -hmm. metrics, but that there's still, we feel like there's still value in public opinion data of going out and, and, and collecting data in a, in a way that's intended to be used for, the, for these purposes rather than like organically produced data that are produced by administrative agencies or whatnot that could be seized and used as an as a indicator of something. We're trying to be more intentional and direct in measuring what we think people care about and what we're being told that people care about. Um, but it does require a different approach. Mm -hmm. um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Oscar Perriabello. I'm the editor of Next City, and I'll get to tell you more about me and what we do in my presentation later. Although I should say full disclosure, Jess Zimbabwe is our, on our board, and she, is also, she was our board chair for many years. So I just want to get that out there. Uh, and then ask her a question. So, throw a hardball, throw a hardball. Yeah. <laughs> um, you've, you've been doing this work now, cutting across so many different cities, seeing so many different places, so you, seeing so many different tables like, yeah. like you're talking yeah. about. I wanted to ask you about, um, are you seeing representation change? Ethnically, racially, gender-wise, in, in at these tables, in these who, on, in these policy discussions, and why does it matter? Oh, I, uh, I'll take the second part. I think representation is a huge, huge difference maker in communities. I think it's changing, but not fast enough, um, and partly because of the funny ways of governments and the way we draw districts and elections, right? And um, you know, their council districts are like, oh, well, that's so and so seat, or that's a that's a black neighborhood. Like that's got to be a, um, but it, it it makes for funny representation. Um, the way that a lot of city councils are really carved up, they're getting better. Most cities that are reforming or redoing their districts or boundaries are doing more intentional approaches to that. But there is a large, like a top 50 United States city that until just a few years ago, um, had two representatives from each council district. And the way that the election worked was that one of the representatives from that district had to live in the district, um, and it was voted on by the representatives of that district. And the other person representing that district, also representing that district, was voted on by the representatives of that district, but could live anywhere citywide, right? So <coughs> what it meant is, I think there were five or six different districts in the city. It was a huge dilution of the minority vote re representation on the council, right? Because um, the people who were, were voted on citywide tended, by and large, to be white people, right? Who had better connections to raise more money in their campaign, have more downtown people interested and invested in their campaign, donating for t-shirts and lawn signs. Um, so in a city that was almost half minority, um, like a quarter of the council was minority because it was only the people who were voted on by that district and in that district that ended up being representing those districts because of this way they'd done it. So they undid that system to their credit. Um, but that kind of thing is slow and has l hugely lasting impacts because that's just the elected city council people, right? Yeah. So then when you think about all the appointments and the civic service, civil service level and how long tenured those jobs are, um, there's, a, there's a long lead line when there's a demographic change that happens, you know, it's not like it happens overnight, all of a sudden you wake up and your community is majority minority. Um, it's been happening for a long time and trending a long time, but government and positions of power tend to be way slower than what actual communities are. And then pr the private sector is even harder because it doesn't have any kind of transparency. So your, your sort of chambers of commerce tend to be white dominated. They tend to be somewhat bad actors in terms of bringing about more equitable policies. So the Nashville Chamber of Commerce, for instance, after the citizens of Nashville voted for very strict 
minority hiring requirements on publicly funded projects, the Nashville Chamber of Commerce went to the state of Tennessee legislature and passed get legislation at the state level prohibiting local governments in the, city of, in the state of Tennessee from adopting those kind of bills. Right? So the private sector sort of power structures and levers um, can be even more reactionary than those that are public, which are already too slow. Um, and, and so they don't, so I, I mean, I, 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 well, for yeah, someone who works with yeah. government, there's a lot of over, tables I feel like overturning and like. But, but so just wanna, to get to the second part, yeah. so why does it matter? Um, it matters because it's the only way to bring about a just city. I mean, we can't make decisions. You're, you're not going to make decisions that are bringing about actual just places and economies um, if the people who are benefiting from the unjust economies we have <coughs> are the ones making those decisions. I, I, don't, I don't see how we're going to get there. Right. With, so we only have a few more minutes left. We want to open it up to the audience for questions. See a hand back there. <laughs> um, Ann Arbor is a wealthy community. Um, it's an uh, economic driver in the community, uh, yet we still hear our um, economic development corporations, our chambers talking about uh, trying to lure in like high tech businesses. Um, like that's the sexy taxi kind of business, but it's not necessarily what we need. And I'm wondering who's doing it well to talk about uh, the broader community and the people who are living there for the economic development for uh, folks that aren't in that sort of high 1% mm -hmm. echelon. Mm -hmm. And how do they do that? Um, I, I will say that I sort of acknowledge where cities are at that we, we generally don't say like don't attract high tech companies because it's, it's sort of a both and solution. Um, communities are kind of on a treadmill. They're set up in the system to be competing with each other. So it's very difficult to be the one community that just jumps off the treadmill entirely. Um, and which is why I think you saw so many communities competing and putting in bids for Amazon HQ2, even when it was absurdly obvious that there were only like a handful of cities they were really going to seriously consider anyways. But you still saw like, uh, like I don't know, Fayetteville, Arkansas or something took out like a full page ad in the New York Times saying like Amazon, even though we don't have transit, we don't meet your education goals and we don't meet your, please consider us. Like what is going on? Like the, it's just, it's so hyper competitive, but cities are so scared to be the first one to get off that treadmill because that that's like giving up on like that they're never going to have a high tech future. So I sort of acknowledge that cities are going to always have to be chasing whatever they they all want a medical complex, they all want high tech jobs, they all want financial districts, major employers, but I think you have to do both and. And so that's the real problem if there's no other um, attraction or work going on in your community to solve challenges of people who are already there, who are unemployed, who are underskilled, who are disconnected from the economy in any way, <coughs> then that's problematic if you're only chasing the sort of high tech jobs. So we're, and generally, because we work for cities, so we love them all, um, not advising cities to, to like gold cold turkey off trying to attract things, but to do both and. That helps. Mm -hmm. Time for one more. We've got Sir back right here. Yes, appreciate you. Uh, being that you're operating in a national space, um, what cities have you actually seen that's done a really good job of anti-poverty initiatives and equity uh, type of activity? So give me some, like, some highlight cities that we can all research and kind of see some of the work that they're doing, if you yeah. can, please. Yeah, um, I mean, some of them, I think, are, won't be surprising to you because they're cities that have, uh, uh, like coastal cities with fairly high functioning economies that have started really honest conversations about it. So the work in Portland, um, Portland a couple years ago renamed and did a whole, not just a name, but a whole rebranding and a whole re-strategy of their, the agency formerly known as the Portland Development Commission. And it's now called Prosper Portland. And I recommend signing up for their weekly newsletter. Every week I scan it. I'm always amazed at stories and ways they're doing things. They're having community meetings to set goals and targets before they put out an RFP for a developer for like a two acre site. Um, so it's a totally different ball game of how cities are engaging in the goals and targets there. Austin's doing a lot of work trying to sort of draft off of the tech workers. So they've got a project called Project Einstein, Einstein sorry, that's um, making every tech company that comes in um, through a state incentive commit to giving a certain percentage of their uh, proceeds in the Austin city region towards training programs for Austinites who are from non-traditional backgrounds to get training to move into tech jobs. Um, I think the city of Boston's doing a lot, and they also just did a sort of reframe of the former Boston Redevelopment Authority. I, 
I can give you others on particular areas. I, I, I don't know if there's anybody that's like a superstar that's done it all, right? Their cities are all challenging, but I think there are some cities that have gotten a, f a few sort of wins in early leads to kicking those challenges. And I would just humbly brag that the city of Detroit, I think yeah. that we are definitely... Sorry, in, I also should have said Detroit, and... <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't have to say You should it. drive down the I, road. I, I they do amazing work. <laughs> It's okay. I just, I just think that we are emerging as a best practice. I think yeah. our story is still being written, but I think early indicators show that we're learning okay. from some of the mistakes that other cities have made, or I, I guess benefiting in where we are in our recovery process. And I'm not going to take Maurice's thunder, because I know he's going to be talking a lot about um, equity and planning and development um, in just a few minutes. But I would definitely um, add Detroit um, yeah. to that list, especially as it pertains to small and local business development in yep. particular. Um, we also have a similar program around in developing minority developers as well. Um, so it, there's a lot of things that, that's outside of my purview and Maurice's purview that I would encourage you to, to think about um, when you're thinking about incentives around workforce development and, and job creation. Um, so I'm happy to chat with you during the break to point you um, in those directions. So uh, let me thank the panelists again. Round of applause for your thank remarks. You. Thank you. Yeah, hi everyone. I, uh, I'm faculty at the Ford School of Public Policy in the School of Social Work and the Director of Poverty Solutions, which is a university-wide initiative meant to enhance work going on all across the university partnering scholars at U of M and students with communities and policymakers to find new ways to prevent and alleviate poverty. We're really pleased to be a co-sponsor of today's, uh, the, today's uh, conference. In particular, strategically, we co-sponsored by Paying for Lunch, which we know always leads to outside popularity. So think of us while you're eating. Uh, and my role is simply to introduce Maurice Cox, which I, uh, who I'm delighted uh, to uh, get to hear from myself. He's a nationally acclaimed community designer and leader in the public interest design movement. As I'm sure uh, we all know, he's currently the director of planning and development for the city of Detroit, and Maurice is in charge of the long-term vision for redeveloped Detroit, improving Detroit neighborhoods, and developing strategies to boost stable areas of the city with new business and residential development. So we're going to hear remarks uh, from Maurice and then open up for Q&A. And I'm particularly excited to throw around this, uh, this <laughs> microphone here. So get your questions ready. I'll have a bunch of them. So if you don't speak up, uh, then I'm just going to take the moderator's prerogative. Maurice Cox. Thank you. Um, so, uh, still good morning. Um, uh, I'd like to thank the Taubman School and, uh, in particular, Mark Norman for hosting uh, a conference that I don't have to get on a plane to attend uh, and, uh, and really speak to an audience that um, knows uh, about the challenges that Detroit faces. I often find myself having uh, to introduce uh, people to this um, kind of bizarre uh, reality that we live. Excuse me, this wasn't completely set up. Uh, I just want to make... Uh, okay. Okay. Um, so I'm going to try to talk about the particular um, framework of Detroit's recovery through the lens of equity and to make a case um, that um, there are very tangible things that the city is doing um, to assure that we can make good on the promise of creating one of the most equitable recoveries that an American city has yet to see. Um, so the, the challenge, I think, that we've heard throughout the, the morning is, so, so what is equity? Uh, what does it mean? You ask you know, 50 different people, you'll get 50 different answers. Um, so one of the things that we uh, did um, as a planning department, being that a lot of people, um, their tenure here in, in the um, 
Detroit metro area has is, is only been about 36, 46, uh, 48 months. Um, so uh, as many of you know, um, we went from a planning department of uh, six professional planners uh, to a planning department of 36 planners in, uh, in as many months. And so um, trying uh, to understand what equity meant to such a diverse group of professionals um, was um, our first task. Can we define it for ourselves? So um, we took a poll. We got you know 80% respondents. So this was about 2016. Um, and we got a variety of answers. Um, and um, the, the, the ones that jumped out and got like more um, than 15% um, um, were around the um, physical issues of access, uh, access to services, um, and um, some of the qualitative um, uh, um, experiences having to do with participation. Um, who's at the table uh, when we decide on the recovery? And then there was a group that fell into this question of being fair, um, honesty, uh, trustworthiness, and stewardship. Um, so, you know, uh, what do we mean then uh, by inequitable recovery? Um, well, um, it means confronting um, some of those really vexing challenges um, when a place is recovering. The issue of displacement, um, the racial tensions um, that arise out of groups uh, changing, um, um, the, the enormous housing disparities even within uh, an existing city, blight and abandonment, government's absenteeism from um, people's lives, uh, and um, it goes on and on. Uh, and I would argue media slander is right up there. Um, as many of you know, the national media determined uh, that Detroit was a dying city. So much so that they had the audacity to say, would the last person out of Detroit please turn out the lights? Oh wait, too late. So that was 2012, um, just prior to the bankruptcy. So uh, Detroit is attempting to do something um, that has a lot of implications. It's not just a political slogan. Is it possible for the largest majority African-American city in America um, to build a city which is welcoming to all? One city for all of us. And how, how do you actually put that into practice? Um, I bring to this conversation um, a, a kind of career of trying to pursue this question of equitable de development, inclusive development, is it possible to reframe um, neighborhoods and the rights of citizens who live in cities um, having equal access to a kind of socially, economically, environmentally well-designed community? I mean, is it possible that that should be a democratic right? And how do you design for that? Clearly, it puts design in the forefront of the question, right? And so um, bridging the gap between where people think design is and their everyday life um, would shift the question of where design intent um, should most principally be done is in the neighborhoods, because people live in neighborhoods. So a lot of the conversation has been about shifting the conversation about quality design from downtown uh, into the places where people actually live. So uh, that's, that's a challenge, right? Because uh, Detroit is really, really big, right? And it's um, been big. It was the fifth largest city in America in, 2000, uh, in 1950 and lost over 1.1 million people over seven decades. So we're now um, like the 25th largest city in America at 673,000. Um, those people who left 
uh, did not take their houses with them, right? And so as a result of um, the, both the houses and the demolition of those structures that had become blighted, uh, Detroit finds itself with over 24 square miles of vacant land, right? Which changes uh, the equation, right? If you were to combine um, all of that publicly held land uh, in one mass, it would be larger than the island of Manhattan, right? So um, unfortunately, it's not contiguous like that. Uh, the pattern of vacancy uh, looks very much like this. You can find uh, an area in the upper um, right, which is intact, just uh, next to an area which is partially vacant to an area that's completely gone. And this um, mosaic pattern of houses uh, that are derelict, um, we've been systematically going about removing them. And still, there are 26,000 um, st uh, structures still standing. Uh, so the other aspect of this is Detroit is black. Um, and it has evolved this way with enormous um, intent and consequence. Uh, and it goes way back. Um, most of you know um, about the Great Migration North. 200,000 Southerners came to Detroit. And they came looking uh, for opportunity, uh, for good jobs. And uh, just to, to make a point, 700,000 Detroiters were working for the World War II um, war industry um, within the city of Detroit, and many were people of color. And this actually helped build, many people say, Detroit invented the black middle class because those jobs um, produced prosperity. Uh, and so uh, the home ownership was high. Uh, and um, even um, 70 years later, um, the black middle class uh, was the last group of people to leave. Uh, and so um, it has given Detroit a kind of unique um, demographic. 80% of the population is, Af is African American, 10% Latino, and 10% white. Um, lastly, I'll say Detroit is beautiful. Uh, and I think most of you uh, know that, right? It is culturally beautiful uh, and some of the iconic uh, trends uh, that it has given us. Um, it is physically beautiful, probably one of the most extraordinary collection of uh, mid -20, um, 20th century high rise buildings in the country. Um, but even in its neighborhoods, there are dozens and dozens of gorgeous neighborhoods that are majority African-American, uh, and this is what they look like, right? So clearly there's some strengths here um, that uh, are, form the foundation of this recovery. Um, but it's also a, a fairly poor city, and I think it's really important. I think this um, 26,000 uh, median in, uh, household income was about four years ago, and I'm happy to say that the uh, household median income has risen to 30,000 over the past four years. That means more Detroiters are working, and as they are working, uh, they are staying in the city and changing the uh, household um, economic composition. Um, the great bankruptcy of 2013, um, as you can imagine, um, you can't get any lower than that, but at the same time, you can see from some of the headlines, it represented a fresh start to rethink the kind of city that might come um, as a result of this. Uh, and, um, you know, Detroit has a, a spirit, uh, and it's a spirit of resiliency, uh, and I think it's evidenced by the hundreds of thousands of people who stayed, who worked on this project long before uh, we got here. And they are the ones that come to the countless, and I would say hundreds, of community meetings that the planning department holds an annually. 
uh, and they are um, planning to stay. Uh, and they're planning for equity. And so uh, there are a host of ways in which we are trying to embed equity in the planning process. And um, they, they fall into this notion of uh, single family housing rehab. rehab. Rehab the houses that we have first before we build any new single family houses. Uh, has to do with the commercial corridors and clustering um, development in a walkable um, geography that supports um, kind of neighborhood main streets. Um, neighborhood development um, taking on a neighborhood at a time. Uh, and then the preservation, preservation of the tens of thousands of buildings that are empty uh, and grafting on the important issues of equity to the adaptive reuse. Uh, and then um, excellence in design, uh, the quality of the physical and uh, natural environment, making it incredibly high. And then the most important, I would argue, uh, retaining affordability. So we do a lot of mapping. And here you're seeing the areas um, where we have decided um, have the potential, the greatest potential for growth um, in the first phase of the recovery, the areas in yellow. And the areas in blue are all of the, all of the parcels that have been demolished. And you can see there, they literally are a connective tissue to those areas that are highlighted in yellow. And so for us, the, the question was, how do we find a dimension for which we can actually um, plan um, uh, at multiple scales that is um, discernible, walkable, and understandable, the changes in re uh, revitalization that's happening. And I think over uh, months, we, we found this kind of quarter square mile uh, increment that would allow us to both address the issues of housing, um, the streetscapes, commercial streetscapes, land stewardship, uh, parks, and greenways. And so there are 10 areas um, in the city that have been um, identified uh, as uh, these um, strategic neighborhoods that will be first in line. And over the course of um, a couple of years now, um, in each of those geographies, we've identified a quarter square mile where we can practice um, a variety of ways of um, stabilizing uh, those, those neighborhoods and dealing very specifically with the vacant land as the potential asset. Um, and so uh, I'm not, unfortunately I can't go through uh, them today, but just to say that each of them is authored by one of our um, design professionals in the office with a national partner that we bring in um, over a course of about 12 months. And we've gotten six of them done. Our goal is to have um, 10. And the idea is um, to see if we can create a kind of vibrant, growing neighborhood outside of the 7.2 square miles of the, uh, the core. So these neighborhoods are purposefully spread uh, across 139 um, square miles. They are purposefully located in councilmatic districts. Uh, and so this even, I mean, it was talked about a little earlier, but even the fact that Detroit reorganized itself around council districts has changed the way in which we do planning. You can no longer just plan downtown and downtown adjacent. You have to be seven, eight miles away from that core because that, there's a group of 100,000 people who are represented by that city councilor. So one example, the first that we undertook uh, that has gotten a fair amount of uh, national attention is this uh, Fitzgerald project of 100 homes, um, actually, um, and about 200 um, flowering meadow gardens being plan planned in a quarter square mile segment. And um, a central park in its core and a greenway which makes up the other um, 
uses of the vacant land. Um, here, the invention was to take housing rehab, which is a staple in so many um, recoveries of neighborhoods, and try to attach the vacant land adjacent to that house uh, together. So it becomes one proposition, one developer um, who takes on the homes, but also takes on the planting of these gardens. Uh, and you're starting to see some of the first houses. It, it needs to be stated that the um, median household income in this area is 30,000 or less. So we purposefully went to the weakest part of uh, the uh, well, otherwise stable area of the city, Livinoy McNichols, and invested heavily in the area that needed the most support. Um, and of course, who does this development is as, as equally important as to who benefits from it. Uh, and uh, this uh, is a pretty incredible story of a group of uh, young um, entrepreneurs who came here probably a month after I did and are now shepherding one of the largest uh, experiments of this kind in the country. Um, so the question is, how do, you, uh, how do you fund this stuff? And how do you do it times 10? Um, so one of the inventions that the city is, has, uh, is creating is the idea of a strategic neighborhood fund. Uh, and to pair that with an affordable housing leverage fund. Uh, and it works uh, like, uh, like this. It starts with um, a deep level of engagement with residents. Um, this is, again, over a 12, 9 to 12 month period, uh, dozens of meetings, entire, and, in, entirely different types of touch points with an intent of getting individual residents to begin to make collective decisions about where investment will go uh, in their community. And we hosted in 2018 uh, 250 meetings across uh, the city. And you can see many of them are, are interactive. And the idea is this, uh, residents are asked to explore um, questions about single family housing stabilization, about the commercial corridor where we want them to uh, shop, uh, the system of parks and greenways, uh, and um, the kind of streetscapes, the physical space um, for gathering. Uh, so these are the four investment categories, and then we overlay them in a walkable 20-minute geography. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to take you through one um, of those implementations, and it has to do, um, this one is in southwest Detroit, uh, a largely uh, Latino community, um, and uh, there the process dealt with both meeting people where they are, that means having translators uh, for the meetings, that means if they don't come to public meetings for whatever reason that they don't want to be um, um, seen, uh, we would go to the churches and hold our meetings after the Sunday worship service and literally get hundreds of people. Um, it takes a, a geography which is a few square miles. It's usually anchored by a commercial corridor. Uh, and again, it has these um, uh, four investment areas. And how um, they play out is one, to um, identify the housing that needs to be preserved to assure um, inclusion. Um, two, um, creating a new level of mixed use develop development along a commercial corridor that can be serviced by transit. And you've seen an example of that on Werner. Uh, the park, uh, the park as a signature that deals very specifically with the cultural identity of that area. Um, single family housing, rehab, and then again, um, streetscapes. Um, and that, that assembly is uh, clustered. So it's targeted, clustered investment that fits easily within a quarter square mile. And so you're seeing how those investments are um, situated. So a park, which is already a beloved park in the neighborhood, um, looks like this after uh, the investment. So uh, it becomes a, a zocolo um, from uh, the Latino tradition. Or uh, the commercial corridor, which is 
uh, a, a vacant lot in a street that otherwise has a street wall, um, integrating um, a mixed-use development that continues that street wall. Very important here uh, is the uh, affordance of public space as well as of community function. So apart from a high degree of affordability, you're also seeing um, a community room um, that um, the, the one, the blue and the green, that's situated in the middle of the development. And then, of course, how can we make those streets um, culturally specific? There's, uh, there are a lot of festivals, so could we erase um, the curb line where um, a street could double uh, as an event space? Uh, and then um, other ideas about how to create streets which are more pedestrian oriented uh, and create uh, and foster connectivity. So the street investment um, looks like this. And then the last piece, the single family affordable um, housing that gets renovated uh, and the uh, multifamily uh, existing uh, housing that is also targeted for uh, preservation of affordability. So affordability is the big key here because the big challenge is will these capital investments um, trigger a displacement? Um, so um, as has been mentioned, we feel very fortunate to be able to learn from a host of other cities that have been where we are now. We are at the point where um, Washington was 10 years ago, uh, um, or maybe more, um, at that point where um, the city was pivoting towards growth. And it's pretty clear, we expect to prove in the 2020 census that Detroit is in fact growing again. Um, but we have the opportunity to put in place the affordable housing strategies before we start growing again. So um, here are some of the things that were done to anticipate this, both in terms of um, requiring a percentage of affordable housing in all projects with city investment, um, creating uh, a, 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 the city council adopting an inclusionary affordable housing ordinance, and then the creation of a, 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 an affordable housing leverage fund so that all of the buildings you see here uh, in this high rise and in, in this downtown are high rise buildings of which the city has been able to go in and lock in the affordability for those residents who live there for the next 30 years. Very important. And those buildings look like this. Um, and so as downtown effectively gentrifies, the folks who were living here long before the others arrived will also be here, and they will be here for 30 years to come. Um, we not only think about it in terms of the downtown strategy, but what, what are the federally regulated affordable housing units throughout the city? And we have literally counted every one of them, and we know when they're going to expire. And so we've made a commitment to preserve 10,000 units of affordable housing that are federally regulated um, that are set to expire in the next five years. Uh, and so when we go into a neighborhood, the first thing we do, all those dots, is look at what housing units are going to expire when, and to raise that money, the Affordable Housing Leverage Fund, to preserve them. So about $250 million is being um, raised to do that with a commitment of 10,000 units um, that first pass to, to lock in to affordability and the creation of 2,000 more units um, that will be accompanied with the market rate new developments that I uh, showed. So um, that part is really important. The other part, and I have never given this talk or this push portion of uh, the story, um, but we've talked a lot about community benefit agreements, and Detroit has a pretty uh, audacious one uh, that was adopted, and I thought it would be helpful to kind of share with you what's come out of that process, how we do it. Um, so the, um, the community benefits uh, ordinance, what it is for us, it's this process uh, for developers uh, to effectively and proactively engage with the community in an um, environment that is designed to be productive 
uh, and then to identify and address any negative um, project impacts. And it was um, a part, it was put up for referendum and the voters in 2016 uh, voted uh, for the, con um, the conditions that you see here. Um, so we're talking about impacts. So we look at the scope of the project, um, its impacts, um, who will be in impacted by it, and how can the developer mitigate any uh, negatives. So the planning department is entrusted to facilitate this process. Um, and um, we determine the, the geographic boundary of who, um, who gets to participate in that area. And then um, it define, defines who those residents uh, are, those who have standing. Um, the um, ordinance establishes that um, these, the community benefits agreement will be triggered with uh, 75 million um, or more in construction costs, um, plus a, a million or more in um, city tax abatement if the projects are receiving that, and, um, or a, a million more in the value of the sale of land. A lot of these projects involve uh, the sale of land. It um, is structured um, to have a minimum of five meetings over the course of a number of months. Um, they're averaging about six to seven. It is made up of a nine-member body. The community uh, comes to a kind of uh, town hall meeting and they self-nominate and they uh, select two. Um, the city council gets to appoint three members uh, and uh, the planning department gets to um, appoint four. So there's that process. And then, of course, what we're seeing is um, we are having a structured conversation um, for our private developments. People are able to express uh, the concerns uh, and impacts that they understand they may have. The developer has a chance uh, to have um, a facilitated dialogue with the community and uh, ultimately um, citizens get to participate in the growth. And so some of the high level takeaways just in um, nine community benefit processes that we've managed, there have been over 50 community meetings for it, 500 residents. Um, you can kind of see uh, the statistical takeaways. They have almost all been in the 7.2 uh, square mile area. So we're talking about how do we take the benefits of those and expand them uh, beyond even their border. And this is how they're doing it. Um, so there are a wide range of um, projects. So the, Pist the Pistons um, Clubhouse uh, in Midtown um, there's about $100,000 a year that's uh, going into uh, Growing Detroit's Young Talent uh, Youth Employment Program. Um, Pistons again, down in the lower right, 2.5 million are going to 60 outdoor basketball courts that will happen throughout uh, the city. Um, the MCS is the Michigan Central Station, which is the Ford project, 2.5 five million dollars being contributed to the affordable housing um, leverage fund and five million dollars uh, contributing to the um, workforce um, development. So sometimes they're big, sometimes uh, like the Lafayette West, it's cleaning the neighborhood's windows <laughs> for any kind of construction dust that happens uh, across um, over the time of the development. And so um, the big the big important numbers are captured here. Um, those nine projects will produce 655 million in estimated net benefits to the city, 17,500 jobs uh, in the construction, and 11,500 um, uh, permanent jobs. So the, I, I saw the signal and I'm gonna show one example that I think um, talks about the issues of equity long term that I feel that the planning profession um, has to be able to deal with. And that is um, how, do we, how do we deal with the issue 
of the damage that planning has done over the course of seven decades, um, where healthy, vibrant, um, fine-grained neighborhoods uh, like the Black Bottom were wiped away for some utopian vision of the city of the future, uh, which was centered around highways constructions. And how do we repair the damage of 70 years? And so it's really kind of fascinating that Lafayette Park is probably one of the most successful neighborhoods in Detroit. And uh, it has um, uh, some interesting ironies built into it. You know, it has towers that have assured the long-term rental affordability that makes this um, truly a mixed income neighborhood. But those towers today are owned by Mr. Jackson, who I don't think ever thought he would own two towers by Mies van der Rohe. Um, but there is some kind of poetic justice in that end. Um, but the main issue is um, this cavern that separates this neighborhood from the downtown. And is there a way to repair that? And so the planning department with others have taken on the notion of raising the highway and returning it to a surface boulevard uh, that would actually spur um, development and equitable development. And so what is happening because of that investment, um, developers are starting to position their project relative to this future investment that is supposed to be under construction in 2022. The fascinating thing um, is we're starting to see where our regulatory policies are having an impact on the development, both in terms of affordability and in terms of design, excellence, and inclusion. So these are five developments that are in, within that 20 minute walk of that catalytic reimagining of I-375 as an urban boulevard. And to the point that I made earlier, it's really important who's doing the development. Uh, and in this case, uh, these are the developers of those five projects. Um, so it's possible um, to bring uh, these issues of equity and inclusion together, and I believe build one city uh, that's truly for all of us. Thank you. I got it in. <laughs> yeah, well done. All right. Okay, so um, we've got the catch box. Do you want to throw the catch box, or shall I? Hmm. I'm going to see how this works. I love yeah. this thing. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> hey, well, well done. He can uh, land and he can throw. <laughs> I, I'm not asking this question in the context of all of the city-owned properties that you're going through the redevelopment. I understood you know, there's an initi initiative to sell them off and have that part of the development process. Can you hold the box a little closer? But for those um, city-owned properties, uh, is there any aspect of maintaining them as city-owned so that that 30-year timeline you announced for keeping them affordable actually goes on into perpetuity on a land lease, um, you know, land trust, something other that right. um, keeps them out of the market rate uh, dynamic. Yeah. No, I, I often say that one of the reasons why I feel very optimistic about um, pronouncing that we're going to try to have the most inclusive recovery in America is because um, we own 24 square miles of this city. And the city that owns land controls its future. And so, um, one example, a very powerful example, uh, is the Joe Lewis Greenway, which is a 31.5 mile loop that connects a number of those neighborhoods that I highlighted to, um, to each other and to the Detroit River. Um, if you look um, at trail development uh, as it's played out in Atlanta or Chicago, they have been extraordinary um, vehicles for uh, gentrification. And so for us, the challenge was how we were gonna make sure that ours isn't. Uh, and in fact, uh, the Joe Louis Greenway runs through neighborhoods where 30% um, of the residents don't own a car uh, or the household median income is under 
30,000. And so um, it potentially um, could have the same impact that it had in Atlanta or that the uh, Bloomingdale's Trail is having in Chicago. Well, the m more important stat from, uh, uh, from the stats about household income um, is the fact that the city owns um, about 60% of the land within a quarter square mile of where this greenway will go. So we have the ability long term to assure affordability because we control the land. And that's the simple answer. We um, are able to be very strategic about what land we, give, we um, dispose of and what land we uh, retain for um, the public interest, the public good. Good afternoon. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your service. Uh, I'm a practicing real estate attorney in Los Angeles, and so pretty much most of the conversation we're having are around opportunity zones. Uh, what is the city doing to kind of take a lead on opportunity zones as one of the largest property owners in the area? Sure. Um, we were, um, fortunately, the opportunity zone legislation uh, was emerging as we were defining our um, areas for potential growth. And so they track. Uh, very, very closely. Uh, and uh, we have seen um, three developers uh, use them. The Lafayette Park West uh, development is the first um, to uh, take advantage of the Opportunity Zones. I think it's going to be a key piece of um, the reinvestment strategy and the kind of bringing developers into areas of the city that they aren't historically, um, haven't historically uh, invested. But has the city taken a lead on how to structure the opportunity zones or where they want to guide investment? Um, they are. I mean, the, um, we work through the um, Economic Growth uh, Corporation, but there is, um, I mean, it's not my lane, uh, but uh, there is a pretty strong alignment and uh, a sense that that uh, is a tool um, that we will be able to um, use uh, to drive investment where we, where we are hoping, you know, again, it's, it's a lot, it's a little wider than opportunity zone um, question. It's really about how to get uh, non-traditional investors uh, to go into the areas where we want uh, to um, attract the investment. And we're seeing um, some pretty um, new um, players uh, and who are going to be using, taking advantage of the Opportunity Zones, as well as kind of other mechanisms. Yeah. Hey. Hi, Maurice. Um, so we've seen some really innovative strategies from the city um, for how to reuse uh, vacant land yes. in the 10 strategic neighborhood neighborhoods. And you had a slide that described those 10 neighborhoods as essentially cities within cities. Mm -hmm. Um, within a sea of green. Yes. So can you talk about what you see as the future for those other neighborhoods that aren't within the 10 yeah. SNF yeah. areas and what you see as the future for equitable, equitable development in terms of how you use that open yeah. space? Yeah, no, that's obviously, uh, that's, that's the city's competitive advantage how to uh, repurpose that land. I think one of the challenges is um, when you're thinking about clustered investment, uh, you're looking for the greatest benefit to the most people. And the most people don't currently reside in those areas that have the, uh, that kind of high vacancy. And so we have to look within the areas of, of higher um, population and look for the weak spots where we um, have um, a land resource that we can test ideas out on. So in the Fitzgerald, it's, it's 20 acres in a quarter square mile. In Rosa Parks, Claremont, it's 40 acres in one square mile. There's still 600 households in that quarter square mile. So our, our philosophy has been we want to test it there where it's gonna have the greatest benefit and take those lessons and then apply them to areas that might be um, a little less dense. So the lessons we think are the same, but I can tell you just from this 
pr project two, of which we're actually um, you know, in moving into the implement implement implementation stage, um, you know, 200 flowering meadows uh, with uh, houses in a neighborhood that's still there, um, you, you, you need one kind of strategy. You take, um, you lower the percentage of houses and you double that to 40 acres, that landscape has to be operating very, very differently in terms of being imageable. Um, and um, so um, all of the things you see us doing, um, there is a value proposition that we have to make. Uh, we have to convince the mayor that uh, land stewardship is going to drive and stabilize population. And if we, if we can't make the numbers work, um, you know, that, that's the big challenge. And I, you know, part of it, I'm, you know, I'm a little bit frustrated because I just wish I could throw money everywhere, but we can't. It actually has to have, uh, it has to be practical, it has to be I implementable. Uh, so that's one side. The other side is there are lots of policy um, changes that can be made to make it easier for people to be stewards of the land. So Detroit has sold 10,000 side lots um, to uh, residents for $100, you know, literally, and with no bureaucracy. So the question is, how do you go from a side lot, you know, literally an expansion of your property, to a lot down the block, which is not contiguous with your property, um, where you may not have the same sense of responsibility to be that steward, and we're trying to figure out a way to both uh, allow a greater variety of people um, to take um, um, control of that land. Because at 10,000 lots you know, um, in four years, we will, we, will, we will never be able to get rid of the supply strategically. So it's a, a very important conversation. And uh, I think the most important thing I say is that we're testing some ideas. And we will know what works and what doesn't work in kind of real time. Yeah. Well, we're going to do one last question so that we can get everyone to lunch. Oh, my, my he seated his question. <laughs> um, Maurice, hi. Hey. Um, do you think, getting back to the equity, that there's a, like an inherent tension between efficiency and equity? Because, uh, you know, as a Detroiter, mm -hmm. I know our mayor is all about efficiency. Get it done. Get it done. Uh, but yet I would suggest that good community engagement uh, leading to equity takes a long time in, to, for Detroiters who are kind of, uh, you know, live with decades of broken promises right. from government at all levels. And, you know, they're very suspicious. I yep. don't have to tell you when yep. planners come in and, you know, doesn't matter. Yeah, you're perceived immediately as the second coming of Charles. It's all that blessing, that, that right? backpack yeah. that uh, yeah, Jess was talking pack. about. Yeah, yeah, that was a great analogy. Yeah, no, I. Um, so, part of the part of the challenge is uh, uh, we have to implement these things, uh, and quite frankly, um, it's a lot easier to design them uh, than to get them built. Uh, and so, you know, no offense to all us designers in the room, but I'm no longer impressed that we can make beautiful things. Uh, it's mostly about how do you build the capacity to execute them, both in terms of the nonprofit sector that hasn't done this work before, the private sector that hasn't done it, the city that hasn't done it. But we are really the only ones who are accountable because we don't go away. And so people are like, uh, I hope you are going to do what you said you came to do. And so what you, one of the reasons why the projects are so, um, they're so project-based, uh, you know, there's a, a, a collection of 9 to 12 projects. Uh, and so three years from now, people will be able to say whether you did what you said you would do or not. And we don't put anything out there that isn't fully funded. So when we show the pretty picture, you better believe it, it's backed up with a capital budget and a timeline and a means to deliver on it. Because ultimately, um, it's about keeping the public trust. Uh, and that is the, that's, that's the thing that keeps us 
um, driving, uh, driving forward. So I appreciate the question, and you know, I've been here long enough to know Detroit's have a good reason uh, to be very skeptical, but they are also they've been to hell and back, and they know that this feels different, and so they've been willing to give us uh, incredible uh, benefit of a doubt, and uh, I intend to honor that trust. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jordan Davis, and I'm a development associate with the NRP Group based in Austin, Texas. I am so excited to be back for the Equitable Development Conference. Um, I graduated from Michigan's Raw School of Business in 2017, uh, and I had the privilege of being very involved in Michigan's real estate community as a student. Um, I worked as president for three years of Michigan's Real Estate Club, and also had the chance to work uh, as a teaching assistant for Professor Peter Allen's introductory development course. So I had, um, I was in a unique position to really have my ear to the ground and be in a constant, unique dialogue with hundreds of students over my four years here at Michigan. And the one thing I kept hearing over and over again from students is how many of them wanted to pursue careers in real estate development. Uh, yet, at the same time, and I actually experienced this myself, these same students struggled to find internships in development or full-time positions. So that kind of led me to ask the question, um, what should we do to bridge the gap between education and real-world experience? Uh, one thought I had was to contact Dr. Ben Carson, uh, Secretary of HUD, and a proud University of Michigan alumnus to see if anybody in the White House might be willing to declare real estate education in a state of national emergency. Uh, however, I don't think we need to pursue that path uh, because we actually have, uh, sorry, let me go back. Uh, we actually uh, are joined today by leaders in academia, industry, and the student real estate community who are truly changing the face of real estate education. Um, we're honored to be joined by Professor Ann Yoakum, who is director of Tulane University's Small Center for Collaborative Design and a professor of practice at Tulane School of Architecture. Greg Morrow, executive director of UC Berkeley's Masters of Real Estate Development and Design program. David Heller, co-founder and CEO of the NRP Group. And two current Michigan students, India Solomon, who's a second year Masters of Urban Planning student here at Taubman College, and Patrick DiGregorio, a MBA two in Michigan's Raw School of Business. Each of our uh, panelists is spearheading or participating in innovative interdisciplinary programs framed around uh, pressing issues like affordable housing, engaged design, and sustainability uh, that are both um, raising the level of students' real estate experiences and also raising the degree of social impact that academic institutions can have on their local communities. Um, at the same time, these leaders are also carving out new career opportunities for students around the country interested in social research and entrepreneurship in the field of real estate development. Um, so with that, I'm going to invite up David Heller, uh, CEO of the NRP Group, to kick everything off and then bring everybody back in a dialogue uh, after we hear from our speakers. So David, let me hand it off to you. Great. Thank you, Jordan, and uh, thank you to all of you for coming. Thank you, Mark, for inviting me. This is a real honor to be here and to talk about uh, a great program that, uh, that Dean DeRue came up with at uh, the, the Ross School of Business. And it's something that the NRP group is uh, very proud to be a part of. Jordan, thank you for moderating this session. And Jordan um, is working very closely with the LBLE group. And I didn't realize it, but um, when I was putting together the slides and I was thinking about it, and when I, when I just got here this morning, I realized that there may be people here that don't know what LBLE is. So before I get into my presentation, just a really quick note on that. Uh, LBLE is a living business model that uh, the, the Dean Daru came up with, and the concept is that there are these businesses that think about things in their boardrooms, and they talk about them, and then they get shot down because they're a really good idea, but at the end of the day, someone like the CEO or other board members say, you know what, our focus is this, and that's what we need to do, and 
Um, and so we're just going to go forward with what we do, and we're not going to worry about an ancillary uh, project because we don't have the time or the resources or taking away that focus. And a lot of times, those ideas are actually good ideas. And in the case of JetBlue, who uh, was uh, had this very instance, they were looking at uh, having luggage picked up from the, their uh, client's home uh, and then delivered to their destination. And their, uh, so whether it's a cruise or Disneyland, so that you didn't have to worry about getting that luggage to the airport, onto the plane, collect that luggage, and then take it to your destination, they thought, what if we just had a direct uh, plan? Well, uh, you know both sides of that story now that I told you. So one is that JetBlue did not get into that business because they wanted to stay focused on their business. And two, most of you know that there are businesses out there now that actually do that for you, as, and, and those entrepreneurs came up with that idea, but JetBlue could have come up with that idea had they pursued it. So the concept behind uh, LBLE is, what are some of those ideas that are sitting in the boardroom that can, then can be used, uh, to, that you can use students to do that thinking at a cheaper rate, give them an experience with a business, and it's longer term than just a semester project or a... Um, um, or, or a, a consulting agreement or a consulting engagement like MAP, it is something that is long-term and stays with the project until the project is either complete or becomes an ongoing part of the business. So that's a little bit of background on that. And the first year that this was kicked off uh, through the business school, uh, Shinola uh, did, a develop, did a project still going. Uh, Ford Motor Company did one and the NRP Group. So I just wanted to give that backdrop before I get into who we are and get into LBLE and I start using that term and Everyone says, well, what is LBLE and how did that get come about? So that's just a little bit of background. Who are we? And, and I think you know who Shinola is and I think you know who um, Ford Motor Company is. But let me tell you a little bit about the NRP Group. So the NRP Group is a real estate development firm. Uh, I co-founded it in 1994. Uh, we started as an affordable housing developer, which is basically all we did from uh, 1994 to 2008. Um, in 2008, when everyone else was having their challenges in the economy, that's when we really hit a stride because there was a real need for affordable housing and shovel-ready projects. We were uh, doing a lot of development in Texas at that time, and we really um, hit a stride in 08, uh, 09, 10, 11, and had, uh, we were met with a lot of success in those uh, years, and we decided to get into luxury market rate because we saw a disruption in the market and we saw that there was a real need um, for developers because a lot of the other developers were out there working out their challenges. So on this next run of you know, basically 2010 to today, uh, there's been a lot of high-end luxury market rate housing built. We used our talent in order to, to get into that game and become one of the largest. We're now the seventh largest uh, multifamily developer in the country and at the same time never abandon our roots of affordable housing. And we still do about 50% of what we do is affordable housing and 50% luxury uh, high-end market rate. So it's really the heart and soul is the, is the affordable, the passion within our organization. But we... Um, but it's a lot of fun building the luxury as well. So we've built about 33,000 uh, 33, plus units. Uh, we manage over 17,000 of those units. Uh, the, d the difference between those is we've sold a, a lot of uh, what we've built on the market rate side just because of the financing. You can see a map of where our offices are around the country and the different markets that we're developing in. Our newest one is in Atlanta. Uh, we recently added uh, Boston, Washington, and New York, and those developments are just coming out of the ground right now. So there's a lot of exciting things happening around the country, and what I wanted to share with you is one of the developments that we did in Columbus, Ohio. So in Columbus, Ohio, we developed the residences at Career Gateway. <clears throat> but what was unique about it, this was a low-income housing tax credit uh, family deal. And what was unique about it was with the partnership that we created. We did a partnership between Community Development for All People, which is a local neighborhood nonprofit, uh, we did the partnership with uh, Nationwide Children's Hospital, which is the largest employer in the area. And what, the way Nationwide uh, Children's Hospital looks at community development and uh, health care is they look at the, uh, at the community as the patient. And, uh, and in doing so, they realized that they need to solve uh, health, it, health disparities within the neighborhood in addition to just treating the patient. And, uh, and in doing so, we created a training center uh, where 2,400 units are used for training people within the neighborhood for jobs 
at Nationwide Children's Hospital. And what it's done is it, and it's not just for the residents of our community, but it's outward facing. So it is a community space that's open to uh, anyone on the south side of Columbus, anyone in Columbus, but it's really meant for people in this particular neighborhood. And it, and it really is, uh, it's in use about five days a week of different types of training. And what we've learned in this process is the need for, community, for uh, job training within this particular neighborhood is at epic proportions. And there are just so many people that found trust within the neighborhood by being in a safe space, as opposed to going to the ivory tower of Nationwide Children's Hospital. They were able to come to a safe space, somewhere where they felt comfortable, something that was part of the neighborhood. So the trainers come into the neighborhood as opposed to getting the people to come to the ivory tower where they don't feel safe, they don't feel comfortable, and it's been met with a lot of success. In this process, and of all the, the, um, the affordable housing that we have built uh, in, in our company over the years, we think we do a really good job of uh, building apartments, building what I, say, what I like to say is building sleep. Uh, we have a nice opportunity for uh, low-income families to live in safe, decent, affordable housing. What we don't do a really good job of, or I should say a consistent job of, is providing supportive services across the board. So if we're in Texas, we have some really unique programs that are really, really good. And the reason that they're really, really good is because the state agency says the bar for supportive services is here, so we jump over that bar to here. And if North Carolina says the bar is here, we jump over the bar to here. And there's no additional dollars for supportive services, so you need to come up with within your pro forma where you're, the pro forma is designed to provide nice, decent, safe, decent, affordable housing, there's no additional dollars for those supportive services. So the boardroom conversation that we had was how can we elevate these supportive services so that every development has a component like this, so that every development, if Texas is the bar of, the, uh, of who's doing this the best, so that we can do that everywhere, in Michigan, in Ohio, in North Carolina, and raising that bar so that we can deliver this across, the air, across all of our projects. And that's when we went to, the, to Ross Business School and said, we want to be part of LBLE. Give us a group of students, and those group of students will explore this issue, they'll analyze this issue, and, uh, and we will then at attack this issue of providing supportive services in addition to the housing. And uh, guess what? It was met with unbelievable um, uh, desire by the students, and we are in our fifth cohort right now of students tackling this problem and tackling, uh, so that means five semesters of students. And the other thing that is really unique is the consistency that we've had from semester to semester. So one of the things we looked at was, so we have affordable housing, we have the needs of the families, uh, safe and accessible neighborhoods, health and wellness, education, workforce development, and uh, looking at what supportive services uh, attack, uh, are able to attack those needs so that we can go from poverty to self-sufficiency. And that was the whole concept and premise behind what we were trying to do as part of LBLE and using the students uh, as an opportunity to run that part of our business. We said we're patient in this. We know this is long-term. This is going to take time. It really met well with working with groups of students over a period of time. There have been some challenges with it. There are things that we re, re analyze each semester and determine whether or not we're right on the right track and how we can improve this. But overall, it's just been a, an absolute win-win for both our organization and for the students. So we looked at, um, at the supportive service ecosystem and we found that it was highly fragmented, very inconsistent. And what we found was those that were doing this really, really well around the country were usually a nonprofit. It was usually a nonprofit with a very, very dynamic, mission-driven executive director with an incredible amount of passion. And that executive director with an incredible amount of passion, drive, desire, was able to do it one time and one time only for a particular development. And if they were lucky, they might replicate it three, five, seven years later. But there wasn't an ability to have a volume of success. And so what we're looking at is how, how can we do this as a volume of success? How can we do this if we're building eight to 10 developments around the country, 
how can we uh, do this on a consistent basis in all of them, in every development that we're, that we're doing, and how can we get the dollars that are out there. So I work a lot in the philanthropic world on the other side, on grant making as well, and I knew that there's a real need for the grant makers to get the dollars out into the community, and so how can we bridge that gap between our need as affordable housing and the grant makers' need to get the dollars out into the community? And so I didn't. I looked at the challenge and said, "This isn't something that is that, that can't be done." I just looked at it and said, "It's not being done, and we need to do it at a better basis." So when we explored it, we said well, the best place to do this is the University of Michigan because not only do we have really smart students in the MBA program, but we've got really smart and passionate students in a lot of other programs within the university. And that was really the aha moment for me. When Dean Daru was laying this out and he started talking about the other schools and the top programs at University of Michigan, that's when I said this is something that we want to be a part of because we want to take advantage of the social work school, of the public policy school, of the architecture school, uh, Patrick's uh, and his medical education, the dent school of dentistry. So as we started talking to, um, to different disciplines around uh, campus, we started to learn. We started to learn a lot more, and we started to see the breadth of, of top talent here. So we're able to bring together uh, folks from what, what we've done right now is uh, the different colleges within uh, uh, University of Michigan, but then we started to understand and sort of delineate how we could deliver this on a more consistent basis. And, uh, and that was really the first semester. And then the second semester carried that on and was able to grow. And, um, and each, each semester we come up with uh, continued improvement in the, in the process. One of the things that I'll share with you, because a lot of the folks in the room here are in the affordable housing space, is that the education process of getting students not, that, that don't work in this space every day and to understand affordable housing was one of our challenges. So we worked with our internal learning and development uh, department, and in our cohort number four, and many of the people are, who are here today, we're starting a learning and development module so that the students can get trained before they ever show up day one for LBLE, which is really important. It really takes a lot. I remember Scott Skinner, who is here today, who's one of the success stories of the first cohort, uh, the, part of the challenge of that was just getting everybody up to speed. What is affordable housing? What are tax credits? How do they work? How does everything flow? And, um, and now that we have, now that we're developing the modules for an onboarding system, it becomes a lot more efficient and a lot more um, streamlined. And, uh, and, that, and we, we use the LBLE students in order to create that uh, to, as an ongoing uh, uh, system so that each semester more students can come in better educated up front on what we're doing. And the other thing that's really unique about the programming is, is that for our fifth cohort, the consistency from cohort four to cohort five and the number of students that stayed on with the program for a second, for a second semester is, um, is absolutely incredible. And so um, we've beaten all of the, the others that are out there, not that it's a competition, but we really enjoy that consistency. And the other thing that we, uh, we like is that Scott Skinner, who was in cohort number one, is now uh, employed by NRP. And so by uh, we look at it as a great win-win. So we're learning a lot about how to deliver more efficient supportive services and we're also uh, have a really great look at students and an opportunity to uh, to bring them on and join our team which is fantastic so I'm going to turn it over to the next one and uh, learn a little about some of the other programs and we'll come back and ask, answer some questions how do I get this All right. Is this on? Yeah, it is. Uh, okay, I'm Greg Morrow. Uh, I am the executive director of the Real Estate Development and Design Program at uh, UC Berkeley. I'm also faculty in the city and regional planning uh, department, although I'm trained as an architect. Uh, I thought I would tell you a little bit about what we're up to. Uh, this is a brand new program for this year, so some of this is a bit experimental. Uh, but we're having good success so far. And then I think Mark had asked me to talk just a little bit about some of the research, related research, so I'll see how much we can get through. Um, so we're trying to build a different kind of real estate development program that is really based on these four core principles, innovative design, urbanism, sustainability, and equity. And by sustainability, I don't mean just the usual sustainability. We're thinking about real estate development 
as part of the solution to some of our broader uh, environmental challenges, climate change, especially in California where uh, we are very aggressive in uh, tackling climate change, it's starting to really affect the way in which developers are operating in the state. Uh, so this is our first cohort here, um, but this is really a kind of mission-driven development program. There was an article that came out in one of the San Francisco papers that said, uh, this only happens in the Bay Area. It's a uh, real estate for progressives, as it was called. Um, so we have 16 students, 50% uh, women, 25% uh, international, average age is 29. Um, thought I would just show you kind of what the core of the thing is. It's really built, it's a one year program built around 10 core uh, courses, three of which you can see the ones highlighted in color, architecture planning and landscape architecture are contributed by the three departments that make up the College of Environmental Design. So we have a, a basically a design course, understanding about the relationship between architecture and urbanism and development. Uh, this is in the summer. The summer is kind of an intensive boot camp almost. People are coming in from vastly different Backgrounds. Some of our, some of them are architects. Some of them are planners. Many of them are from finance. Some of them are from policy. Some of them from construction. So everybody's coming at this from a different perspective. So the summer is really meant to kind of be a bit of a leveling experience. We also have a, a fundamentals course in sustainable development, uh, which talks not only about the environmental issues but also economic sustainability and social sustainability. Um, and then, and so this lays down the principles. We also introduce ideas about real estate economics, uh, market analysis. Uh, so this is the summer program. Then we jump into the fall. We have a development finance course, uh, a P3 course, uh, an entitlement land use course. And there is actually one required electives, although many of them take, many of the students are taking many different electives. Uh, and then once we get into the spring, we have a pro prac course, a professional practice course, which is really all the nuts and bolts of how projects get done, contracts, uh, all, all, the, all the nitty gritty stuff. Something that's quite interesting and different about this program, uh, we have this landscape architecture course, which is really trying to understand resilience from a development point of view. How does, how is this affecting, how is sea level rise changing the way we do coastal development, for example? Uh, and other related issues to do with climate change. And then the course that I teach is the Development and Design Studio course. This is, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this in a minute, but it's a really interesting course where we have half architects and half developers uh, working on kind of real uh, projects. We also have a capstone project, which is, um, it's quite interesting. It's an applied research project. So essentially we hook uh, students up with industry with companies that have a particular challenge uh, and they do some research but it's really about how do you actually implement this in practice. So it's kind of you think about it as a kind of mini thesis but more applied than, than theory. Uh, the electives, there's a series of electives that we have. We have this interesting program which is a reciprocal agreement with our business school, with the Hospice School of Business and Berkeley Law where we get priority enrollment in some of their courses and we give priority enrollment in some of our courses. So these are some of the electives that they can take uh, within our own college. Um, and then we have a, a, a series of electives that people can take in the business school and law school. Now those are the ones that we are giving priority enrollment. People can always take other kinds of electives and these are some of the other ones that uh, students so far are taking. You can see that some of them are trying to balance out their you know, design and sustainability understanding. Others are going to take leadership courses and other foundation courses in business. So it's a bit of a, uh, allows for some level of customization within that. Uh, I think it's also important to know that we kind of adopt what we call this whole person approach. It's not just about the curriculum, it's about the whole experience, it's about developing you as, a, as an individual. There's a lot of coaching and seminars and you know, we do tours and mentoring and we do skill building on making good presentations and negotiations and all sorts of interesting things. We do a lot in the, in the realm of career placement, um, just in terms of, and speaking of which, if you're 
interested. You know, our first cohort is, uh, is graduating, so I see all those great development stuff that we saw this morning. If you're looking for talent, uh, let me know because we've got some exceptional students. Um, so we've, uh, we've stolen from Tulane the idea of the Capstone Project, partly because our faculty director, Chris Callett, uh, was once at Tulane. Uh, but we do this idea where it's, it's really a kind of presentation to the industry uh, on these uh, individual projects, tours, uh, partnerships. Uh, Factory OS is a off-site, Factory OS sounds our off-site, uh, prefab uh, construction that's in the Bay Area. Uh, we have a good relationship with them. We have design faculty that are doing innovative work like David Baker in, the, in San Francisco mostly. We have inter interesting uh, young developers like Cal Inman who did this really interesting project by the MacArthur uh, BART station in Oakland. Um, this is using um, containers that have been uh, modified to create a kind of creative office complex. So we're really trying to kind of integrate this really into the practice of development that's happening in the Bay Area. Uh, we also send all of our cohort to the ULI fall meeting, which last year was in Boston. That's something that we subsidize. Um, our model is quite interesting. We are basically a private program within a public university. It's called a self-supporting program. Uh, which is, has both advantages and disadvantages. Uh, disadvantages, we get no public money, but advantages, we are largely autonomous and we can design uh, what we want and we keep most of the tuition revenues. Uh, so that drives our revenue stream. We run lunch talk series where we bring in people from industry that are doing uh, interesting work. And you can see it's, some of it is, is actual practice work, some of it's a little more policy related, or some of it's just more provocative, talking about CEQA, for example. CEQA is the California Environmental Quality Act, which is both positive and negative from a development point of view. Uh, and, and Jennifer Hernandez has written a, a lot about this. Uh, so we, we run these series. Every semester we had uh, Jonathan Siegel last semester from San Diego. Uh, as a distinguished uh, visiting fellow. So he talked about architect as developer. So any of you architecture students out there, think of development as a possible way uh, forward. Uh, and Jonathan Siegel is sort of a good example that we actually have Jonathan Tate, we only do Jonathans apparently, um, coming uh, in the spring from New Orleans. Um, so I, just to give you a kind of preview, I mean, the development and design studio that I'm currently doing, it's an interesting context right now in California, um, especially in the Bay Area. What we found for many years is that local municipalities that had BART stations, BART is the, the rapid transit system, didn't want to create enough density near them. So they created an assembly bill, AB 2923, to grant BART planning and land use authority over the properties they own. So basically, usurping local control, uh, highly controversial as you can imagine, but passed. And so we've taken up that challenge this term to look at two uh, very different context BART stations in Oakland, 19th Street, which is really in the, in the core of Oakland, and Coliseum, uh, which is on the edge. And um, we're, we're it, this is a live project, so we, I don't have the projects to show it to you, but it, it's really interesting because the 19th Street context is an area that's been highly gentrified, uh, you know, $5,000 a month rents in Oakland, which was never uh, conceived of even five years ago. And what does that mean from a, from a development point of view? How, what is our response to that? How do we uh, create the kinds of community benefits that we've been talking about today, but still make this pencil in a region where construction costs are astronomical? I won't even tell you what they are, because it's crazy, right? You know, s upwards of $800,000 a unit just to construct. So, really, really challenging from an affordability point of view. Coliseum Bar is located in a, in a much more lower income area around it, but it's obviously right beside the uh, Oakland A's stadium, which is actually relocating. So this became, thank you. Um, so, and then, so yeah, Coliseum Bar. Uh, I wanted just to touch a little bit, just very briefly on related um, 
research that we're doing. So Measure JJJ, this is a thing that was passed in Los Angeles. It was really meant to create uh, more affordable housing. This is a project that I'm uh, doing with partners in LA, LA Plus, uh, as well as community partners of the Building Industry uh, Association. And it really deals with this question that we're facing in Los An or in California generally, but Los Angeles as well. So California, of course, has been uh, growing pretty rapidly and pretty consistently, yet this is what's happened to our housing production. So we've gone from more or less up until the 80s, an average of about 200,000 units a year in the state. Uh, and in each kind of decade or decade and a half, it's kind of gone in half. So now we're only producing about 50,000. So basically we're producing one housing unit for every seven jobs that are being created. So what does that do? That obviously creates incredible pressures on existing communities, especially low income communities, uh, where rents are rising, massive demand. And, and so this whole thing, and, and in LA, part of that layering of that is that the land use policy was, was massively downzoned and has not been keeping pace with the, the uh, population growth. So that feeds into it. So Californian, yay, we're 49th in the, in the country in housing production. Uh, not necessarily a record to be proud of. Uh, and what this see, you can see here just in terms of you know, percentage that are, you know, really um, can't afford housing, it's, it's substantial, basically. So we were looking at JJJ. JJJ is a measure, basically, that gives, I'm not going to go through the details of this, but it's essentially a TOD um, incentive program where you get density, massive density bonuses for being proximate to major transit stations. And we looked at, you know, over a four-year period, what has happened before and after the implementation of that to try to understand uh, what's really happened. What, one of the interesting byproducts of this is that just the threat of having this measure, JJJ, what it did is it actually required developers to do um, prevailing wage labor and set aside affordable units if they were asking for anything that wasn't already on the books from a zoning point of view. So if they wanted to upzone, they had to do an inclusionary measure. So what happened is there was a huge flood of applications right before it was implemented. So good, good lesson for, for you know, generating housing is just threaten to do something and then people will, will do it. And, but the flip side was that we did actually see a lot of affordable housing uh, happen afterward, but the, the top left here is kind of an interesting paradox that we have within this, which is that while we gained a lot more affordable units set aside below market rate units, 44% gain, so it did what it was supposed to do, the net result was that we saw a, a loss of market rate units, and so, and, and therefore lower production overall. So this thing that was meant to produce affordable housing is actually having a bit of a negative drag on uh, housing production because it's costing more. It's costing developers more to be able to do that. Um, so we have to think about that, what the trade-off that we're making be here. So, you know, we say here, uh, basically, you know, uh, well, I'll get to the next one here. Yeah, so overall it's working well, uh, but what we're doing is we're trading off a small number of set aside units for an overall housing costs going up because we're not generating enough units. So this is just kind of just gives you a sense of the flavor of some of the research that we're trying to do within the program that's related to, to real estate development as well. So I'll pass it off to Anne and go from there. Hello all, I would be remiss, I'm gonna take us in a different direction and talk um, about equitable development at really the scale of na neighborhood in person in some ways and students, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the Masters of Sustainable Real Estate and Development program that Cassius Peeler runs um, at the Tulane University, through the Tulane University School of Architecture. So if you're taking notes on curriculum around um, a Masters of Sustainable Real Estate and Development, I encourage you to look at that program. So 
I'm going to talk a little bit about the work and the teaching of the Small Center uh, for Collaborative Design. And we're the Community Design uh, Center for the School of Architecture. And we really use an engaged design process um, and a collaborative design process as pedagogy to teach architecture students about the power of design to shape the cities that we live in. Um, and our story is we were, the thoughts about and the spark for a community design center at the, at the School of Architecture in New Orleans um, were in place before Katrina, but Hurricane Katrina fundamentally shaped our direction. And really the moment in time after the, I'll call it the storm, because that's what we still all call it in quotes, um, after the storm there was recognition of how should the School of Architecture be involved in the recovery of New Orleans and what role could architecture students and design students play. Um, and really the premise was how can we provide uh, design services to those who are often underserved by the design community. And also um, we work under and really our mission is um, based on the fact that we believe that everyone has the right to shape the cities in that they live and work. And so that fundamentally underpins all the work we do and how we teach. And our work uh, takes the form of, uh, falls under four major themes, uh, healthy cities, food access, affordable housing, and public spaces. And this work uh, really, I would say also, you could put all these different projects into different categories. And the work itself and the focus has shifted over time, right? So as the moment in time and immediately after Hurricane Katrina, we were in a specific moment in time of recovery. And now we've evolved into being in a city that is facing a different kind of pressure than we did right after the storm. And our work uh, in the past has taken four major, has looked at and taken four major projects, uh, or looked in four project forms, I should say. So we do design build projects, and I've been asked to focus on those, so I'll talk a lot about those. We also do graphic design advocacy projects that you see in the corner. We do visioning projects for nonprofit organizations. And then most importantly, I actually think our work in public programs and exhibits um, fundamentally shape how we um, inform the city. Uh, so when we're we're using, uh, when we're thinking about how design and how we can teach design um, to students, our public programs and exhibits allow us to build coalitions and capacity build across the city in a very different way than our design build visioning and graphic design advocacy programs that are primarily for architecture students. Um, and underlying all of this work is really a focus on the process and the design process that we really believe is a coalition and a capacity builder. So an engaged design process makes all the difference. And what we really do, what we do is we use this process, as I said before, as a pedagogy for our students. So students begin to realize the importance of having everyone at the table. So we were talking earlier about um, table setting and architecture students then realize that they are just one of the people that need to be at this one of the groups of people that need to be at the table and we also ground our work in um, a focus on on community development and on neighborhoods themselves and this is a result of Katrina as well so our work in these tangible outcomes um, much like Marie said having things that are real is really important in neighborhoods um, that have been underserved by the design community and really are filled with mistrust for very, very good reasons. And we recognized very early on that the role we could play was in these very small projects, incremental in nature, but they could make a difference and they were actually real. And that has also led to a very robust request for proposal process, um, simple and accessible to neighborhood organizations, but very robust in the context of how we reach out to community organizations, partner organizations that can be a part and a apply for that process. Um, and so all the projects, the majority of projects that our students work on come from neighborhood organizations and these partner organizations. They send proposals to us. We evaluate them with a panel of peers, uh, not just architects, not just designers, but neighborhood organizations, funders who have worked with us before. And that's where the projects that our students work on come from. And I can't articulate enough of how important I think that is and how it underlies everything we do. 
As part of the process as well, I should talk about the staff. We're just as intentional about the projects that we pick as the staff that works at the small center. So we're diverse in terms of race, gender, nativity in the context, are you from New Orleans or are you a long-term transplant? Are you a short-term transplant? When did you show up to the city? Um, it matters, right? And we also are diverse in terms of interdisciplinary backgrounds. We have architects, planners, I'm a public health, environment, public policy person. So we bring all those people to the table so that they can inform the pedagogy when we're teaching our students. Power dynamics are fundamental to all of our work. So just as we put neighborhood organizations and partner organizations at the center by letting them define what the priorities are, when we're teaching our students, we're also asking them to flip often their positions of power, right? So Tulane um, University is a private university and everything that comes with a private university and who has access to that private university. And so many of our students um, are from, they come from positions of privilege, right? So when we're asking our students to look at their expertise and what they, and then also learn from others, this is an example of a project we did. It was a design build focused on um, building an outdoor space for a bike shop in a, a, a neighborhood in the Upper Ninth Ward. At the start of that process, we asked students, our architecture students, to go and learn from a group of students who, and a group of students in in our neighborhood, the Central City neighborhood, that had were doing training and running a bike shop, right? So the students themselves were learning, the architecture students were learning from others. Um, and they were just bringing their lack of knowledge to the table, which I think is really important. So I wanted to highlight two uh, specific projects um, or specific kinds of work and talk about what that looks like for our students. So this healthy cities category, I want to get at that that doesn't just mean health, right? We know social, oh gosh, I gotta go fast. All right, we, we know social and environmental impacts. Um, they, they impact health, but health indicator, now I'm all torn and sunder, right? Ah! Um, so social environmental um, factors impact health outcomes. So when we talk about healthy cities, we're really getting at these questions of equity. So this is a bay Bayou Road. It is um, a uh, in the middle of the city. Um, we knew when we started to work in this space that it was going to be an area that was going to be dramatically impacted um, in the recovery process and also um, by pressures, uh, by, by market forces that were at play in New Orleans at the time. It's high ground. The city owned a lot of land there in part because of the structurally, I would argue, for the, the recovery federal laws and state policies that were structurally racist that informed how recovery happened in New Orleans. And so we knew this area was going to take a lot of, uh, a lot of pressure. Um, so we scaffold our projects. Facade Renew focused on helping neighbor, working with the New Orleans Redevelopment Authority and having students involved in that process um, and helping, uh, store for, helping um, local organizations um, and businesses work on their facades. We also do graphic design advocacy projects. This is an example of a student driven graphic design advocacy project that worked on highlighting businesses in the corridor so we could keep local businesses, a predominantly African-American neighborhood um, core, as this neighborhood begins to rapidly gentrify. So quickly, the Community Book Center is a design build project that I wanted to highlight on that corridor. Um, started by a woman who, was, an African-American woman who was a teacher and who realized that the system was not providing books and faces of the public for the students in our public school system, right? And what do our students do? So our students, what they have to do is they engage with literature, they engage with policy, they engage with environment and economics. So in getting at these questions of like, what underpins equity, right? And why do our cities look the way they do and what can design do about it? And so students use and learn, for example, in this project, they had to read um, literature that was being sold in the bookstore and how, that, how might that shape materials, design, build, and um, in the end, uh, so uh, I'll just, oops, sorry. Ah! And so asking students to, uh, asking students to take in all that information to shape um, a design build process that um, will then hopefully, then hopefully help this community book center, center sustain when they're under so much development pressure. I will skip this part. 
because I know Mark's looking at me with a dirty look, and just talk about our impact, right? And this is where we are right now. We've been in existence um, for 14 years, right? 2005 to uh, 2019. What have we done? These numbers are a little off. You know, they're always, they're actually low instead of high, but we've served 500 students. 35 faculty from across the campus have been involved in our projects. About over 110 projects, we don't keep track of all of them. But the numbers are only a piece of the puzzle, and what we're trying to figure out now is how do you really measure the impact of the capacity building and the coalition building that this engaged design process can do. So we know from anecdotal information and interviews with our partners that they've developed partnerships across vertical and horizontal structures, power structures in, in, and economic structures in the city that they didn't have before this engaged design process. But how do you measure that impact? And that's where we are now thinking about how could we use social network analysis, how could we use different kinds of quantitative data and qualitative data to actually measure the impact of this 14-year service over capacity and coalition building. And the last thing I'll say is we're doing the same thing with our alumni. We have 14 years of students who have worked on our projects. We have amazing quotations like this, um, that the ability to look at projects critically, to incessantly question the motives of the work and ask who the client is or who the client ought to be. The small center projects taught me to think at the scale of the city, even in these design of small interventions, and I think it's important to think about scale. So we have quotations like this, but we just actually implemented a survey of th the entire 3,061 alumni of the School of Architecture and asking specific questions for those who are engaged in design build projects at the small center and our other program, Urban Build, to see what, um, what impacts that's having on how they are engaging in practice. Are they headed in into development? Are they headed into art practice? Are they headed into socially, socially other kinds of social engagement and social entrepreneurship? Thank you very much. Did I go over? Like, oh. Is it okay? I put it oh. oh, sorry. Okay, so now I'm going to invite all of our panelists up um, for a dialogue and see if I can turn the- Sorry, I totally screwed up. So sorry, Mark. I guess this is a good segue. Oh. Does anybody have any questions for David and questions. Greg? Will we get uh, everything situated again? I'm so sorry. No problem. I'm dying to throw this box out there. So, <laughs> anyone? I got hit in the head yesterday, so I. <laughs> right. I, like I have a question for Greg about yeah. Berkeley's program. Could you talk a little bit about like, what are some of the challenges you faced when you started this program? Some of Challenges, yeah. Uh, how long do we have? Uh, <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's a lot of challenges. I think one of the challenges we had, to be honest, was just getting buy-in to it. Um, you know, it's, Berkeley is a very socially progressive place, and the idea that development is sort of like inviting the, the fox into the, you know, whatever the, mm. the now of the house, yeah. So it, it, we had to do a lot of work with uh, faculty to try to understand what we were trying to build was something that was, we were not trying to, it, this wasn't just, oh, we're just about making money. It's, it's about how can, you, how can development be a part of the solutions to some of the social issues that we're seeing about gentrification and displacement. All the things that planning faculty, frankly, are studying, part of the solution has to be development. And so we did a lot of work in that regard. Um, we had to just get the word out that this program exists. Um, and so the first year was, um, you know, we've, we got a pretty good applicant pool and that's why we started with, we intentionally started we 15, we ended up enrolling 16. Uh, this year we've done a lot of digital marketing and our applications so far, we do it in rounds, are up about 250%. So just getting the word out I think is part of it and trying to also for ourselves just understand what what specifically our mission is. You know, how do we actually build a program in development that puts equity at the center of it? And that's not, that's not something that's really been done before. So we're kind of building, the analogy that we keep using is that we're building the boat while, 
here while well, we've launched it from the dock. <laughs> so we're just trying not to sink it as we go. So it's, it's, a, it's certainly a challenge to just conceive of this kind of program. Great. OK, thank you, Greg. Um, so I'm going to start out with a question for the entire group. And then this will give Andy and Patrick a, a chance to participate as well. No, I don't think so. Nope. Oh, mm -hmm. Maybe okay. use them. Oh, thanks. OK. Um, so one of the benefits of working within a university setting is that it brings together experts and stakeholders from a variety of industries and disciplines. Uh, can each of you talk a little bit about how you've worked with other schools, centers, foundations, or companies on your respective projects? Sure. So uh, I guess I'll start because sure. I'm sitting next to you. But uh, a couple of ways. Um, one is, uh, and I mentioned that we are working uh, in multidisciplinary throughout the different colleges here at the University of Michigan, so the different uh, programs. That's been very helpful for us. But I also mentioned that in Columbus, uh, we have that unique development that we did, and we have got a, another one. We actually received a grant from OFA, the Ohio Housing Finance Agency, to look at the supportive services in, in our developments in Columbus and do some, uh, <clears throat> do some additional follow-up work, and that grant um, is to the LBLE students to enable to engage that. And they have reached out to the Ohio State University uh, Social Work School to, per, to uh, work with them in partnership um, to facilitate some of that grant. So it's been a great collaborative effort. Should we go in order? OK. Um, so with the Community Book Center, I'll just use that since that's the project that we saw, the Community Book Center project. Um, there was real recognition after the finishing of that project or even in the midst of building that project that we really needed to expand our work in affordable housing um, because we can do design builds like we did for that for that neighbor, um, for, that, for, for the Community Book Center, for a partner um, like that. But in reality, working on affordable housing policy became a priority for us. So being a part of the Greater New Orleans Housing Alliance, which is a group of nonprofit organizations, um, forward-thinking developers in the city as well, um, to really try to um, advocate. Um, I can, I can, I'm allowed to say that at the university level. We advocate and serve as an education um, source. Um, as to shift policy in the city of New Orleans. So that's one way that we've been able to collaborate both across the school with the law school um, and across camp universities as well, so Loyola University on that work as well, and then with other partners, nonprofit organizations, public and private. Great. India? And then I'll Oh, okay. Um, can everyone hear me? Yeah, I don't yep. know. This is good? Good. Yeah. Okay, great. So, Question, you want me to talk about collaborating with other programs? Yeah, or just, you kind just of... go into your program and yeah. how you kind of work across the board. And... Yeah. Um, yeah, so I am India Solomon, second year Master of Urban Planning student. I'm also doing the Certificate in Real Estate Development. So through that, um, I've done a few classes with the Ross School of Business, Business, but most of my work has been here in the Urban Planning Program. Um, the two projects that I wanted to, to highlight on this panel, actually Maurice Cox highlighted as well, um, the first uh, is a, a class project that started in Mark Norman's class. So within the urban planning program, we don't have a sort of a living business initiative per se, um, but I think our program has done a really good job of connecting just your traditional classroom work to real world clients because we do have such a strong um, relationship with the city of Detroit. Um, so through um, Mark's class on public-private partnerships, I was able to work on um, a form-based coding project for the city of Detroit, looking at affordability outcomes for both developers and um, occupants of these projects that are going to be subject to the code. And then there wasn't a formal way of sort of continuing that work, but it was clear that there was still some additional work to be done. Um, so I took it upon myself to kind of ask Mark. I was like, hey, is the city still interested in doing this work? What kind of resources are there? Um, Mark was able to secure some research funds, and I did continue that work over the summer. And then through that work was then connected with the Fitzgerald Revitalization Project. Um, one of our professors in the, the architecture and planning school School. Kim Dowdell is one of the partners for the development company that Maurice Cox um, showed up on the screen for that Fitzgerald project. And so through connecting with her, I was able to go on and do a fellowship for that project. And that was supported through fellowship funds through the school as well. So it's sort of this piecemeal process of, of building, building out that experience. Um, but it's been really great to hear the more uh, formal programs that exist for that as well. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we're doing this in the studio that I'm currently doing. So the sites, the Uptown sites are City of Oakland owned, and the oh, Coliseum site is owned by BART. And so we've partnered with each of those two organizations and, and surrounding organizations, CDCs in the, in the surrounding areas, to try to understand what, what are the possibilities here. And, and in case, for example, in the case of the Coliseum, it's in an area that's been challenged uh, historically, and it's not an area that you would normally think of as being kind of ripe for a m major redevelopment project. So it's part of it is about visioning and understanding and what are some of the needs and some of the ways in which some of the assets that community as well have. But one of the things that we've, by the way, this is live, so you know, it's evolving. But one of the early things that we've talked about is actually it's a food desert. And so how do you think about food-based, we actually uh, coined this phrase, food-oriented development. So we're looking at food-oriented development and, and that really aligns with some of the um, local uh, organizations in the area. So I think for us, the studio, which is kind of a unique thing within a development program, is a, is a vehicle by which we can create and seed some of both, test some of these ideas, but also create the partnerships that, that are gonna have lasting effect. Um, hi, my name is Patrick DiGregorio. I'm, <clears throat> as David mentioned, I'm three years through my medical degree, and I'm now at the, at the end of my MBA at Michigan. And I got, it seems like a little bit of an awkward fit, but I got into housing because I started, thank you, Jordan. Um, because after I graduated from college, I started, I had a full-time job, but then I also co-founded a homeless shelter in Philadelphia. And I ran those for three years. And, and one, of, uh, one of our shelters was a shelter for kids. And, uh, you know, oftentimes uh, kids, when they don't have a place to stay, they actually trade sex for a bed. And so if you go to a club in Philadelphia, you might often find a 15-year-old who will be trying to go home with someone. And one of those girls ended up in our shelter, and she got pregnant. It was actually through, uh, you know, I thought we had actually developed a fairly robust shelter. Uh, we had uh, a partnership with Temple Medical School. We had a caseworker, things like that. But this girl, this young woman, she, um, she wanted to keep the child but ended up miscarrying. And at the time, you know, if I were to be her doctor, I would write her up as a young woman who miscarried secondary to like a, an eclamptic seizure. But ultimately, she miscarried through a disease because, uh, an economic disease. She is a young black woman who, uh, who is homeless and who is living in a city that has cut back 80% of its public health clinics. Uh, over the past decade and used my small nonprofit as, as, um, as the safety net. And so that experience really led me to go to medical school and where I ran our, our non-profitable student health clinic, and I call it that because you could make no money off of the care that we provided. And then that ultimately led me uh, to business school because I really do firmly believe that the care that I want to provide someone like Takara is really an economic problem. And so I, it was actually quite lucky. Enjoy, Jordan. There we go. Um, it's really quite lucky that I happened, um, happened into this program because as you can see on the left, uh, the left is a schedule starting in March of 2018 and ending in April of this year. And I participated in four different uh, Michigan programs associated with real estate. One, uh, it was a two, the first one is MAP, which is a, a two month consulting project in which David and the NRP group um, solicited a, a proposal to go look at those social services. So the work that, um, and, and through that we, um, we put together a pilot project, which then ends up being through this LBLE program in which we have this grant. We're going to properties, collecting various information on residents, and eventually, um, through um, several other classmates, really good work, building a center in which we hope to house this data. But I really want to focus on a couple of other things that I've done with the NRP group and through Michigan. One was really the sort of phenomenal opportunity that I, I went to San Antonio and I got to build or originate a 9% LIHTC uh, project in San Antonio. And through that project, I actually, um, I remember this is, in the background is, is the proposal that I put together. And pitching to this nonprofit, what I had done was I made the argument that they should consider, it was a case management nonprofit, and I put together the argument that they should consider getting into housing because all this money from the healthcare system is looking at housing. Kaiser Permanente uh, in May of this past year had uh, said they're going to put $200 million from their treasury, and so this is a strategic investment into affordable housing. And so I said, look, this is a big pot of money that you can go after, um, and it, it, it's an opportunity for you. And I remember arguing that 
this is a partnership between NRP and, and this organization that marries mission economics and community welfare. And while I certainly believe in the first two, I actually couldn't make the argument on the last one. I didn't know. I, the evidence wasn't out there. And I found myself wondering, what does Kaiser Permanente know? And through the university, uh, through the university and through David's uh, sponsorship, I actually I put together a proposal where I went out west to go talk to the organizations that are actually doing this sort of like, it's called permanent supportive housing, where you, where you use housing as a healthcare intervention for people who are homeless, and then you build healthcare services around that, and then ideally you transition those folks into, into a job, and so it becomes like a really permanent and durable way to change someone's trajectory. And so uh, I had all these meetings, and I met with uh, nonprofit developers and healthcare systems, um, and ultimately it ended up in, in a paper written, and, uh, and I'm sort of pulling this forward to go do this research project that looks at one of these um, that puts together the University of Michigan, University of Washington, and a nonprofit developer in uh, Seattle that effectively it's a study that looks at the, the cost of housing someone in this sort of permanent supportive housing versus um, someone who doesn't get that and as a healthcare intervention. So that's really um, how the, the healthcare and housing like, fits together. Great. Thanks, Patrick. Mm -hmm. um, I know we're running low on time, so I wanted to see do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. We have a box coming for you right there. <laughs> it's squishy. Thank you. In evaluating educational criteria, um, what uh, is your view on the role and the applicability of teaching history as opposed to teaching current problems and solutions as a foundation for building a better future? Can I, I'm going to start. Um, oh wait, I don't need this, right? Oh, Am I still mic'd up? I'm sorry, I forgot. Yeah. Um, I really do do this every now and then. Um, anyway, uh, so for us, it's fundamental. Uh, you know, the we are working with partners um, in New Orleans that are bringing current challenges to us or current projects to us. But the structural, for us, at least in New Orleans, the structural racism that exists um, and the history of redlining um, and, in, yeah, inst and ongoing institutional racism, um, our students have to understand that. And then also even environment and ecological history um, is important uh, for our students to understand. So uh, how the city was developed, infrastructure, um, all of those questions about water management that are kind of core to us, but our, our so for us it's fundamental and it's woven throughout, right? And it's not just history from books, but it's from all the conversations with partners and understanding the neighborhood. So, um, you know, I think to us we weave it in. Um, I think we're thinking about how can we do that better. There's conversations about instead of just teaching a studio, can we do a seminar, like a pro seminar first, and then a studio project, and how can we tie those together? Um, but to us, it's fundamental. Yeah, I mean, for us, just to build on that, I mean, we run this boot camp in advance of the program in the summer, and one of the courses I, other courses I teach is planning history theory. And so I don't believe that as a developer, you can understand and intervene without understanding the legacy of urban development and injustice that has taken place over time. And because you hear, you know, these developers come in and say, well, you know, I'm just, this is, I'm do doing this great project and I'm improving the neighborhood and just completely ignorant of the history of that. So to us, we do it right up front and we're, you know, it's, it's something that's really foundational to understand the development as part of the equity solution. Yeah. Anybody else? One more question? Uh, okay, so I will ask the last question. Um, so, can you guys kind of briefly summarize where you see the future of your programs going, or your work as students? I'm going to go the other way. Yeah, start with Patrick. Um, I, I think that, I know that the university, I know that the business school is looking for, uh, continuing to look to grow and expand the program. I know that in the next coming year, I think we have six uh, projects right now in LBLE and they're looking to expand to 10 to 12. Um, and so I think that there are, as David had shown on his slides, you know, a, the applications for our project, our little project has gone up by double just in the past year. So I think there is a huge appetite. And even like when, you, uh, when you're in the business school and you're just listening to students and the, and the, the things that they're interested in doing, there is, uh, 
a big appetite for that, that action-based learning. And so I only see it growing. I would say what our goal is, it sort of goes back to what Maurice had talked about, that who is doing development matters. And one of the things that we're really focused on is ensuring that we have a broader cross-section of diversity in the cohort itself. And I think we've, last year we were launching the program and you know we didn't necessarily we did very well on gender we didn't do so well on underrepresented minority and this year we've done a lot more outreach to organizations and that has resulted in applications and we've even we've already admitted a number of uh minority candidates so it's it's that's where i think is going to be really great for us because that is part of the central mission of the program and if we don't do that then we're not doing what we set out to do yeah, so my apologies. I was a little confused about how the, the role of the slides, um, our slides in this, but um, I'll just say from the perspective of the planning program, I think the most um, constructive thing that I did was look at a pro forma. Um, so as planners, as community developers, as folks who are looking at the design of communities, and Maurice and a lot of folks alluded to this earlier, um, but, but really getting that knowledge of, of how things are playing out on the ground, how your designs are translating um, into the real built environment, and how, you know, what different priorities a neighborhood might, might have that might influence that design and that might influence that affordability. Um, and so I think being able to, to bring my skills in the classroom into the planning department and realize that you know as students we do have a different perspective to bring being interdisciplinary isn't just about you know being in different disciplines but I think being in different positions in this space and being in different positions in in life in general I think as students it's kind of it's a little nerve-wracking to go into these fields and you know you think that these are practitioners I know everything um, but I really through these projects did see the value of bringing a different type of thinking to this work so I'll just end with that I would say that uh, we're expanding to try to give architects, uh, um, architecture students um, at Tulane um, more in, um, involvement in urban design projects. So we're moving into urban scale work. Um, we've been very project based, based from a partner standpoint, nonprofit uh, organizations, and we're looking at doing more regional and urban planning work than we've done in the past. Uh, we're also expanding into work with more uh, more schools and developing new opportunities for students to take classes. There's an intersection of design and health course that students are taking now. And then, um, last but not least, also um, feeding on the conversation about how to increase underrepresented minorities in the field of architecture. Um, our most recent hire who comes on board and in, um, in March at the small center um, has a background in architecture, but has a background in education and doing a lot of edu architectural education with young people. And I think that's going to make a difference because we'd really like to create a pipeline, right? They may not, it doesn't matter if they go to, t if under, you know, the people in, uh, kids in New Orleans go to Tulane, that doesn't matter to us. Just feeding students into architecture and design fields is really important. Getting the opportunity for us to work with uh, students like Patrick and his cohorts has just been a game changer for us. The way that they've learned and the way that they've challenged our team is really incredible. And to be able to give the students the experience and for the students, for us to get a look at students to be able to hire them has been a win-win for both uh, sides. We see this, going, this partnership going long into the future. And one of the commitments that we made was as we learned about this, to not have it proprietary to the NRP group, but to make this available to to all developers of affordable housing so that we can learn together and that we can grow the industry together, so. Absolutely, well thank you everyone very much. Great, good job. All right, thank you so much to that previous panel. That was really great and an interesting look at what's happening in some of the other universities around the country. Um, I'm really glad to be here and pleased to introduce our next panel. A few people who you've seen before who are going to come back and talk a little bit more about what they're doing specifically in their communities. First up, we'll have Oscar Perry Bello. He's the editor of nextcity.org, and he's covering urban policy and access to capital for equitable development, which is his primary focus. 
And I've asked each of them, each of our panelists, to tell us their favorite city, and they're going to explain why. <laughs> Not Detroit for the people who are here in Detroit. So don't hold this against them when I tell you what the city is. Oscar's favorite is Fargo. So more on that from Oscar. Sam Butler will be our next panelist. He's the executive director of Doing Development Differently in Detroit, a nonprofit pursuing social and economic equity through development. He's a UM grad. His favorite city is New Orleans, so you'll hear about that from him. And Kimberly Driggins is the director of strategic planning for arts and culture for the city of Detroit's planning and development department. And I'm really uh, looking forward to hearing what they have to say and continuing the conversation with you all afterwards. So, Oscar. Thanks. Oh, I have a mic. Oh, hi, everyone. Uh, okay, so to answer the question, why did I pick Fargo, North Dakota, as my favorite city today? I've never been to Fargo. I would love to go to Fargo. And the reason why I would love to go to Fargo is North Dakota is the only state in the nation that has a public bank. It's a state-owned bank. It's had it since 1919. It's celebrating its 100th anniversary in July of this year. This is a state-owned bank that supports all the other banks in North Dakota, which is why, if you look at the statistics, North Dakota has more banks and more credit unions per capita than any other state in the country. So I want to go to Fargo because I want to learn more about this public bank that they have in North Dakota. And we write about public banks in the next city. There's some campaigns in other cities and states. The Bay Area has one, has two, actually. Um, Michigan actually is one of the states where there's a proposal to study whether Michigan should have a state-owned bank. New Jersey is also one of those, right? So it's, it's, it's spreading across the country. And so I will pick Fargo, North Dakota. I've never been there. I would love to go there. So that's my favorite city for today. So uh, I guess I do this, yes. Uh, again, I'm Oscar about Periabello. I'm the editor of Next City. Uh, I've been writing for Next City since 2015 and I became editor last February. And just a little bit about our background in history and what we do, uh, we were founded in 2003 by three pioneering Yale grads, uh, Adam Gordon, Seth Brown, and Annika Singh. They were, um, they were sort of planning students, now they're lawyers. Seth is a real estate developer in New York. Adam is a fair housing lawyer in New Jersey. Uh, Annika is in Boston. And uh, it was an all volunteer effort to start out. So, you know, it was, they're getting together with their friends, other people they knew in the urban planning, policy, and development space. And, you know, they kind of said, you know, this is what they said to the New York Times. They were, this is what they were going to do, is really look at the next generation uh, and, and see how cities were going to lead the way. That was their vision in 2003. Uh, City Lab founded in 2011, so by the way. Uh, and they grew from an all-volunteer effort to, a not, to be a nonprofit organization today. So we have about six full-time staff in Philadelphia and about 10 to 12 writers we work with in our freelance pool that are all across the country. These are some of our funders and partners who I should make sure I thank today. Uh, Serdna was our first funder of Serdna Foundation. And uh, we've, you know, we'll do everything from, some of these are advertisers. You know, we, we're some, it's a media organization, so we do sell ads. Some of these are underwriters. So... You know, someone like NRPA says, we just want you to, to pay journalists to write about parks. We don't necessarily care which parks or where or why. We just want you to write about parks. Would you do that for us? And then we said, yes, that's an underwriting agreement. We sort of choose, and we, there's editorial independence what, that goes along with that. That's, that's a partnership we like to have. Um, so those are a few of our partners. So thank you to, the, thank you to them. Here's our, here's our audience. I always get questions about who, who reads Next City. Uh, we get about, about 1.8 million readers annually. It's pretty evenly split across the sectors, which is something we pride ourselves on. We try to make sure that uh, we're catering and, re and, and asking questions that, that are relevant to everyone. And here's the top cities for readership. We're based in Philadelphia. That's not our top city necessarily. Um, but you can see Boston, New York, Philly, DC, Baltimore, Baltimore, Toronto, Chicago, Atlanta, Houston. Southern California, Bay Area, Seattle, you know, nothing, no, nothing too surprising, but we, we do like to pride ourselves on covering the middle of the country. So some of our, you know, these may be our top cities for our readership, but some of our most popular stories are things about um, a, a, a suburb of Cleveland or St. Paul, or, you know, there's a, there's a pedestrian plane in Saint, going through in St. Paul, right? So um, the smaller cities will actually get a lot of traction on our website, and so we, we do pride ourselves on that coverage. 
And uh, I do track, so since, since I started writing for Next City, I started tracking uh, just in terms of impact. I thought it would be relevant to show you guys. This is you know, the stories that I write. I track the race and gender ethnicity of, uh, of everyone that I interview. Uh, since I became editor last year, I started tracking the race and gender of the, the, the reporters I, to whom I assign stories. So you know, these, this, this is all in presentation, and I think it's going to be sent to you, so I'm not going to read it one by one. But I just want you to know that you know, I started tracking this because I wanted to know when I became a writer for Next City. I wanted to know if I'm going to write about equi equitable economic development, whose voices am I lifting up? Whose voices am I bringing forward? Am I, am I really, is my coverage really representative of the cities that, and communities that I want to write about and focus on? So this is what I started doing. And over time, it's, it's kind of evolved. If I can just, if you don't dodge me for a minute, it's kind of evolved into also a statement about these communities and these populations and the fact that they're not waiting around, waiting to be saved by some more powerful privileged group. Um, they're, they're working. They're at work. Like, I don't, I don't get to interview them unless they've done something. So, you know, they take that for what, it, for what it's worth. Uh, uh, this is uh, what I tend to like to write about. Um, I've written stories about different communities and different structures gaining access to all of these pots of capital. We can talk about that later if you want. And really what I want to present to you today is what interests us as journalists at Next City? You know, what are the questions that we ask? Why do we ask the questions that we ask? You know, the, the, type, the topics for the conference, innovation, equitable economic development, they've been talked about a lot today. You know, I'm just going to add innovation, not necessarily new. Some of the things that I'm going to show you, they've been around for decades but they haven't been used in, certain, in, in these ways. And so that's, that's sort of what I want to bring to the table. And uh, equitable economic development can mean a lot of things. We heard a lot of different definitions. Um, I didn't really get to have a definition on my own as a, as a reporter, as a journalist. I get to write about people who are trying to do that and how do they define it and how do they measure it and how do they get better at it over time. So this. This, I wanted to start with this because this is the context, the background, the foundation for all of the questions that we ask as journalists at Next City. I'm a little surprised at a conference called Equitable Economic Development about equitable economic development. I'm a little surprised I'm the first person to bring up this map, but here it is. Um, if you don't know, I think most of you, a lot of you may know what it is, but just a brief history. This is the map that represents where in, during the Great Depression, federal home mortgage, home mortgage uh, insurance was denied to areas that were red and yellow. And they, it was allowed in areas where, that are green and blue. And the red represented hazardous. Yellow represented definitely declining. Uh, the, the, the bluish kind of color represented still acceptable. And the green represented best. And you know, I'm, I was really grateful that um, Maurice Cox, in your presentation, you brought up the Great Migration as part of your story of Detroit and what's happening. I mean, this, for those who are, you know, this is Detroit, obviously. I, I hope that was obvious to everyone. Um, yeah, so I was, great, I was grateful that you brought up the Great Migration because I, I just, like, I, like my friend over here asked in, at the end of the, other, of the previous panel, history is important. We got to know. As journalists, our understanding is we are producing the first draft of history, so to speak. So I got to know what's the pre what is the previous history. And our, all our questions should be grounded in that historical context. And so this is where we start, because when folks came, from the, came up from the Great Migration, when African Americans came up, they were made to live in the areas that were mostly red and yellow. Real, through real estate practices, through zoning practices, through plain old discrimination. And, and then they were denied access to loans to own and, and, and repair and maintain those homes. Right, because this is this is this is where where uh, real estate agents had decided it was too risky to insure those mortgages to have the federal government insure those mortgages, and that this was created in 1939, and then it just became codified and infused into the banking system. And you can you can imagine it today. What's happened? The homes in those red and yellow areas. What happened to them? They slowly degraded over time because their owners, their residents, were denied access to capital. They ha then they were, all, they were almost all black, right? Yeah, and, and the thing is, you can go online now and find the documents they, that the, the real estate agents used to make this map, and you can read, you know, full of Negroes, full of uh, immigrants. You know, there, there, it, was very, it was very explicitly race-based. 
And so what do you get? You know, now you get what you, have, what you see in Detroit. And it's not fa as fancy as Colorado's maps, but I, 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 I spent like 30 minutes making sure that these lined up like this, right? 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 What does it look like? And you can see the story of Detroit right here, right? Because what, what, what else happened in Detroit? This map is 1939. So what else happened in Detroit? There was a black middle class, right? Where did they start to buy homes? They wanted the nice homes. They started buying in that little green splotch right there, right? On the, on the, on the kind of, it's kind of in the middle there. It's a big green splotch. It stands out. I don't, is there a laser pointer here? Is this it? Yeah? Oh, that's not it. Oh, OK. Uh, yeah, right there, right? Right, right. What is that? You know, the, so, so these were originally white families' homes, right? Black middle class starts to, starts to pick up their, their economic empowerment. They start to be able to buy homes. They start to buy these homes. And, 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 where, and where do folks go? They go somewhere else, right? This is now, what is this? This is Grand Monrosedale. This is Grand River. You know, what, these neighborhoods, I don't know all the names. I'm sorry. But that's basically part of what, what we're looking at here is the story of the black middle class moving here. I went up there, this, I went up there on, on Tuesday. It's nice, right? Um, and now it's, it's all, this is where the remaining black middle class is in Detroit. A little bit over here too, right? You know, and look at this distinction right here. This is, this is one that kind of stood out to me a lot, right? right? OK, so enough playing with the maps. Um, so the questions that we try to ask as journalists, we try to ground them in the reality that you know, this, this, these communities, most of the black communities in Detroit, immigrant communities, low-income communities, rural communities as well, they were denied benefits. They were denied access to capital to, to, to own and maintain their homes. They were denied input into, where, to, into those maps. You know, these, the, those, no one asked where, those neighborhoods, where should those maps be? How should, how should we draw these lines? Uh, they were denied ownership. Again, they, they, weren't, they, weren't, they weren't given access to the homes. And then uh, they were denied power because this has happened in 1939. This is before the Voting Rights Act, before the Civil Rights Act. This is, they weren't even allowed to vote the people out who did this to them. So they were denied power. And so these are the questions we ask as journalists. You know, it starts with who benefits. You know, so, so, the story, so now everything, I, I, I kind of I'm going to comb through the stories really quickly because I'm, I'm running out of time here. But, um, you know, so... The question of who benefits, or more precisely, what share of the benefits in this project accrue to people who have historically been denied, denied, been denied such benefits? And uh, Pullman is a neighborhood on the very far, far south side of Chicago, talking about 111th Street, 119th Street, that, part, that, that far out from downtown. And it's still 82% uh, it's, it's and it's 82 black on one part of the community, 96% black on the other part of the community. Uh, the median income for each neighborhood is around $37,000. This community in this park, Pullman Park, um, it's a former, the former Pullman Palace rail car yard. Uh, Chicago Neighborhood Initiatives has brought in over $300 million of investment into this thing. The, the community, wanted, um, the community wanted, wanted, it was a food desert, they brought in a Walmart. It was, an, it was a retail desert, they brought in a Ross. They wanted jobs, they brought in a Method soap factory, they brought in a Whole, whole Foods distribution plant. Uh, they're building. They're building. They're bringing in more industrial jobs. Uh, this recreation center. They just opened this. It was 19 million dollars. You know, and it's 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 the standard kind of like new market tax deal. You know, they got grants from the city. They plowed it through the QEI, and they and they, they were able to repay most of the loans using the new market tax credits. You know, it's nothing too crazy if you know new, how new market tax credits work. But the fact is, you know, it's just a demonstration of here's here here are benefits accruing to historically. Uh, marginalized community, right? And we've done. There's there's some crazy things happening. Like, like um, in this in this one, it was uh, just generally speaking, CDFIs. They've been getting capital from CRA motivated banks or foundations. They get some federal dollars. They get some state, and sometimes sometimes they get some city dollars. Well, in the past two years, three CDFIs have been accessing the same capital markets that every corporation on the planet gets access to. They issue a bond, the bond sells out in like an hour, and they got $100 million, and they can do whatever they want with it. It doesn't have to go to specific geographies. It doesn't have to go to specific programs. It's $100 million to do what they feel is most needed, most impactful. You know, that's amazing. That, you know, again, these, these, are, these are ways to finance projects that, whose benefits accrue to historically marginalized communities. 
Uh, oh, another one. This is a crazy one. In, in, a, in, a, in California, from 1997 to about 2017, there was this program called the California Organized Insurance Network, where the state insurance regulator tracked how much dollars insurance companies invested back into California. And then they also, they also marked the projects and said if it's, if it's a solar project or an affordable housing project, let's give them credit for it and say, say this is what insurance companies have done. Not like philanthropic investments, standard insurance company investments. I mean, a lot of people don't realize insurance companies in the US have $6 trillion in assets. You pay premiums there every, every month. Uh, Michigan, Michigan pays two, paid $2.3 billion in premiums to insurance companies last year. Michigan. Now, California, much bigger state, right? They paid, Californians paid $250 billion in premiums a year to insurance companies. Anyway, the state program tracked it, and they also, they also acted like a little investment bank and started marketing deals to insurance companies. So eventually they, they could say that there was $21 billion in insurance company dollars uh, invested into impactful projects in California. Again, great, right? So insurance dollars, look it up. No other state has ever done this. Uh, foundations, community foundations, another, another source of dollars. Um, $77 billion in community foundation assets. $81 billion in donor advised funds, some of which falls under community foundations. There's amazing ways that communities are getting access to that and then they're, they're financing projects that, have, that accrue to them. But that's only one question. The next question, who has input? At what point in the process did historically marginalized people start to participate? Uh, in Pullman, I went back to Pullman. In Pullman, there, was, uh, there, was, there, there were 77 meetings that the aldermen held and got the input and you know, the people wanted, they wanted, to, they wanted retail, they wanted jobs, uh, they also wanted housing. You know, so that, that was great. Uh, who has input? Um, there are 250 bank mergers a year. And every time there's a bank merger, the community has an opportunity to have its say in what those banks are doing that are merging. Because there's deposits, and those deposits are federally insured, and the Community Reinvestment Act of 1977 gives communities the right to say, you are touching our deposits, you are merging our deposits with somebody else, you better be meeting our credit needs before you move those deposits somewhere else. There's $133 billion in deposits in the Detroit metropolitan area right now. $133 billion. Is that financing every credit need that Detroit has? I, I highly doubt it. Um, who has input? Okay, we're running out of time, so I'm gonna sw swing through some of these. Who has ownership? At the end of the day, is this concentrating ownership and therefore wealth at the top at the center, or is it dispersing it toward the bottom of the edges, right? Like this, going back to the history, it was mortgages were, were allowed to, uh, mortgages were allowed for white families. They were denied to black families. Most wealth in this country is real estate based. And so what now we have, what do you have today in the US? Median household wealth for white families is $171,000. Median household wealth for black families is $17,000. And it's crazy. In some places like Boston, median household wealth for white families is $247,000. Median household wealth for black families in Boston is $8, eight. A lot of people thought it was a typo when the Boston Globe reported that. Anyway, this is an example here. This little property in Portland, when Mercy Corps developed this property, they realized there was a little, there was a little clause in, in the Securities Act of 1933. The clause allowed them to sell ownership shares in this commercial property to people who live in the state of Oregon, and they chose to restrict it to the four zip codes around this property. So there's, now there's people who are, who are in, the, in the neighborhood who are buying shares and owning this property in their neighborhood. Community Land Trust, another example of that. Um, this is a crazy one. So baby boomers are gonna be retiring in huge numbers over the next few years. There's gonna be, there's ten, baby boomers own $10 trillion worth of businesses. $10 trillion in wealth, who's gonna get that? Is it gonna get sold to some hedge fund or is it gonna get sold to their employees? This is a fund in Cleveland that is just going to buy up businesses, let the owners retire, and then eventually put those businesses on the path, get them the technical assistance to become employee owned. Um, so, you know, who has, and then who has control? I promise this is the last one. This is a capital fund in Boston. It's called Boston Ujima Project. 
they're collecting money from the community, investment dollars, savings, they're pooling it with foundation capital and impact investors, they're putting it into a pot, and then they're running that pot through a participatory budgeting process to decide how to, how to invest it. That's happening in Boston. So who has control? Do how much power do historically marginalized people have in the process? That participatory budgeting process, the voting power is, is, is exclusively those from low-income, working-class communities of color in Boston. You know, they're gonna be voting on how to use those investment dollars. And uh, this is all questions. I'm just gonna skip right past that because I gotta say thank you for Mark Norman for inviting me. I'm, I'm just grateful to speak at the University of Michigan. I'm grateful to the University of Michigan's bravery and valor in the face of a men's college basketball rampage that the likes of which we will never see again. So thank you everyone. How is everyone today? Yeah? Is that post-lunch coma setting in nicely? Okay, all right, we'll, we'll see if we can wake you up some. Um, so my name is Sam Butler, and I am the executive director of a Detroit-based nonprofit called Doing Development Differently in Detroit. You can call us D4, it's a lot shorter. Um, and the, ti the cutesy title for my talk today is Goldilocks and the Three Thoughts. Uh, there's some porridge in the corner in case you want to know what porridge looks like. Um, so I will fly through the obligatory slides about who am I and why are you forced to listen to me. Um, if you have questions about D4, please come see me afterwards, especially if you're interested in making a donation. Um, so we were a coalition formed in 2010 between organized labor, faith-based institutions, environmental justice advocates, and community activists, all coming together to try and figure out how can we influence the development process to further social equity and an equitable development, right? From, in our very DNA, there is an acknowledgement that the development process uh, brings together fractured and diverse interests. So in our very mission is the word, are the words win-win. We are, like our mission is to try to identify win-win economic development scenarios. And we do that with three types of programs. We offer technical assistance, civic leadership and training, and policy research. So we provide technical assistance to neighborhood groups that are seeing large-scale development. Uh, up on the upper left, we have some uh, residents who live around the state fairgrounds neighborhood. We are able to pay local uh, residents to go door to door for the past two years and conduct a community needs assessment. We've surveyed over 600 residents um, on both sides of Woodward around state fairgrounds. And we're actually taking our findings and working with the local council member to develop some de potential development standards for the state fairgrounds, modeled after something that they did in Milwaukee. But I'll get to that later. Uh, on the lower right are, is a picture of Mildred and Tommy Robbins. So Mildred and Tommy co-founded a neighborhood community group around Henry Ford Hospital. They um, that community group has one of the first and few privately negotiated community benefits agreements um, in the city of Detroit. And fingers crossed, we're about to have two more in the next month or so. Among the many things that their community group does, and this is all volunteers, is they run training programs and a jobs pipeline to get residents into healthcare positions. So we are helping them figure out a place-based workforce development uh, program. How do we get more residents around the hospital employed? Because it's a neighborhood that is lower income and more unemployed than the rest of the city, despite having a concentration of jobs in their backyard. We do a lot around civic leadership. So uh, here's a picture of a dialogue session that we were hosting between organized labor and community activists, two constituencies that historically don't get along in Detroit um, for various reasons, um, but two constituencies that are necessary if we are going to make some positive social progressive change in the city. Uh, these dialogues actually led to the group wanting to create a coalition and identify some um, shared action items. And I think it's fascinating that the shared action items that they chose all were around equitable development. Uh, we do um, a 
by, <laughs> we've done our second annual uh, equitable development series. So it's a series of lectures, panels, discussions, all around this very amorphous topic of equitable development. Um, there's a picture of some of our panelists, and uh, I love this fit. Look how much fun they're having. See, like, come, come to a D4 workshop. It's a good time. Um, and then we do a lot around policy research. So we, uh, starting in 2015, we drafted a number of white papers, uh, worked with city council to come up with some ideas around an inclusionary housing ordinance that later became the ordinance that was passed in 2017. That was fantastic. Um, but today, I want to talk about our policy research around community benefits and some of the findings around that. So obviously, we are a group that thinks critically about community benefits. And I think when you do a scan of these types of agreements uh, across the country, for me, they really fall into two categories. The first is you have a lot of uh, provisions that seek to mitigate externalities involved with the development, right? Compensation for displacement, if there's any. Uh, how do we mitigate the construction? Um, if there's pollution or traffic, how do we mitigate those effects? In my humble opinion, those aren't really benefits at all, right? Those are things that the city and, and uh, the developer, they should be doing that on their own. Um, what I want to talk with you today are the community benefit provisions that seek to achieve some sort of larger social aim. And when I talk about social equity, if you'll, if you'll allow me, I'm going to use that as shorthand for social justice, economic justice, environmental justice, affordable housing, local hiring, job training, historic preservation, all of the cool, et cetera, right? All of the cool progressive stuff that we want to achieve, I'm going to try and cram into the term social equity. So can I do that today? Is that okay? All right. So I think it's important to remember that in Detroit, a community benefits movement is actually fairly recent. Um, so when I graduated from this fine institution uh, and started working in Detroit, uh, I was involved in a number of participatory planning uh, initiatives uh, centered on neighborhood stabilization, right? And during the recession, it was all focused on vacancy, blight, what do we do around the vacancy and blight? And what that did was create a coalition between community activists and the developers and pro-growth pro coalitions, right? Build anything. Anything was better than that vacant uh, lot or vacant house next to me. Post-bankruptcy, as Detroit's economy has gotten better, I think we're now seeing a divergence between that coalition that used to exist, right? You now have community groups saying like, I am not so sure building anything or building something, period, is its own community benefit. So let's talk about the dynamics that happen between negotiating development, right? I think there is somewhat of a fundamental tension between social equity and developer profit, right? Uh, there's an assumption that as one goes up, the other must come down. Um, and the fulcrum, I imagine this is a seesaw, and the fulcrum at the seesaw is perhaps the market. The problem is that market changes. By the way, you're welcome for the fancy uh, PowerPoint animation. So, you know, developers, for the most part, want to maximize the profit as much as city officials will allow. And I think for city officials, and policy advocates like ourselves, we have to identify how much pressure can we put on that social equity, social equity scale, right? Like, uh, how much social equity can we build into a project before a developer says, screw it, I'm just gonna move to another city, right? So I think the city officials constantly have to go through this Goldilocks exercise. Um, in the first panel, you know, Professor Levine asked that important question of how do we know when planners are going too far? And I think that um, based on what I heard this morning, there was a discussion of like, you know what? Maybe we're not going far enough. I promise Professor Levine was not a plant in the audience, ladies and gentlemen. No plants, I promise. Um, so in thinking about a local government's role in social equity, uh, in preparation for this conference, I looked at a bunch of books on my bookshelf. Um, there's a lot of thinkers around 
these, t you know, the conjuncture of local government and social equity. But I think when you read a lot of these thinkers, there's a constellation of thought that begins to emerge, right? And I think um, something that begins to emerge is the notion that given the fact that uh, the proximity, both literally and figuratively, between constituents and elected officials is closest at the local level, perhaps the local level is the most effective vehicle for pushing a socially progressive agenda. And then, given fears of state or federal preemption, the most defensible place for a local government to put those provisions is in its regulatory land use police powers. So if those two things are true, then that third statement must be true. A municipal's land use power is perhaps the most effective vehicle for achieving social equity. So I'm talking to a room of architects, urban planners, community developers, right? And for me, this is the big challenge. I think all of us need to like, constantly ask ourselves in our everyday practice, are we doing enough to achieve social equity? Now, in thinking about how we achieve social equity, uh, everything I just said about the seesaw and the Goldilocks exercise, that's still true. And I think it's particularly important for a weak market city like Detroit to think about um, how, how do we minimize the pain for developers, right? How do we push for social equity while simultaneously minimizing the pain? Um, and based on our research, I think there's a, some criteria that can be incorporated, right? I think we need to push these provisions as early into the development process as possible. I think they need to be predictable and transparent. Nobody likes surprises, right? Um, I think also it needs to be consistently carried out in a predictable manner so that community groups can know when and how to engage. Isn't it interesting that developers and community groups, they all want predictability. Um, while also we need some flexibility to make sure that um, government officials can adapt to the market as it happens. So given all of that criteria, here are some uh, land use policies that we at D4 think show real promise to enhance social equity while meeting all of the Goldilocks considerations that I, I mentioned, right? The first is sunshine laws around development. So like I said, nobody wants to be surprised. Uh, I think there are ways that we can require community impact reports and various other cities do this, and you can incorporate those requirements into, let's say, a public RFP. So you just, you announce to anybody responding to an RFP, a portion of it, you know, you're gonna have to create an executive summary that is then released to the public. No surprises, it's transparent, it's fair. I think also there are a number of ways that we can embed community engagement requirements into, um, let's say, rezoning processes. Um, so here in Ann Arbor, wait, there we go. Um, I think Ann Arbor actually has a great example of this type of community engagement process. So um, anytime a developer is seeking a rezoning uh, petition, right, or is going through a planned unit development or something like that, they have to host a community meeting and have to submit a description of that community meeting, including what the community said, with their petition. So that way the city knows what the community wants before there's even a public hearing about it. The second bundle of uh, policies that we really like are development standards. So it's legal for a municipality to just say, here are social equity provisions that we want for this development when they have an ownership stake in the property. And given everything we've heard today about how much property the city of Detroit and the Detroit Land Bank owns, I think that there's a lot that we can be doing this and incorporating it into public RFPs, public land sales, and plan unit development requirements. So we're big fans of the Park East redevelopment uh, in Milwaukee. Uh, in Milwaukee, it's a 60-acre site uh, that this county then released a bunch of RFPs for. And each RFP has a set of social equity provisions. Their picture is the Milwaukee Bucks Stadium. Um, this, I was particularly impressed with what they did around workforce development, right? So the Milwaukee Bucks Stadium, a part of their land purchase agreement with the county is um, a wage 
floor of $15 per hour for the permanent jobs. Not talking about construction jobs, permanent jobs. And then 50% of those jobs have to come from specific low income zip codes around Milwaukee, right? So in my opinion, uh, as we think about the state fairgrounds in Detroit, which is the largest assembled parcel of land in the city, it's twice the size of this. How do we replicate some of this model uh, with the state fairgrounds? Last, I promise, uh, is I want to talk about incentive, incentive zones and TIFs and bonds. So the Atlanta Beltline, I know it's controversial uh, in terms of how it was implemented, but I think the principle is still sound. When the Atlanta Beltline um, issued the bonds you know, associated with their TIF, 15% of, of that money has to go towards affordable housing and adhere to a series of community benefit principles. Uh, and then last is uh, the downtown overlay zone in New Rochelle, New York. So this is an incentive zoning overlay where developers have an easy to read menu of uh, affordable housing, community art space, historic preservation, affordable housing, or just giving money to a community benefits fund. And then in, in, as an award for providing these benefits, they get extra height allowances. In Detroit, we can talk about whether or not height allowances will work. But nevertheless, I think there is more that we can be doing to incentivize community benefits. All right, that is my time. Thank you, everyone. If you have any questions, please see me afterwards. Thanks so much. All right, I know it's been a long day for everybody, so I just want to thank you for hanging in there and still being here. Um, we're in the uh, final stretch of, I think, of what's been a really great day. Um, and really, I think what, as I reflect on the day, just the potpourri of tools um, and the ways in which we're talking about equitable development, um, it's been a really sort of diverse conversation. And I'm going to pivot again um, even with our three panelists, my three panelists, um, and how we're talking about um, engagement. Um, this session was named Journalism, but it's really around how we're telling stories and who's being represented. That's really the through, um, the through line um, with this um, session. And with that, um, I'm going to really speak to um, things that I'm passionate about and why I was brought to Detroit um, to think about how we can think about arts and culture as a, catalyt a catalytic tool for um, revitalization and engagement. Um, my work over the last six or seven years has really been focused on the intersection of um, civic engagement and art and culture and design, um, an intersection of all three of those things. And I'm lucky enough to have a job that allows me to really push the envelope on all three of those things. So I have the good fortune of going after Maurice so I can actually probably move through some of these slides because I think he set up what the office is trying to do and how the city, the city of Detroit is thinking about equitable development. But I just wanna remind folks about you know, the mayor's vision and the PDD vision. And um, this vision is really purposeful. Um, every word um, is really well thought out. And this was developed by a senior leadership on a staff retreat, um, thinking about Detroit about four years ago. And um, you know the intentionality of your statements and intentionality of the work that we do um, and been, it had the advantage of really being able to reset um, what the planning department thinks about how it does its work um, and how we implement the work. Um, it's really quite rare um, that a government agency is completely restructured and there's a chance to kind of rebuild it. Um, that, that almost never happens. So this is, a, this is a moment that we're in, in the city. And with that moment, you know, we have our eye on the prize around equitable development. These are the eight principles that Mayor Duggan outlined um, in a Mackinac speech that he gave about two years ago. And I wanted to just, I'm not gonna go through every one, but I have a few that are, that are bolded 
um, one, six, and eight, um, because they really talk to or speak to what I'm gonna be talking about around the power of arts and culture and how it unites a city and how it authentically um, develops a city. And with that, um, you know, I really wanted to squarely put forth, you know, the value proposition of arts and culture as it pertains to equitable development. And I've done some work with PolicyLink that was mentioned by Jess Zimbabwe earlier today. And when I was doing research for my talk, I went back to these principles that outline equity and arts and culture. And with all of these principles, I was happy to look at them and say, okay, check, 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 in terms of how the city and the planning department is thinking about arts and culture um, and, and development. And primarily, it's really about how we're telling the story of the comeback of the city of Detroit and whose story that is and really uplifting arts and culture um, because those folks in particular in, in the city of Detroit, they've been here um, through the worst of times and often when cities start to rebound and revitalize, they're often the first to be displaced. We are doing it differently, and we are thinking about how arts and culture and artists can help drive the revitalization, not push them out, but actually be part of the solutions and the engagement processes that we're undertaking in the community. And just to be even more specific about my charge and some of the things that I'm responsible for is that these are really the key objectives around cultural planning um, in the city and specifically in the planning and development department. Um, first and foremost, it's really about neighborhood expression and really the local identity shaping revitalization. And these are the neighborhood funded plans, the strategic neighborhood fund areas, um, the retail corridor investments, the infrastructure projects, the greenways and um, parks and open space. Um, all the things that we're doing, we're grafting arts and culture onto it, and we're thinking about how it's authentically Detroit and what that expression looks like. In addition, we're looking at trying to expedite cultural activation. That's really another um, department, our department of special events that handles festivals and whatnot, but we are closely coordinated. And thinking about culture-friendly land use policy, um, CBO process was mentioned by Maurice earlier, zoning, signage, how are we encouraging arts-friendly development and um, retaining existing creative space. And um, creative entrepreneurship, this is something that the, that the downtown partnership um, has been focusing on and has been working with the city um, around creative businesses and um, retaining them. So those are the four pillars. I'm gonna really focus on one and three. So I thought what was best is to really show you, it's, it's hard to talk about arts and culture and not have the visuals. I'm gonna talk about two projects in particular, and they're very different projects. The first one is Spirit Plaza, and that project is downtown. It's right outside the uh, city hall, and it's a totally new um, civic space. And I'll go through some of the challenges that we had, but arts and culture played a major role in turning the corner for garnering support for that project. And then I'm gonna talk about a neighborhood plan, um, the Russell Woods Narden Park plan, where that um, planning process, we specifically asked for an artist um, to be part of the consultant team, and the, the artist dabbles um, the African Bead Museum he lives in the neighborhood, and he's fundamentally shaped um, what's been coming out of the um, planning process and the recommendations. So those are the two examples that I'm gonna share. So with uh, Spirit Plaza, we're really thinking about you know, creating a civic space, um, like Chicago's Daily Plaza, like Philadelphia, 
Um, most cities have a civic space that's in front of City Hall that's distinctly um, for the city and its residents. The city of Detroit really didn't have one. There's lots of amazing public space downtown, um, Campus Martius and Capitol Park and Beacon Park, but there's nothing that's actually specifically um, for or thinking about like civic um, plaza protest um, convenings. And so uh, Spirit Plaza, actually, uh, this is what it looked like before. And this is right between Learner Street and Jefferson Avenue. And this is right in front of the Spirit of Detroit statue, iconic. We thought that there was an opportunity to kind of rethink um, the public realm. And actually, this is also about thinking about connections to the waterfront. You've got the riverfront. You have, um, you've got, uh, uh, it's not Lee Plaza. You've got um, Hart Plaza, thank you, um, right there. And it's really about um, the walk increasing walkability and access to the river, but also getting people to um, think about public space downtown, which is still very car-centric um, in a different way. So quickly, uh, this is what it, it debuted. Uh, the spring of 2017, and this is a pretty simple uh, design. Um, really, we just kind of closed off the street and did some bold painting and put up some benches. And that was essentially what um, the space was, and it was really about this lighter, cheaper, quicker method around um, public space and really sort of getting people used to a public space being there. Uh, we had food trucks and there was some light uh, programming, but by and large, I mean, this is pretty much what it looked like. After the first um, season of Spirit Plaza, um, you know, we really started to get a little bit more ambitious around what we were wanting to do. And we learned, we got a lot of great feedback from the first year that we needed to increase the shading, we needed to make it look and feel more like a plaza. So you see some of the design elements that were added for last year. Um, you know, we added umbrellas, planters, sur surface treatment, a colorful mural, and better signage to better connect um, local businesses um, and promote local businesses, and there were some fire and safety issues that we addressed as well. And so this is what the design looked like last year. And it wasn't just about an improved design. We also decided that we needed to really speak truth to power around a place for the people and really amped up our programming for the summer and what that really looked like. So we partnered with culture creators and the programming was also programmed by our general services department and DDP, it was a partnership that really um, heavily programmed the space um, with different types of artists and events. So I'm gonna pick up the pace, um, but what really wanted to show you that every day there was a theme for the day and um, it was highly successful. And I'm just gonna go really quickly so you get a sense of who's been in the space. So in addition to heavily programming the space with arts and culture, we also were continuously getting feedback. Everything that we do is about how people are feeling in the space and getting that community feedback. This was a specially designated day, but we did surveys and we did um, feedback continuously, but this was a full-on, full-court press to get feedback, and we um, had a Spirit Plaza Day, I think it was the end of July, and we had a space called like Meet Us in the Living Room, which is the lower left, my lower left, and invited people who were in the plaza to really talk about um, how they were feeling and what they would like to see. Uh, this is just a snapshot. This is just one day, not, not the whole season, of the things that we captured. We had over 1,200 visitors that day. We were able to get 82 um, surveys or people um, pr providing us feedback. And this was actually something that we used when we were in front of council talking about the success um, of the plaza and why it should remain open. And these are just um, quotes from performers and artists around Spirit Plaza and around equity. And I think that 
um, advertising this space, this was a free space, I neglected to mention that this is free of charge. We don't charge people to use the space. And it was really um, a welcoming space and people really were able to um, do a lot of different types of things and broaden their reach having participated um, in, in Spirit Plaza. And I just kind of love this quote from this artist around um, you know, her thinking about Spirit Plaza and it being sort of a vital um, showcase um, for, for the work that she's doing and feeling very validated um, about the experience. I'm going to plow through and move on. Um, one of the things we really believe, you know, culture not blight, um, that placekeeping really promotes a local cultural preservation and social interaction. And again, Russell Woods is one of the 10 uh, strategic neighborhood areas. And um, they have the four SNF components, but I'm gonna really focus on the arts and culture. And this is just a picture of Dabbles, who again is the creator of the African Bee Museum, which is also located in this neighborhood framework area. Um, but this arts and heritage strategy was really celebrating what already exists and Narden Park, and someone talked about history, and you know, does that matter? It certainly matters, and I think when you see yourself reflected in a development that's coming, it signals that that development is for you. I think that arts and culture is a powerful way to do that. And uh, these are things that we tested with the community, and these are boards that we used in our third community meeting um, that really talked about this intersection. And you can see retail, housing, open space, streetscape, you know, arts and culture and heritage is at the center of all of that. And there's some significant sites. Um, you know, there's Junior's Jazz Room. This is quite um, a culturally rich neighborhood. I don't think all of our neighborhoods as, as dynamic in terms of culture as this, but this is just a, an abundance of riches here. Um, the Supremes, several of them lived in this neighborhood and we know where the homes are. So we did some cultural asset mapping here to really think about the significant sites. Um, and you just see on this map here what's you know, significant uh, historically in terms of historic preservation and also around music and entertainment and historic properties. And asking the community during the meeting process, you know, how do you, it's not just what we think, but really getting the input from community about what they think, um, what needs to be done. And so we're asking them, this is a poster sized board, you know, what sites would you like to see recognized and celebrated in your community? This is the feedback loop. It's not just what we think. In fact, we're not, we're a little bit agnostic in our opinion and really letting community drive the community planning process as it should. And you know, this is just something around the benefits, um, really thinking about arts on the commercial corridor. And 36% of the people wanna see art on the commercial corridor. And this is just um, a, a really basic um, rendering of the different types of options that we're considering for the area. And the, uh, the uh, architect, is thinking about kind of the vacancy along the corridor and turning it into more like an art park um, in and between um, the buildings. That's one option. And then the other is looking at murals on the blank walls, but it's about enlivening the space and telling the story um, of the neighborhood in that space. I think when you have a lot of vacancy, um, there's also a lot of trauma. And I think that there's healing in arts and culture as well with respect to how we're rebuilding communities. And I'm going to, oops, I'm going to wrap up here um, with this one. Um, during the Q&A, if someone wants to ask me about Heidelberg, I'd love to tell you what we're doing there, but I'm out of time. But that's also um, another project that we're working on. And I'll just say that with Heidelberg and like Dabbles, these are the cultural producers that have been in the city and we're really about uplifting them and, and, and doing what, amplifying their work um, and embedding it in our revitalization efforts. Thank you for your time. All right. So we're gonna, 
try to go right to questions because we are running a little behind. So if anybody wants to throw something out, the box is right over here and just wave your hand and question for Sam. Uh, Sam, talking about the community benefits uh, in the ordinance yeah. and kind of uh, extending what Maurice talked about uh, earlier today, um, can you talk about uh, enforcement oh. and how uh, the benefits uh, you see are effectively perhaps enforced in other places that you've looked at? Um, I mean, I think my question is kind of driven by the first community benefits was before the ordinance. And, um, you know, for the district, Detroit, so called, around Little Caesars Arena, um, and maybe speaking about your thoughts on that process yeah. and how it might be better in the future. Yeah. Well, so the enforcement around the Detroit's Community Benefits Ordinance is tough to answer because it's still so new, right? I mean, there's, as Maurice mentioned, there's, there's only been eight projects to complete the process. But according to the letter of the law, there is supposed to be an enforcement committee that is uh, working with the neighborhood advisory councils that were created. Um, so I don't have a good answer other than we'll see. Um, you know, it, um, I, I think we're going to be relying on the clawbacks that are in the existing like agreements, right? Um, however, I will take this opportunity to quickly say that I think that ordinance absolutely needs revision, right? I think one of the challenges with the ordinance is it's relatively late in the development process. So by the time the community is talking to the developer, the developer has already begun thinking about site design and begun putting together their pro forma and financing and things like that. And so therefore, any community benefit, uh, benefits that are negotiated are going to be like, I don't know, uh, not as significant as I think they could otherwise be. Um, I think the other thing that we need to address with the community benefits ordinance is Right now, we are asking nine individuals, two of whom are elected by the community, to represent an entire community. And you can have the most altruistic nine people ever, but I think we need to be talking about what is the accountability of those nine people to the rest of the community, but also how are we setting them up for success? We, you know, the, we need to be providing them with training and examples of other community benefits agreements around the country and in Detroit before they even begin that negotiation process. And I know that City Council is thinking about some of those measures, but yeah. Other questions out there? So Kimberly put it out yeah. to all of you, and if no one's going to take her up on it, I'm going to take her up on asking about the Heidelberg Project, because if you don't know what that is, it's a really fascinating part of the cultural history of Detroit. So you want to talk about sure. Heidelberg? Yeah, really quickly. Um, so Heidelberg has been around for 30 years, and it's this um, public art. I, it, it's, it's Tyree Guyton, um, his vision of what he was seeing in his neighborhood. So it's really a protest peace, uh, so to speak, um, when the city was on the decline. Um, Heidelberg is really controversial because one man's art is another man's you know, junk. Um, but Heidelberg has stood the test of time. And what's interesting about them is that they're really trying to pivot and be more community development focused. Um, a lot has happened over the years. And they're uh, basically been disassembling Heidelberg over the last couple of years. There have been a number of fires that wiped out um, a large portion of their inventory. But they see the future, and they know that what, what it was 30 years ago is not what it's going to be moving forward. So the city is, is entering into a, a partnership. And this is, they've been, Heidelberg and the city have been at odds and have been really kind of fighting with each other. It has not been a good history. Um, so it's a really big deal um, that a city agency is, is working with them. Um, and uh, we're calling it, they're calling it Heidelberg 3.0. And we're really thinking about um, landscape and art and healing 
because um, that's everything that they represent, and really thinking about what the 21st century version of Heidelberg can be. Um, and they want to do artists live workspace and just be more intentional about the community development benefits. And so we're, we're working on an arts-centered revitalization plan for that area. Thank you. We're going to set up for our, ne our next and last panel, but we thought maybe we'd give people about five minutes for coffee and a little stretching and a little water. Um, and I want to thank our panel here. Thank you. Thanks, um, thank you for sticking around to the end. Um, I see some of my students from the undergraduate course. Your presence is not unnoticed. Uh, I know that this panel is uh, titled uh, Equitable Engagement, but um, I think one other way to think about this is this is uh, the money panel, um, which is always important in development. Um, we have three great speakers here uh, today uh, to talk about equitable engagement. Um, the first is Melinda Clemens, um, who is the Senior Director of Enterprise Community Partners at the Detroit Market. Um, she has spent the majority of her career um, focused on strategic initiatives and rebuilding underserved communities. Um, she's also worked at Capital Impact Partners at, and the Urban Partnership Bank and J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, she's also a double Wolverine, um, which we're happy to say. Um, next is Kevin Ryan, who is the Detroit Program Officer for the Cities and States team for the Ford Foundation. Um, we're happy he's here. Um, he has spent um, his career also spending a lot of time looking uh, at community, underserved communities, um, including 14 years at the New York Foundation. Um, and also the um, capital building program um, at the New York Foundation. Uh, and Julie Schneider, um, who is here from the city of Detroit, um, has spent a lot of time, um, she is the current deputy director of the city's housing and redevelopment department, the revitalization department. Um, she also worked at HUD and is also, all three of our panelists are Wolverines, so um, welcome home. Oh, okay. She had to bring that up. Okay. She went to Michigan State as well. So, um, without uh, further ado, uh, Melinda, we'll hear from Melinda first, then Kevin, and then Julie, and then we'll have uh, as full a conversation as we can have in the time that we have. Great. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> okay, this is left. Yeah, you're right. How's everyone doing this afternoon? Good. Okay, we're the last presentation, but we're going to be the most awesome presentation, okay? So I'm Melinda Clemens. I'm the executive director of the Detroit Enterprise Office, and I've been asked here today to talk a little bit about my organization and our work in Detroit. So Enterprise is a national nonprofit that is really focused on affordable housing. In the last 35 years, we've invested over $36 billion in communities across the country. So over a billion dollars a year. And we really think about our work as a three-legged stool. How can we bring capital, programs, and policy to our local offices? And Detroit is the most recent local office. It was opened in 2015, and it's the 11th office. And so the most recognized leg of our stool is our capital. So through our capital, we invested more than $50 million in the market. And we have an additional $50 million in various stages of underwriting. Our second tool is our programs. We currently have a pilot program focused on developing an employer-assisted housing in Northwest Detroit with Sinai Grace Hospital and the Sinai Grace Hospital CDC, which we helped create. We are working with also anchor institutions such as Sinai Grace Guild CDC to create an employer-based um, work program, but also working with the Guild to, for a senior program for weatherization and also workforce training. Our third leg of our stool is policy. We advocate for policies that advance affordable housing nationwide, but many people don't know that we also advocate for policy on a local and a state level. 
Most recently, we worked with the city of Detroit on the affordable housing ordinance. And we also worked with MISHTA on the QAP using our data tool Opportunity 360 as part of the scoring criteria. So what's Opportunity 360? It's a data tool to measure pathways of success based on census tracts. We measure outcomes related to housing stability, education, health and well-being, economic security, and mobility. It's free and it can be accessed from our website. So you put in any address in the United States and you'll get a free 22-page report that talks about that census tract and it will also compare it to local and state numbers. We're excited to have this in the QAP because we help identify strong resources in strong neighborhoods. We have a couple other local initiatives that we're working on. Through our green communities work, we are helping CDCs understand how to bring green measures to new or aging housing stock to reduce operating costs. We think with energy efficiency, we can reduce costs up to 30%, which is very important for LMI communities. We know that DTE bill in January and February is really hurtful, particularly when you're on a fixed budget. We also have a health and housing initiative that helps develop and support partnerships between CDCs and anchor health institutions to create housing based on the land that they own and health outcomes. So what does this mean when we pull all this together for the city of Detroit? Evidence is growing between the connection of poverty, health, and the racial wealth gap. We believe a large part of this is due to housing and housing insecurity, and particularly even after redlining. We know that one in four Americans are housing insecure. I'm sorry, one in four have housing that they qualify for, while three in four are housing insecure. We believe that housing is a human right and the places where we live, we know, shape our lives and our health outcomes. And so what we wanna do is bring all of our resources from enterprise to Detroit to improve those outcomes. And mo most people want the same thing in life, right? We all want health, we want education, we want well-being, and we want secure housing. But we all don't have the same opportunities. We all start at different places. So how do we level that playing field? And that's the question I ask myself every day. How do we level that playing field? Because I was on a playing field that wasn't level. And it was really difficult. So now in my work, and particularly at Enterprise, we want to continue operating how we can level the playing field and bring our tools and our resources to the market. And so with that, here's contact information. A lot of you know India Solomon. She is the newest addition to our team. And India, raise your hand. So she'll be handling all of our programmatic work. So if you have any questions about our economic mobility initiatives, please reach out to her or myself. Thank you. While we're waiting. While we're waiting. I forgot to introduce myself. Um, I'm Harley Etienne. I'm faculty in the Urban and Regional Planning Program. Um, and uh, please get your questions ready for after Kevin speaks. Thanks. OK, so this took a while. These are not going to be that interesting. But I'm, I'm just I'm warning you right now. So before I start, I want to give you just a little history about Ford Foundation in Michigan. So some of you may have read this morning that the Ford Foundation has, has added Henry Ford III to our, our board of directors. He's the first Ford family member to join the Ford Foundation board since 1976. Part of this is our recommitment to Detroit and to the new generation of the Ford family. But part of it is the, the long and sometimes um, complex history that the foundation has in Detroit. The foundation was relocated to New York in the 1950s. It was a move that was prompted by Henry Ford II as the foundation became a more global entity and opened up offices, 10 offices overseas. And then even though the foundation had moved to, to New York, there was still 
uh, an interest and funding and support that was provided for Detroit and Michigan. But it wasn't until really the bankruptcy that the foundation made a major commitment to support the grand bargain process with eight other funders, where Ford made a, a truly significant commitment to Detroit over the long term. So as a part of that, in addition to that money that, that's provided for that process, we also uh, built out a Detroit working group that provides grant making in a number of different areas. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that grant making. I'm gonna focus primarily on the community development or equitable development side of that, but you'll see in the few slides I have that it's broader than, than that. So to start with, so I gave you a little bit of the historical dynamics there. You all know the history of the decline in the Rust Belt, Detroit's bankruptcy, uh, and then to steal a term from Tanya Allen, um, who runs the Skillman Foundation in Detroit, another U of M grad, uh, the, there's a tale of multiple cities in Detroit. There's a tale of people who are actually able to take advantage of the opportunities that have been created with the major investments over the last five to 10 years. There are another set of people who, even as the city starts to change for the better in some ways, still see Detroit as a place with lacking opportunity and have decided to leave. Even though the growth, the, the negative rate has slowed, there are still people leaving the city. And then there's a third set of people that are not able to take advantage of the opportunities, who live in neighborhoods where investment has been slower, who are dealing with the challenges of the school system, the criminal justice system, and other challenges, infrastructure challenges that the city is trying to reverse. So we just need to keep that in mind that there's multiple stories of Detroiters and the challenges and also the, the assets that all Detroiters bring to the table. So for, for Ford, we really started, as many foundations did, by investing in Midtown and Downtown and looking at opportunities for growth and advancement in those two neighborhoods. And that's where we started with the investment around affordable housing, some investment in workforce, and also in education. And then when the, a, a few years ago, when the mayor introduced the Strategic Neighborhood Initiative, this was an initiative that started with comprehensive revitalization efforts in three neighborhoods. It's now been expanded to seven more neighbors for a total of 10. Ford, along with a number of other foundations and banks, invested in the, the significant redevelopment in those communities. Now, I mentioned some of the overwhelming structural challenges. We, we don't deny that we, there's a number of things that we need to work on outside of community development. But I, as Melinda said, we believe that housing and the, the challenges of maintaining housing are one of the, the, the major factors that impede the revitalization for so many Detroiters. Uh, and just as an example, if you look at the data, um, most Detroiters, if we, if we look at the area median income for this region, uh, the area median income uh, for the region, if you build housing at 80% of that area median income, very few Detroiters would be able to access that housing. In many cases, we're talking about housing needs in the 30 to 50% of the area median income range. So trying to find ways in a, in a market that's extre still extremely challenged to address the entrenched poverty and other challenges that people face is something that we're trying to work on collectively. So I'm gonna talk about Ford's strategy today, but I just wanted to point out that many of us, Enterprise, the city, Ford Foundation, Kresge, we're all trying to work together and work in, in much stronger and connected ways to address some of the challenges that are outlined here. So for Ford, the Detroit strategy really starts with how do we create a more inclusive and equitable recovery so that everybody benefits from this recovery and, then, and that no one is left behind in that process. The goals for our, for our work is to really to eliminate inequalities in systems. So a lot of the work that we fund is around public policy reform and change that could actually open up opportunities for more Detroiters. And we also wanna find a way to connect advocates around the state with advocates in Detroit, because we feel like a lot of the, the policy changes that are necessary can't be done at the city level and really require state action. And then finally, the approaches to this General support, this means providing grants to organizations in the city of Detroit that don't require specific program 
outcomes that actually are general support that provide operating dollars so that organizations have the capacity to do more work in the city or beyond state level. Capacity building. So a lot of the organizations, as they grow, may need help in developing their board of directors, the staff of the organization. A number of groups have talked about needing help with succession planning to find new leadership for those organizations. So we provide capacity building dollars to help groups actually follow through on those processes. We also are trying to align progressive agendas. So um, there, there's often a challenge, well this is being recorded, right? This, okay, right. So there's often a challenge in aligning efforts across the city and across the state. Some groups work on what I'll call outsider strategies, meaning not necessarily working with government, but challenging government to move more progressive policies. While some groups work on inside strategies where they partner with government agencies and officials to try to better strategies from the inside. Our feeling is we need a more connected strategy. Groups that are working on the outside who are organizing residents and communities are just as valuable as the groups that work on policy from the inside. And without a connected strategy between those type of organizations, groups are often fighting cross purposes. So we're trying to find ways that we can help to strengthen those relationships. Narrative shift. As you all know, for many years, the narrative about Detroit has been one of negatives, one of lacking resources. What we'd like to promote is a narrative of Detroit that, that really focuses on the assets in the city of Detroit. We feel that all Detroiters have something to contribute to the revitalization of the city, but we don't often talk about it that way. And, and there are, you all know there are particular neighborhoods where we don't talk about anything but the negatives. So we have to get past that and we have to come up with positive narratives and we can't just lead with what bleeds. That doesn't work in this day and age if we're really gonna to try to have an inclusive and equitable recovery. And finally, I mentioned before, fund, funder alignment, really trying to find ways for us to work together. Maybe we don't, we can't all fund the public policies side of that work, but some of us can fund the research part. Some of us can fund the service, the immediate services that are needed in communities. How can we align those kind of strategies? So here's the three areas that we work in. The, I put the equitable housing and land use strategy at the top because that's our, the, the process we're most engaged in. And I'm gonna get to details about that a little later. The second piece of powerful and coordinated civil society is what I mentioned before, finding ways to connect organizations and leaders across the state and across the city who can also work with residents so that we have a more empowered, informed, and knowledgeable residency in Detroit so that they can participate deeply in all of these sort of decision-making processes that happen. And then I mentioned the collaborations with the city, with corporations, with foundations, and other foundations and banks. So I just, this is an example. When we, when we came to Detroit, because our focus was primarily downtown and midtown, one of the first things I did was just map out an ecosystem of the community development sector in Detroit. So you can't see all these things, but you know, on, one, on, on the far end, the, the bigger orange bubble is the community development organizations in the city. Above that, the gray is the community development financial institutions to support organizations in the city. The biggest uh, piece of this, the green, is grassroots organizations that work on everything from housing policy to organizing residents in their communities. And then you see the like colleges, government, uh, advocates, entrepreneurs, all, all types of different organizations participate in one way or the other in the community development ecosystem. So when we thought about this, we started with some basic uh, grants that supported some of the community development groups, that supported some of the citywide efforts, but we weren't really funding in a comprehensive way that would actually address the challenges that the, the organizations and, and residents in different neighborhoods face. So when we looked at what we needed to do, we, we came up with these sort of four sectors of work. One, financing infrastructure. So Detroit has a growing community development financial institution sector here, but often the products that are necessary to actually advance uh, the, the changes in communities, whether we're talking about development or preservation, those, there can be some serious financing challenges in a market that is not, uh, would you wouldn't consider a strong market overall. So examples of that could be an individual who wants to put a new roof on their home, having access to the resources that they need to do that. If you don't have a credit history, if you don't have the kind of finances necessary, you might find it very difficult to find that, that funding. And if you do find it, you might find it in interest rates that could put you in jeopardy in the longer term. 
So finding those kind of financial products and bringing the, the, the different, the different uh, sectors together, whether it's the banks and the foundations and city and state to figure out what those products look like and how we can support that infrastructure. That would help with large scale development as well as small scale neighborhood development. A robust community development sector. For many years, the community development sector in the city has, has been starved without resources. Many, of the, many groups have folded over the last decade, and I'll say since 2008, since the, the downturn in 2008, and many others are operating at limited capacity. So finding ways, and we, we've talked extensively with, with Enterprise, with Kresge Foundation and others, about how we can actually bolster that sector and how that sector can be a main player in redevelopment in neighborhoods. Uh, when we think about affordable housing development in neighborhoods, there, sometimes developers, for-profit developers, have a tendency to look at it as a market reality and strategy for investment that will actually bring significant return to them while community development organizations, many of them are in business to provide that affordable housing and those resources to communities that would create longer term or permanent affordability in neighborhoods. City and state administrative practices and policies, as I said before, there's some things the city can do to move, move forward certain strategies that will make it easier for us to develop and preserve affordable housing. But some of the decision making happens at the state level. So how can we align and, and recognize what those policies and administrative changes are and then figure out ways to actually advance and, and make those policy changes to really make it easier for us to really engage in this process. And then finally, addressing the short-term challenge of homeowners and renters. Many of you know that uh, thousands of Detroiters are facing tax foreclosure in the next few years. I think the last report was more than 50,000 Detroiters could face uh, tax foreclosure in the next five years um, if they are not able to address the challenges that they face. So really trying to figure out, again, what are those key challenges that particularly low and moderate income Detroiters are facing, and then coming up with joint strategies to try to address in the short term while then we can try to find long-term solutions through the policy and administrative practices. So finally, as we go through this, we're not saying we have all the answers, we don't. There's a lot of things that we don't know and we need more information about or we need to think through. So these are some of the questions that we've been grappling with as we look at community development in the city and we look at, at um, affordability and other issues. How do you create effective rules of engagement between the city administration, philanthropy, developers, community development organizations, and residents? In many cases, we actually have the same self-interest. There are examples, though, where we don't. But how can we find ways to actually co collectively define of what we mean by affordability? To be able to collectively define what we mean by equitable development. If we can come to some common understanding of those dynamics, that would be helpful for us to get to the long-term vision of we, what we'd like the city to look like. How do we ensure that residents have a true voice in community development decision making? In a number of neighbors around the city, I, I mean, I can think of Cody Rouge, Osborne, other neighbors. There are strong neighborhood organizations that have done work over the years to build really effective and strong community engagement through any development processes that happen in that neighborhood. But other communities don't have access to those type of organizations or institutions. So how can we create structures and systems and resource neighborhoods that don't have that strong engagement and find ways to make sure that communities come back to the table? As you all know, after the bankruptcy, many people felt that the, the system failed them and that they were, their democratic rights were lost. And I think there's a lot of Detroiters who still feel that way. How can we bring them back into the fold and make them understand that they're an integral part of this process as we move forward? I mentioned before the best financial tools and models. We're, we're thinking all the time about models from different places that we can adapt to Detroit or unique models of financialization that we need to develop here that would actually be effective in this structure. How do we balance the rapid pace of city-driven development processes with actual time frames that include equitable practices? Uh, I know the city and I, my friends at the city are under a tremendous pressure to move forward these processes. And I think we in philanthropy sometimes put that pressure on them to move these processes forward quickly. 
I think that um, coming up with realistic timelines for how we move forward community development processes that include deep community engagement practices from the beginning stages to implementation is another important thing that we have to figure out. And as philanthropy collectively, I, I mean speaking for forward, but collectively we need to figure out how we can come to the table and come to agreement. And then finally, how do we actually measure long, medium, and, and short, medium, and long-term success in this process? That's another area where we have to come to some agreement and that we're trying to figure out. So I wanted to leave you with these questions because I feel like these are the things that we're trying to figure out in the long term. And we're not only talking to community-based organizations, we're talking to neighborhood residents to really figure out how we can best achieve the, the best end result and, out, and outputs for a real equitable and inclusive future city. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I, my name is Julie Schneider. I'm the deputy director of the Housing and Revitalization Department from the uh, city of Detroit. So I'm the last speaker of the last day. Thank you for, uh, or last speaker of the last panel. Thanks for staying with us. I, I will do my best to, to keep you engaged and interested. So uh, I was asked today to talk about implementation from my perspective at the city of Detroit. And so I am uh, I'm about um, six weeks into the deputy director position. Before that, I was the associate director for policy development and implementation. And, and in that work, we, we developed the, the multifamily housing strategy and uh, really focused on preservation or preserving affordable housing in that. And that's what I'm going to really focus on today. So why, why focus on preservation? So our guiding principle is one city for all of us. And we have uh, eight principles of development. One of them is fighting displacement. Preserving affordable housing is where many current Detroiters live. And so that is a, a strong part of, of this strategy. And that's really what I'm going to focus on today. So I'm going to go through the kind of backgrounds of the strategy, why preservation is important, how we established the goals that we did, talk about the actions that we're taking to, to preserve affordable housing, and then uh, just kind of go over some, what do some of those developments look like and what success have we ch achieved to this point. So, uh, in 2018, in, in March, we established the Multifamily Affordable Housing Strategy, which um, included the two goals of preserving 10,000 units of existing affordable housing and developing 2,000 new units of affordable housing. In the strategy, it, it describes a number of, of initiatives and, and other strategies we'll, we'll take to, to establish those goals, um, and I'll go into some of those details later. So, how did we get to, to those numbers? So. Um, we looked at what was happening in the, the market today. So uh, as, as Kevin and Melinda have mentioned, development economics in Detroit are challenging. Um, the, the rent per square foot does not allow for unsubsidized development in Detroit. The market value of developments is not enough to support fully unsubsidized development. Um, and so on a project by project basis, you end up with feasibility gaps. So the market value or the kind of what your, your annual or your, your operating revenue is able to support is not equal to the, the cost of development. And so despite all of that, we've seen rising multifamily permits in, in the city. Um, this goes through 2015. If you saw it going through today, you'd see that number edging up over a, a thousand in the past couple of years. And so, and most of the development has been in multifamily. Since most of the development is in multifamily, we wanted to make sure that we were developing an affordable housing strategy alongside that, affordable, that multifamily development so that affordable housing was not a reaction to this growth we see, but it was occurring alongside of it. And so most of that development has been in the greater downtown. Again, this map is a little, it's from 2017. You'd start to see more dots in the, in the neighborhoods, but still you'd see a lot of concentration in the greater downtown. And so the, the concentration of, of development and some of the major changes that we've seen in the city of Detroit in the past 16 years has led to some, some major shifting population trends. We've seen um, 
while the population has increased in the greater downtown, it's still it's decreased rapidly um, in the, the rest of the city. Um, and so that concentration of development in the greater downtown, the, the population increase has led to some rising rents. So primarily in the greater downtown, but in the, the rest of the city as well. And so you look at those increasing costs and you think about what can Detroiters pay? And as, as Kevin mentioned, um, the, the, the household, um, $26,800 is, is roughly about the, the median income in, in Detroit. Um, much of the city, many of our households are making less than 50% of, of the area median income. And so if you have rising development costs, if you have rising rents, if you have a city where your residents are, are not going to be able to maintain um, that ability to pay as you see development increasing, you know you have to focus on building and preserving affordable housing. And so why preserve? Well, if you want to increase your affordability, you can't lose the affordable housing that you have. Um, net zero, or no, no net, um, having a policy where you're not actually gaining, you're just having a like net, no net loss, doesn't actually help you to provide more affordable housing. And so, um, if you're trying to preserve affordable housing in Detroit, um, we have a, a challenge. Much of our housing is, is aging. Much of our affordable housing is aging. Um, as it ages, it has risks of, of no longer continuing to be able to operate as quality housing, and its affordability restrictions run off. And that housing, that affordable housing, happens to be concentrated in the greater downtown. And so on these maps, you see between now and 2023 developments where the maximum affordability period expires during that time. And so these numbers, this 88,854 uh, 8, units and another about 1,200 represent that 10,000 unit goal of preserving existing affordable housing. And so how do we do that? So, as a, as a complementary piece to the multifamily strategy, we developed the Detroit Preservation Action Plan. We did that with uh, the, the help of about 40 stakeholders over the course of a year. And the Preservation Action Plan is focused on four kind of key, key actions. So one, create and maintain a database. You've got to know what you have. So we've done that. We have about 280 properties. And, um, uh, Rebecca Lebove has been like critical in, in getting that that database together. Um, she has uh, put together that property that we we know the owners, we know the, the property manager, we know the the financial challenges and performance of those developments, we know the the subsidy information. So that's that's key, and that helps us to collaborate with key stakeholders such as as developers and owners of property. So um, we, collaborating with key stakeholders starts with making sure that we are communicating with owners, identifying whether or not they intend to preserve those properties, whether they're not, they don't. If they intend to, how can we assist them in identifying pathways to preserve that affordable housing for our residents? And if not, what are our, what are our other options? How do we make sure that our residents are not being displaced? Um, the third kind of action is transition single family scattered site low income housing tax properties. So in addition to the, the dots on that map, there are about 1,200 units of single family scattered site housing. Uh, they're rental housing units and they're, they're aging. Many of those homes uh, are in kind of development situations where they could be made available for for purchase by their low-income housing or their low-income tenants. Um, we want to make sure that where owners and where tenants want to see that transition, that we are helping to make that happen. Many of these deals are uh, were done at a time where low-income housing tax credit properties were taking out these interest-only balloon payment loans like so many other people in the country were. They make them very difficult um, to preserve, but we want to work with owners where they want to um, transition ownership to the, the tenants, and we're not, we want to still want to make sure that those buildings or those houses continue to operate as quality affordable housing. And lastly, 
improve coordination and collaboration among stakeholders. And residents are stakeholders. Right? So we're preserving affordable housing so the residents still have affordable housing, so we must work with them. And this photo shows a, a group of tenants who coming back into a building, cutting the ribbon after the, the property had been uh, drastically improved. I think in that, that room they're in before there were, there were open wires um, visible. So um, this was an exciting day, but collaborating with residents, making sure that they're involved in the, the preserving of the, the housing that they're living in, working with the State Housing Finance Agency or MISHTA, uh, working with HUD to make sure that we are all on the same page. So um, how do we do this? Well, keys to implementation, financial resources. So. The city has established the Affordable Housing Leverage Fund. One of the, the key purposes of that is to preserve existing affordable housing. Two, capacity building. Many of these, these older developments were um, built by CDCs, and we want to make sure that neighborhood-driven development is a part of this work, and we need to make sure that we're investing in capacity building as well. And third, establishing the preservation partnership. So the Preservation Partnership will be a group that's charged with implementing that action plan. We expect to designate that group through an RFP process that we'll release in the next month or so and designate that group within the next three months to make sure that we are working um, as much as we can both within the city and externally with stakeholders to accomplish these goals. So how are we doing? So since 2015, we've preserved 2,035 units. What do these buildings look like? So some of them are just like this building, um, the Camper Steven. So 163 senior units preserve. Um, this is in right in downtown on Washington Boulevard. Um, if, if you're familiar with the area, it's also a, quite a beautiful building. So the Hamilton. So the Hamilton is the, the building where I showed you the residents cutting the ribbon. So we preserved 20 to 30 naturally occurring affordable housing units for the, the residents that were there had the right to return with rents that, that they can afford. As a part of that process, we did engagement with the, with the tenants, talking to them about what they, um, what they could expect, what they could afford, working with them to make sure that they were in leases that would last for the, um, the term that they, they desire to stay in, in that building. Um, Ryan Court, which is in the Oakland Boulevard neighborhood, uh, I believe uh, Kim Driggan spoke about that neighborhood earlier, 176 units preserved. Pablo Davis, Pablo Davis is a 80 senior units in southwest Detroit. Um, example of a supportive housing building that's, that's been preserved where they're housing People who have previously experienced homelessness, um, it's all a key to this strategy. And you see a, um, some other buildings there. So I've been asked to talk about implementation, and I want to leave with this. So we're talking about equitable development today. So many people have talked about affordable housing. This is, if, if you're talking about from a municipal government perspective, this is the reality of the situation that we're working in. When we're talking about preserving affordable housing, those developments that we're talking about preserving were built, we had more money. We have much less money now. Implementation in municipal government, it's a, it's a struggle. Um, I uh, often say to people when they're coming to interview with me, you've got to be ready to get up every day and run into a brick wall and do it again tomorrow <laughs> um, and know that some walls are thicker than others. And sometimes you get to break through, but you've really got to kind of embrace the idea of being able to nudge and, and see that as, a, as, as success until you can break through. Um, and so that is, that is all for me. Um, I guess we are, we are on to questions. So. So while we uh, get set up, um, do we have any questions from the audience? Hi, just uh, not really a question. I just wanted to point out uh, that CDB slide. That was really great to see that because I, I gotta say, I gotta tell you guys, like I, I know, I know there's other, others out here who know this, but the city's got to get together on CDBG because not only does the dollar amount go down every budget cycle, more and more entitlement communities qualify 
every budget cycle. You are fighting after shrinking slices of a shrinking pie. Cities have to get together on this, please. Thank you, Oscar. So one question I have for all of you <clears throat> is about CDCs. And uh, foundations don't build affordable housing, um, community development organizations do. Um, so I know we're being taped, but as candidly as you can, what are some of the biggest problems that you can see currently with CDCs and community development organizations and their ability to build affordable housing? So I'll start, I'll say that this is a big topic of conversation in the city of Detroit, as Kevin talked about. A lot of organizations are trying to figure out how to build the capacity of CDCs. The question you should ask yourself is, what is capacity, right? Is it computers? Is it additional staff? Is it funding requirements? Is it helping them get their real estate project over um, the finish line? I believe that all CDCs are not real estate developers, nor should they be. A lot of CDCs have very important programmatic work that they run, and we should be encouraging that. And so, particularly when our CDCs, a lot of them declined or they either failed at the recession, we're really kind of starting from the beginning. We've had CDCs that have been working on some things. They were going great, and then after the recession, they sort of had to take a back seat. So really just and start over again. So really just understanding that there is no one size fits all. Every CDC in every neighborhood is very different and very unique and understanding that we're gonna need a broad spectrum of tools in order to help them achieve their objective, which is building stronger communities, which is our objective. And it can, it's already, it's, there's already efforts underway to try to strengthen the sector. Building the engine for community development in Detroit is a, a the applause for that. Okay, good. Yeah. So some people know about them. So they, so it, this is a collaboration between the Community Development Advocates of Detroit, Michigan Nonprofit Association, and Lawrence Technical University. Right. I'm, I'm sorry. I always forget what the full name is. But um, they're they're actually working with a, more than 150 organizations across the city. Some CDCs. Some of us have sat on different mm -hmm. committees with the group. But to look at uh, eight different areas of of transformation within the sector that needs to take place. Everything from financialization to talent development to capacity building and trying to define capacity building. And so I'm really hopeful that through that process we'll actually come up with a number of recommendations that foundations can support, the city can support, intermediaries can support to really help rebuild the sector as Melinda was talking about. Yeah, uh, so I, uh, to kind of pick up what you're talking about, Kevin, about building, building the engine of community development, I think one of the things I'm most looking forward to of the, the work that's coming out of, out of, out of, that, out of that group and, and others I see in this, the city is that um, there's an acknowledgement that it's not a, and I, I don't think that's new, there's an acknowledgement that there's not a one size fits all, that the community development organizations are, are looking at what's the, the needs in, in their service areas, um, what are they kind of uniquely positioned to be able to do, and then building out, I think, capacity in those, those areas is key. And I think it's important, um, I think, when we're talking about CDCs, it's one area that, that our groups sit together at tables on as, as, as funders and, and supporting that, that work um, is, is critical going forward. So I'm going to push a little bit more. So I feel fairly in the know on this, but I don't quite understand this um, relationship between the Department of Neighborhoods, HRD, and playing in development. And as it relates to CDCs, um, can you outline, so how do community development organizations plug into um, the city and for technical assistance, for example? Okay, so um, I, I, I will give a mostly uh, complete answer, but it's not the dictionary kind of um, or encyclopedic. So um, the planning and development department leads neighborhood planning efforts. The Department of Neighborhoods leads, uh, they're really our community engagement lead. 
Uh, so regardless of whether or not a planning, a neighborhood planning project is working or, or go ongoing, the Department of Neighborhoods is is meeting with meeting with residents. Um, they are meeting with CDCs. They attend uh, neighborhood neighborhood block club meetings and, and neighborhood association meetings. They are they are doing that work. So they are the kind of community engagement specialist that's working in, with the. Uh, the planning department on those neighborhood plans. The housing and revitalization department through our public-private partnerships team is working to, to implement any sort of housing developments that are happening on public land where we're putting out a request for proposals, working with developers as they um, and, and uh, community organizations and CDOs when um, they're a part of that, that process to, to see that development through to execution. There may be some things I missed, but that is um, how, how they work. So if we could go back to you, Kevin. So Ford is now recently, <laughs> is recently back um, in Detroit. And so I guess one question is, how is that changing the landscape? And how are these conversations with enterprise and the city changing this landscape for CDCs and community development organizations? Well, I think the challenge at Ford was, you know, we were trying to fund a number of different uh, work in a number of different issue areas from New York City, and and that was extremely challenging, because you can have I mean, they, and we did have there was a a staff person who was here you know, once a month, but you can't really learn the the politics, both the, in the informal and formal politics of the city of neighborhoods. You can't build the type of deeper relationships, and I think beyond building relationships, building trust. With, with partner organizations. And so part of what I, I did in the first year, we, before I started, I, I came up with a list of about 300 organizations in the city that I wanted to meet with. So in year one, uh, I think I had uh, about 620 meetings in year one to just really try to understand what organizations were going through in different neighborhoods, what were some of the citywide efforts? How were those shaped? Uh, to meet with the city, to find out from different people at different um, departments about their role and, and, and how that was happening. And then, of course, all our philanthropic colleagues, uh, we wanted to assure them when we, you know, at, when, I'm, when I came here, we want to partner with you. We're not trying to build and brand things under Ford's name. We actually want to come in because we know that many of you have already been leading important efforts, and we just want to bring more capital and resources to the table. That's the truth. I'm going to drop this truth. It's all true. It's all true. Um, so, but, so I think part of, it, part of it has been, I mean, it was a whirlwind in year one, I'll be honest. I mean, it was really just getting to know the city again and getting to know what was happening. But I can't really, I can't say enough about, I mean, the two folks up here and other folks that I've met with in the time I've been here, I, I really believe that we're building a really connected and coherent community development strategy among us. Mm -hmm. And I think this could, I actually, and I'm gonna say this on the record, I think when we're done with this, it will be a model, a national model for cooperation and connectivity. So uh, let me ask you, all three of you, um, there's an impatience. Um, people want it done today. Um, and so I guess to ask you all about the pressure, um, why isn't it happening faster and where that pressure is coming from? Um, how do you respond to that pressure from the public, from um, community development organizations who want all the money they can to do it all today? Um, or impatience that the metrics aren't there that we've not gotten further? So I'll start and say that we've had decades of disinvestment and so and population loss. So we're not going to fix this problem overnight, right? We're going to have to be patient. Um, the good thing is that the city, the philanthropic community, the intermediaries, even the banking institutions are all working together in a way in which we haven't seen in the past. Um, we're trying to forge a path forward and not duplicate efforts as well. And so when we work with our CDC partners, we tell them, you know, this isn't going to be an overnight remedy, but we are working on it. And we, we show that through our dollars, right? And so we provide Section 4 dollars for CDCs. The Ford Foundation obviously provides a lot of support. And then we go to the city and we, we ask for support as well. <laughs> we typically get it. So... Um... I think that, uh, yeah, so decades of, of disinvestment. And if you, you think about some of the um, 
the population laws, right, the, the disinvestment, the challenging market economics, the uh, need to rebuild these relationships and, and kind of relearn how to do so much of this, this work. Um, I, I recognize the, the frustration that people have that things aren't, aren't moving fast enough. At the same time, we often from the city also get criticized for, for moving too fast. And so um, it's, it's a balance. Um, when the, the recession happened, we lost a large portion of our workforce that, to, to build these developments. We see development costs rising. You see development costs rising, you mean those gaps are getting bigger. Um, it's, um, we need to keep working to rebuild not just um, the, the organizations we've talked about today to get this done faster, but also the, the workforce. Um, our residents absolutely first, first and foremost, but we have to, to recognize that we lost so much of our workforce and that is um, causing some of the challenges that we see today too. I'm going to save my last question and take questions from the audience if there are any. Mark. Oh. <laughs> we have two mics. The <laughs> box. Uh, nice touch. Uh, uh, one thing that's on, I think, a lot of people's minds are opportunity zones. And I imagine that Ford has looked at them. I know that Enterprise is looking at them. I know um, that the city is probably. Uh, excited and worried at the same time about them. And uh, I was just wondering what your thoughts were, because it seems like a great program, but obviously it's investors looking for a return. And as we heard from Maurice Cox and other speakers, uh, Detroit isn't necessarily providing the returns um, that sort of mainstream investors wanted. But I'm wondering how you, uh, your organizations are, are looking at it. So we definitely are looking at opportunity zones. We have a couple of opportunity zone funds uh, across the country. So opportunity zones have the potential to bring billions of dollars in, in thriving communities, right? But they also have the opportunity to completely gentrify a neighborhood or a city. So you need to make sure when you're investing or when you're looking at projects and it has financing that includes opportunity zone money, that that money is socially driven and that those dollars are going in the right place and that there isn't disinvestment. And it's a hard thing to do because you've raised this, these funds, you've promised this return, but yet you still need to make sure that you are doing so in a respectful and also in a diligent way because we also have the opportunity to completely change the cultural resiliency of communities in which we're serving. Well, I, oh, go I, ahead. No, I please, completely please agree. go ahead. I completely yeah. agree with you. That is all. I, I, I see those same, those same exact challenges and um, certainly think that as if, if we see potential uh, use of those in Detroit, that those are um, both the kind of opportunities and challenges that, that, that we see as well. So, so at Ford, <laughs> if, um, if the sort of continuum here is we're bearish on opportunity zones or bullish, our investment team and our equitable development team are here. They're way over here because the challenge is there's no, I mean, there's no reporting requirements. So you can go out and you can, you can make claims on the returns on, on these projects, but how do we actually really know if, you, if these things actually happen? And it doesn't appear that this administration is willing to put any type of requirements on this that will actually help us chart. Because one of the things we actually are thinking about is how can we actually chart where investments are going, how they're used, you know, all these things. I am, um, I'm probably the most bullish on the team about opportunity zones, but I'm still over it like right here. <laughs> but I, I just, I think that we are, we're also trying to figure out if foundations were to leverage our endowments to support potential investment opportunities, what would that look like? Um, there are regulations about how we can approach it that we'd have to figure out. But I, I just, I feel like in conversations with some of our bank colleagues and others who have started funds, uh, I, just, I, I just think there's maybe eight harms to one benefit that could come from 
the opportunity zones. I'm more interested in actually looking at the, the broader range of financialization products, say uh, private activity bonds on the state level. I mean, the state of Michigan's holding on to 2.8 billion in private activity bonds, and if, the, if 2 billion of that is not used in the next few years, you, you use, lose that opportunity for use. There will have to be some broadening of uses there, and also when you're dealing with bonds, you're really talking about credit and the availability of that to, to cover. But I, I think we have to start looking outside the box at opportunities that are created in a progressive way to support the communities that we want to support, rather than that are created to support the uh, market interests, which I think is what Opportunity Zones is. If there isn't another question, ready, oh, here, yep. I love that, that is so. Yes. Hi, so as everyone is talking about these Opportunity Zones and increasing all of this development, is the reason that these uh, developments are increasing because there's no workforce to actually do the building? One, and two, are you guys um, looking into creating that workforce versus actually like teaching school trades, teaching the trades, because that's actually why development costs are rising. And so people currently don't have these jobs. The median income is $26,000. Is anyone teaching financial literacy to these people who are gonna be living in these homes because even though they live in them, they won't be able to sustain it because they won't know how to balance their budgets. So my question is kind of twofold. What are you guys doing as far as actual financial, financial literacy, teaching people how to acquire more wealth, and then also um, getting these skilled trades filled because a lot of the skilled trade positions can be vacated within the year because they're all eligible, eligible to retire. So I'll talk from an enterprise standpoint. So we don't directly teach financial skills or provide workforce training. What we do is we support our CDCs and our nonprofits in our communities. We have a lot of nonprofits who are working on this. We have Focus Hope, we have United Way. Most of our nonprofits have tax foreclosure and also home literacy programs. And so through, by providing support for them, we're trying to get to those deeper social issues because they have the expertise on the ground and they understand the community on a much more granular level than we do. Okay, so two very quick questions, thank you. Um, so in 2012, 2008, we were very unprepared. The city was in a very different state. Um, recession may be coming. So in that event, um, are we ready um, in terms of CDCs, affordable housing? Are we ready for a possible downturn? Um, philanthropic community, the city, thinking about how to support um, community development. Hmm. This is something I think about Daily. very <laughs> frequently, yeah. Um, so I, I think a lot of the, the answer to that depends on the, the source of the, the recession. So um, if, so the housing prices are increasing in Detroit, but is the source of the recession going to be these kind of increasing housing costs nationwide? That's, I don't believe that's the source of it, but they'll certainly be, be affected. We see um, what, what look to be some um, pretty, rapidly rising markets that the kind of value doesn't seem to me to, to, to line up. Um, if it's in the, the credit, credit market, um, I think that uh, certainly Detroit residents will be, will be affected. Um, are we prepared? So I think that the goal of, of our work in the housing department, housing policy ought to be um, how do we make sure that our housing market is, is more resilient. I think that we've taken steps to do so and positioned ourselves to make that happen, but the bottom of the market in Detroit um, was, we are still experiencing it in 2012, 14, and 15. Have things changed? Um, I'm trying to be more positive, but have things changed dramatically since then for our residents? Um, three years, well, three and a half, four years, no. Um, so I think that we'll be, we won't see the kind of great loss. We won't see us losing 27% of our, our population or 250,000 people. We won't see that, but um, it, it will, if depending on the depth of it and source of it, um, 
we'll have to, to weather the storm and continue to invest in our, our residents. I, th I think the question is, I mean, if we see something like 2008 again, foundation assets, a foundation's place, to, in my opinion, does not forward with Kevin Ryan's opinion. Uh, foundations have an outsized um, influence in this region. Uh, and I, a lot of that is because of the downturn, the previous downturn, and the city's and state's reliance on philanthropy to fill some of the gaps. But I think if there's a downturn, um, foundation investments are so closely tied to markets. If you, you, we see a downturn where foundations lose 25 or more percentage or more of their assets, will foundations, which the, the spin rate is the, the sort of baseline spin rate is 5% of your endowment. If we see that kind of downturn, will foundations be willing to spend 10 plus percent to maintain the investments over time versus reducing the, the investments uh, because of those difficult challenges? In, two, at, at, in 2008, there were a number of foundations who spent and upwards of 15% of their endowments. And some actually created spin down plans to just, they, they knew in 10 years if we go out of business. But I, I, I don't, it's hard to answer that because so many foundations try to operate in perpetuity. Would they be willing to take that risk? And if they're not, then I think we have even more gaps in the financing that's necessary to, to even just maintain what we have. I would say we're not prepared. So if we think about 50% of the Detroit population making under $27,000 a year, I'd venture to say that half of our population is already living in recession-like conditions, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We have huge unemployment that is above the national average. Um, I just read an article that Detroit was the largest, poorest urban city in the country. So as Julie said, you know, will we see that big dramatic shift? No, but are there things, I think our recovery is so fragile. People don't really understand how fragile this recovery is. And I think people really don't understand the role that the philanthropic community has played in this um, recovery. And so if we do see a retraction of philanthropic dollars, we're going to be in a deeper problem. What can we do to address that right now? I think the sooner we can make sure that our LMI families are housing secure, that's one foot in the right direction to help us when we have another downturn. Because it's coming. All the analysts say that it's coming. And, and there are, this goes back to what I was saying about policies. I mean, if we if we want to be prepared, there are policy decisions that we can make now that will actually prepare us for that. For example, a moratorium on foreclosures would be really helpful in a scenario like yeah. that. But yeah. the political will to get to these answers, I mean, I'm, um, I'm feeling, because it's a new administration, so I'm feeling positive on the state level that we might be able to see to move some policies that will prepare us for that. But I think unless we make some drastic changes at the state level, that will support not just Detroit, because you're talking about a downturn, you're talking about Benton Harbor and Saginaw, right. and all over the state you're going to see these issues. Um, we've got to have a, a state legislature that really understands this and moves to actually address this before it's too late. It's actually a brilliant segue to just one last point. One thing in this area that you're very optimistic about. <laughs> talked about the recession and now you want optimism. I want optimism, that's right. I would say the collaboration we're seeing across the market. I think we're all working together in a way which we have never done before. Um, I've worked my entire career in the city of Detroit, born and raised. I saw tumbleweed rolling down Wilbur Avenue. Um, so seeing the great minds and all the different pieces coming together and trying to address this problem, it, it gives me hope. And knowing that you can bring a problem to a CDC or you can bring a, a problem to the city, they may not have the solution, but they'll help you think about answers to the solution. I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic about a lot of stuff. I'm optimistic about the governor, about the state the secretary of state, about the attorney general. I'm optimistic that they are gonna work together to create some real positive changes at the state level. They gotta deal with the legislature, but that's a whole other thing. Um, 
I'm very positive also about all of the great leaders that I see working on this issue. Some from inside the community development sector running the neighborhood-based organizations. Some, I'm gonna give a shout out to Chase, who I see sitting over there, who are working with those groups, but also coming up with really unique strategies to try to address some of the, the issues of Detroiters engaging in real estate and being involved in, in this. But I, I, I have to say, I've met so many leaders who are really pushing different strategies, and many young leaders mm -hmm. who are bringing new and innovative ideas to the table. I, I just feel like that a downturn will have the negative impacts in the short term, but we have a lot of great ideas that we can invest in to kind of build off of that if we have to deal with that scenario. So I would, I would, I would say uh, collaboration. So in, this, in the city itself, I see collaboration between departments People in government love to talk about breaking silos. Um, we're, I think we're actually seeing some evidence of how that is happening. When we're talking about implementing these neighborhood plans, departments are coming together, talking about timelines, who's, who's, who's doing what, and working through the challenges together. Out, outwards, I see there are so many people having these conversations. And we may not always agree at the, the on, on every single point, but we believe we we have shared shared ideas and, and a shared mission, and continuing to work on those and advancing those those together, so that we can continue to find find wins and things that we can be proud of, and and continue to kind of break those break through those walls. Fantastic. Um, let's thank our wonderful panel. I asked Chase Cantrell to come um, to basically sit and listen to everything we're saying to give us a couple minutes to synthesize all of these different um, layers of organizations and people. Um, and so I want to invite him up. He's um, an amazing person. He's the executive director and founder of Building Community Value. Um, and he has been working on resident-led strategies from the ground up. Um, and uh, he'll give us a couple minutes, and then we'll be able to go to the reception, which is happening just downstairs where the lunches were. Um, so, Chase. All right. So I have the interesting task of closing this out. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Chase Cantrell. Um, and I just want to first say that it's really good to be home. So like Melinda, I'm a double Wolverine, so it's always good to come back to Michigan. Um, interesting task that I've been given, though, so to think what the through line is of all the conversations that we've been having today, from development and policy to design, journalism, uh, curriculum, and all important capital, what is that through line that connects everything that has brought us here? And I think that through line is people. But the way that we've been discussing people, um, is from a space of privilege, which I think many of us recognize. We, many of us are degreed. Many of us came from institutions either here at Michigan or like Michigan. And we get the chance to pontificate and to um, come up with interesting um, ideas about how we change our world. But everyone doesn't have that privilege. So I'm gonna start um, by thinking of the fact that we don't all start from the same starting line, which Melinda said earlier. Um, looking at this photo, this is a fairly representative shot of a street in Detroit. In fact, for me, looking at it, this looks very much like the street that I grew up on. Small homes, 1,000 to 1,500 square feet, two stories, no blight, very little vacancy in neighborhoods, manicured lawns, neighbors that care. Um, but what would it feel like to be someone who grew up in this environment, I grew up in the 80s and the 90s, but over time, to see your neighborhood transform to this. So the struggle for all of us, I think, um, and I think that Kevin said earlier, we need to be careful about the narratives that we create about our cities, is to hold almost a paradox, that there is incremental progress in our cities, that we should 
talk about, that we should celebrate, that we should improve on, but that we have to recognize that things, especially in a city like Detroit, for many people, things are still very bad. But somehow, even thinking of the person who created this graffiti, the dream is now. That paradox, right? You can look at this blight, but yet see something of the future. Um, so often when I speak, most of people who know me well, I'm a data nerd. I love to talk about percentages. I love to talk about trends. Um, but I often find myself in these spaces where we've talked about data all day and policy all day without talking about what it feels like to be one of the numbers. So if you think about the stat that Kevin cited, uh, 50,000 foreclosure notices in a city like Detroit, if you live in the city, if you are an individual receiving a foreclosure notice, receiving an eviction notice, and we know from the book Evicted that came out and was celebrated last year that it's not just in Detroit, but across the nation, eviction is a problem. If you are facing water shutoffs, if you are facing the inability because of your low income to pay utilities, basic utilities, water and heat, you are in a mode of survival. And the idea of building a better future is almost inaccessible to you because you are trying to survive. You are rooted in your present. You are anchored by your past, haunted by your past. But the future is often obscured. So when you think about this kind of falling away of the fabric of your community around you, we've talked a lot about what it means to create one Detroit for all of us. But I, th I think also we, we understand that there is a narrative from some that there are two Detroits or that there are multiple Detroits. And I don't think the narrative is, is useful in the kind of violent tension it creates. In fact, it's not unique to Detroit. If you Google two Baltimores, if you Google two Philadelphias, you'll see article after article with the same narrative. What it is useful for is to understand that people feel like they don't have agency. Because of that survival mode again, that they feel at times that they are not able to fully participate in the development of their city, that things are happening to them rather than being able to dictate the things that are happening. Now, we've talked about what it's like to go to community meetings, and community meetings are vitally important. We have to have Detroit residents, city residents across the U.S. involved in planning processes and governance processes, but if you are facing the life of a low-income person, you don't have the time to show up at a community meeting. Um, you are unable, often, to find um, someone to watch your child. Again, you are, you are focused on day-to-day -day life. So it's the trauma of a changing city. And what we have to really do is figure out ways to give people agency. Now, we talked about some policies. We talked about low-income housing. We talked about um, job security. You know, we always talk about the social determinants of health. How do we improve our communities? Um, so I'm going to talk about two very small ways um, that I am trying to affect change in Detroit and then end with a challenge. So a few years ago, I met Peter Allen from the Ross Business School. I don't know if Peter's still here. Is he? Oh, there he is. Um, and Peter you know, teaches a, a class at Ross um, that teaches the basics of real estate. And he wanted to do the same thing in Detroit. He thought the market was a good one. He had confidence in Detroiters. And he thought that it was a good moment to, to bring that kind of program to the city. So partnering with Peter, we developed a course that could do exactly that. We could teach Detroiters the basics of small-scale real estate development in the city. Uh, it started in 2015. We've had close to 200 people who have gone through the program, and we know that it works. We know that people have gone into their neighborhoods and rehabbed homes. We know that people have purchased commercial spaces through um, the Wayne County auction, 
And we know that people are beginning to, again, feel like they have the power to actually affect change around them. Um, part, of the, part of the core reason of creating this isn't just to change the fabric of a, of a neighborhood. It's to create a network. If we're talking about equitable development, if we're talking about the importance of having people who represent the community do the work, we actually have to create a pipeline. And this is how we do it. We teach people the skills, but we also put them together and teach them how to work together. We have realtors who go through this class, we have mortgage bankers, we have folks who know how to do plumbing and um, you know, install roofs. We, know, we have people who have never done anything in development before but only have a dream of changing their neighborhoods. And it's that kind of coalition, you know, Peter often says that development is a team sport, um, it's that kind of coalition that actually can make a difference. And it's important in Detroit because understanding the housing types, single family housing is by far the most important ho housing type in the city. So that's one mechanism. The second is dialogue. So oftentimes when we're asking community members to come to a meeting um, to decide on something, right? We're asking for their input. I had a, I had a young woman who, who goes to U of M and I had a speaking engagement similar to this, and she asked me, she works for the city, uh, she interns for the city, what do you do when community members are angry and they're yelling at you in a community meeting? She couldn't understand. And I told her, you listen. Because people often don't have the outlets to feel heard. They don't have those moments to be able to air out their grievances about the decline of their city, the feeling that something has been taken away from them over decades. So we need space. We need spaces not only to come and give input, but like this, this space is called Urban Consulate, spaces simply to talk about what we want and how we feel. So this was called Preserving Black Space. This happened in January of 2017. And it was striking. It was an intergenerational conversation. The youngest person was probably in their 20s, the oldest in her 70s. And across generations, people had stories of loss. My school was closed. My commercial corridor, which used to be vibrant, no longer is vibrant. I've seen the housing fabric of my community fall away. And to see that cross-generational conversation was healing for a lot of people. Because we weren't there with an agenda. We were there to hear each other. So this is the challenge that I want to leave us with. So thinking through everything that we talked about today. This was from a Detroit Future City study, the 139 square mile study that came out um, last year. And the blue dots show the African American population in the city and the reddish purplish dots, the white population in the inner ring suburbs. And the reason that I think that dialogue is so important, the kind of dialogue that doesn't necessitate um, decision making, but just talking to one another, is that the only way that we actually create better futures for our cities is to reverse this trend in our cities. And this is not unique to Detroit. Some cities, it may be in pockets within the city limits itself, but we see this kind of segregation. So ending on a high note, you know, I am heartened to look out at this audience and to see black people and white people and people of all denominations coming together to talk about what it means to build better futures. But I don't ever want us to forget as we talk about theory, as we talk about governmental policy, as we talk about design, that behind all of that is real people. Thank you.